Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, feels kind of ominous and hollow. I can't uh, tell if anybody's here uh, watching, at least when I'm uh, talking to people on Facebook, I can uh, I can see if people are watching. So uh, I'll give everybody the benefit of the doubt that you all woke up nice and early this morning just to hear me speak. Um, and I wanna welcome you to the 2022 uh, Muskie Symposium. Um, I want to thank you all in advance for your patience today because uh, um, this has been pulled together in uh, rather short form and uh, there may be a couple of hiccups here and there, but uh, you stick with us. You'll learn something great today, have opportunities to win and or purchase um, uh, some great fishing lures from some of the best builders you can find and uh, we'll make sure uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. All right, let's, uh, let's start with um our purpose uh this show was uh put in place last year because all the in-person shows were closed because of covid and uh by hard work generosity dedication good fortune uh the muskie community raised twenty eight thousand dollars and um and that money was directly injected within days right into muskie research buying tag readers um supporting institutions that are actually actively doing the research and rehabilitation that the uh that the musky population needs and um when we got to the fall of the this uh this past fall we weren't sure what was going to happen in spring we weren't sure whether there'd still be covid closures we weren't sure um what limitations there would be or um uh, you know what the fundraising opportunities would look like and how much money could be raised so I began putting in place a plan to run the symposium um, a second time and uh, and then you know to everybody's great benefit um, there was an in-person show we did have uh, the Muskie Odyssey um, run by Muskies Canada uh, they did a fantastic job they had to jump through hoops and uh, and 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 do some pretty crazy things but again Muskie community uh, Muskies Canada and uh, a lot of good people working hard for what they care about and uh, that show was a great success and um i made sure the symposium didn't interfere with that and i wanted to make sure that whatever baits were built by builders and whatnot were available to people who were present um at this show and so what we really did was try to do a short form version of this show um essentially getting it started and pushing hard for the three weeks that followed the odyssey and uh, what you see here today is pretty impressive, I won't lie. Yeah, we're missing some cool um, people that we really love to see. Sean Hoser, Lydio, um, Mort uh, wanted to participate, but he just couldn't get the baits ready. So he sent a nice donation over to help us out. Um, uh, you know, The reality is, is these guys only build. Some of them build 20 baits a year. Some of them build 100, maybe 200. And uh, with shows and stuff in person and, and different um, aspects of the community, uh, buying and borrowing and, and, and using it for their fundraising, only so much was available to us. So we did the best we could. Um, Dave Cormanios, uh, he stepped up last year and did a, uh, a great effort and provided us with some uh, incredible opportunities. And he did the same this year. I had to lean on him. I had to tell him he was, uh, was going to be the big draw for the show. And, uh, and he did his part for sure, 100%. There are some fantastic lures um, going to be sold at regular show prices. And uh, you don't see that very often. You don't have that opportunity very often, especially uh, in Canada. And that's where this online show is, uh, is based out of. Um, in terms of what we are supporting, the money we raised here is going to be divided into three different things. The first uh, item, uh, the first two are things we actually supported last year. Um, we're going to make sure that uh, some money goes actually to the U.S. side uh, to support the research being done on the St. Lawrence by uh, Dr. John Farrell. Uh, Dr. John Farrell was actually uh, gracious enough to be a presenter for us today. Unfortunately, his schedule didn't allow him to be live. So he uh, put together a, a recorded presentation specifically for us, uh, meant to show us uh, what our money that we sent last year is doing um, and what we can expect and see in, uh, you know, in the St. Lawrence and in terms of rehabilitation and research uh, from his end. So we're going to take a third of the money and send it over there. Um, unfortunately, it's Canadian dollars, gets turned into US dollars. So we'll lose a little bit. But um, when you put money into these institutions, they have these fantastic programs um, where uh, if you support the program as a private interest group, the government or other agencies um, step up and match your money. So uh, giving money to places like 
um, um, the uh, the St. Lawrence Institute or Syracuse University is actually incredibly valuable because we can sometimes double, triple, quadruple it. So uh, that's fantastic there. The second thing we're going to do is send money um, to the Cook Institute. Um, that's where you see uh, Sean Landsman and uh, Jordana Bergman and uh, Professor Cook. Um, they're actually doing mo a lot or most of uh, the Canadian research on muskies. It's very much the heart of uh, muskie research. And uh, so we're going to make sure we send some money their way. And then last is a new project. And I'm excited to um, to be able to support this because um, when a project is new, there's hurdles. There's uh, a lot of things that you have to um, present and talk to and persuade and uh, so much red tape. But with a program like this, it doesn't matter because it's just us. It's the people here on uh, on Facebook for the most part. Um, people who've heard by word of mouth what we're doing and put in their twenty dollars to buy a ticket and uh, participated in the raffles that have raised extra money. And so we get to make the decision. And there is no red tape. We can get uh, um, Jamie Sebastian uh, head start um, on his project. And what he's doing is working um, in uh, much more northern waters than we're used to here, much more deeper, colder waters. And he's gonna do some telemetry studies up there because um, he's seen and caught muskies down in 60 plus feet of water. And uh, we don't know a lot about how the muskies move up there, um, what they're, you know, uh, how much they're moving during the course of the day. Um, there's a lot of information that he, he's looking to, uh, to gather. And um, who knows, maybe he'll get some information, give it to us and it helps us find the giant because if I had to take a guess at where a world record fish might come from, I might say uh, one of the larger bodies of water in northern Ontario. But uh, that's me talking with no credibility whatsoever. I am uh, I I'm a nobody in this project or in this world. But yeah, we're gonna send a third of the money there. He's already got it lined up so that uh, he's won an award for like the most promising project. He's uh, just waiting final approval from one other bureaucratic establishment, and he's actually done the steps I told you about with uh, John Farrell where once this money goes in, it's tripled right away. So everything you guys did, um, all the money we raised is, uh, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be um, double, tripled or more and uh, and put into a project run by one of us, run by someone who's uh, you know spent 30 years um, asking the right questions, looking, uh, knows where to find the answers and how to make the most of this information. So um, before we get into uh, the fun of everything, um, I want to take a couple minutes for um, thank yous. Uh, the first and biggest thank you has to go to um, the Otter River Muskie Factory. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're sponsoring the show. Lisa Goodyear is um, probably the most dedicated muskie human on the planet right now. There are people who have been fishing for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, they are guides, they are authorities, they are biologists, and um, they are incredibly valuable, but Lisa's catching up to them at a pace, you know, faster than the universe is expanding. She dedicates so much time and effort to getting uh, more knowledge, to supporting the fishery, to, uh, she devotes her life in every way um, to the musky um, um, infection disease, if you will. Um, I, I couldn't have pulled this off without Lisa. Straight goods, we, we would be, there'd be 25 of us talking about um, nothing if it wasn't for Lisa. I, I, I said yesterday that if I had to run this, we would have a lemonade stand out front of my house with a couple of fish and we were hanging from it. But with uh, Lisa in the background, helping me, um, giving me, taking work off of my back, pretending to be me at certain points, um, um, I was able to focus on other things. And together, truly together, we pulled this off. Um, and we've got some great information for you and great things, but it, it's the Otter River Muskie Factory, it's John Anderson, it's the whole team, it's Lisa's, uh, ours, um, her, this is her platform, this uh, stream yard is her, I wouldn't even know how to turn it on, let alone get it to run a show for you guys. Um, so biggest uh, overall thank you goes to Lisa, um, near second is uh, John Anderson and the rest of the um, Otter River Muskie Factory team. Um, but other thank yous that have to happen, uh, number one, or afterwards, sorry, I guess number is uh, the bait builders um, because we love fishing shows. Information is great, um, but we all came here today to buy fishing lures. Um, that's what everybody's here, trying to get in line, trying to uh, to to make uh, purchases, add to their arsenal, fuel their addiction, whatever the case may be. And uh, by guys like Dave Cormanius, number one, first and foremost, he's uh, 
he could sell these baits privately for four or five times what uh, they're being sold for on our site and take that money to the bank and no one would uh, hold it against him, but he doesn't. He put in, He gave us opportunities to make money with his uh, fishing lures and that money is uh, really what makes this project worthwhile. So, uh, and then others as well. I tried to do this without uh, having bait donations. I find the musky community uh, reaches out for donations uh, very often. And uh, I'm not saying it's not justified. I'm just saying I, I, I sometimes feel uh, for the bait builders having to uh, put in their labor, their work, their materials, and then give it away. Um, so it's really trying to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, where and when possible, we paid for the baits we're using and then just maybe got a discount or use that money. Uh, you did an open raffle and the money that goes above and beyond the base base price is for research. But in some cases, there was uh, there nobody would take a no for an answer. Um, and we ended up with guys like uh, Frankie uh, from Frankie Baits. He donated uh, a 10 inch Frankie. Jonathan Lamontang built two baits, gave us the last course or ever built um, uh, custom pattern never done. Um, and the last one off the line before it becomes uh, manufactured by somebody else. Um, so that was really cool of him. Um, it's a long list. We got some uh, door prizes, um, which I, I never thought were something important, but maybe I'm just too uh, arrogant or ignorant. Um, but I've been told they're important. So we made sure we had them and we had guys donate for them. Uh, Landry Smith from Rover Bates. Um, he couldn't even get baits ready for the show, but he made sure that he made a donation of three baits uh, to go out to one someone from the door, Marquitra, um, a whole set of uh, hook files. I've got to set myself. Those things are fantastic. Um, if you've ever been sharpening hooks with a flat uh, file, um, you're bleeding for nothing and wasting your time. Um, so uh, get yourself a round file, um, and life will be better. And um, who is the third door? Is Mark Landry? I'll remember. Oh. Uh, I'll remember the last one. And then the, the treasure chest that I put together. I had these donations. I'm like, we only have so much time. I don't want to do too many open-ended raffles. I don't. I know some people don't like that. What can we do to get better? So if you look at all those baits that were in the treasure chest, uh, all but one was uh, uh, donated for free to the symposium to use to raise money. And the other one was at a, a very reasonable price uh, for what it was. And that whole process, we, we raised like seven or $800 um, to put into the pot. So... Um, uh, Patrick Breer, Mark Brunskill, um, Jonathan Lamontan already mentioned, um, Dave from Angus put a bait in for free as well into that. Um, there was a lot of great donations. So thank you to the people who made the donations. Thanks to those who made the baits available. Um, it's critical, um, or else we wouldn't have a show. And then last of the thank yous, I know I'm boring you already. I'm sorry. You have to listen to me so much. Uh, it goes to the presenters, um, to the researchers, to the people who gave us our time. Um, you're going to hear from uh, Jordana Bergman, who pretty much uh, is pulling herself out of a wetsuit, getting up uh, or getting up early and, and recording this presentation for us, because this is such a critical time in the research um, field for everybody, that everybody's out there trying to get their data, their information, that to pull themselves away to support this project wasn't easy. I mean, you may think it is. It's a little bit sad that most of the presentations are recorded, but the reality is, is all these people are in the field. They're where they need to be. Jordana's in a wetsuit right now in the water, um, despite the fact that it's seven degrees outside right now, and God knows what the water temperature is. Um, so thank you. Thank you to Jordana. Thank you to um, Dr. Farrell. And uh, and then thank you to the other two presenters, uh, the ones who are going to help us be better anglers. We've got... Uh, um, Elmer Hayub, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, uh, he's came highly recommended from some of the guys in the Muskie Inc. community in the uh, States. I wanted to put something up here in the Canadian market that we don't see very much um, because it's down there. He's out of Ohio. He's a retired fisheries biologist. He's part of their stocking program for muskies down there. He's a Bass Pro Pro staff. He's a Garmin Pro staff. And uh, as a Garmin Pro staff, we'll also... Uh, guides for and fishes musky year round because there's no season um he uh he knows how to get those electronics to actually do i have garmin electronics and um, this wasn't me choosing it because i have garmin it was just an opportunity crime of opportunity and i know i don't use them right so i'm excited to uh to to develop that part of the game because really that's what the next level is for all of us i believe is um is is finding the fish and then enticing them so thank you to him. And then last but not least, we're going to have some real genuine entertainment. 
I'm not sure. We may have to make this one PG. Um, you know, there could be some nudity. I don't think there's any swearing. we got some pretty civilized gentlemen here. But, uh, um, you know, I may or may not have my clothes on. I haven't decided yet. Um, but we've got Noah Clark and, uh, and Bryn Roach from BR Baits and Clarky Custom Baits. And they're going to tell you about the baits, about which bait and when, why one bait over the other, um, how to pick uh, pick the bait that uh, is going to best suit your circumstances, and then how to tune them and how to make them work and how to uh, get the most of We spend a lot of money, we buy a lot of baits, but if we're not using them properly, then what's the point? So that's the purpose of their presentation, and uh, and those guys are uh, two of the best human beings you'll meet, and they're awesome and fun. So I hope you stick around for that. That presentation is at uh, 1230. All right. Um, I think with that said, uh, the last statement is we are at about $10,000. I am still working tirelessly on um, reconciling finances from raffles. We still have one that's about to run here in a couple of minutes. Um, but we have as a team, as a musket community, uh, put together over $10,000. And I think, I'm pretty sure by the time we're done, um, we'll be at $11,000 um, or, or maybe a bit more. And uh, I'll make sure you see it all. You'll have the total. You'll know where the money goes. You'll see anything that money that's either sent by check or by um, online payment. I will take screenshots. If at any point someone has a question, if someone is uncertain about the finances, if someone wants to just be scrupulous, I, I have no qualms. You are welcome to see everything. Um, this is as transparent as you could possibly ask for and get. Uh, I, I was trying to keep a track of every single dollar in terms of like if people paid their fees. I had an Excel fee, uh, sheet that says, you know, you paid this, whatever, whatever. I couldn't keep up uh, in the last few days. Uh, if it's necessary, I will go and update those. But all that information is still readily available through the bank account. I have a separate PayPal account directly for the Muskie Symposium. I have a separate uh, bank account. So there's a checking account and a PayPal account linked together that are, of course, in my name. But um, they're, they're for the symposium. They're not for my, my personal use. I have separate for that. So anyone has any questions, do not hesitate. Um, it's important to me that uh, everyone feels the, the transparency. I, uh, I am happy to do this. I won't lie. It is labor intensive. Um, and one of the rules is I don't benefit. I take nothing. There's, uh, I'm sure I've lost money. I don't know where it happens. I'm sure I've lost money somewhere along the way of my own. Um, and I like it that way. I have not benefited in any way, shape or form, taken anything from anybody. And that's, uh, and that's, uh, I think important to the integrity of the program and what we're doing. So without further to do, I want to start Jordana's presentation at 930. Um, so for the next 12 minutes, we're going to uh, have a little fun. The first thing we're going to do, let's, uh, let's do door prizes. I think door prizes happen when people walk in. Um, I won a door prize in the 2019 Odyssey and I got it right as I walked through the door. So, um, let's, uh, let's get to that. If, uh, if we can do that, you're going to have to bear with me. I am not a technology guru. I do have Lisa in the background holding my hand and leading me, um, like a four year old, because that's pretty much my intellectual capacity. And when it comes to electronics, hence why I need this Garmin presentation more than any of you. Um, but yeah, we're going to move to a giveaway here. And um, and uh, let me just get the list brought up and put over to um, that. Um, Lisa, I think in a second, uh, maybe give me uh, 30 seconds or so. And then uh, we're going to move over to random.org here. That's not it. Okay. While you're doing that, man, I'll come out and thank you. The hours and the work that you've put into this is absolutely insane. There's already people, tons of people in the comments there uh, thanking you. So I just wanted to say that. Oh, and, I can't uh, see them. I have no idea who's there, what they're saying. If they have any questions, Lisa, interrupt me at any point. I don't mind. Um, Lisa, also, I know you've got um, uh, some awesome, awesome content on um, your YouTube channel. I think it'd be awesome if you could tell people because there's so much information there and the work you're doing on it's pretty incredible. Um, I don't think anybody truthfully has such a, um, a well-composed and detailed list of musky information anywhere on YouTube as far as I know. So if you don't, wouldn't mind telling people about it, that would be fantastic. And that would give me a couple seconds to figure out where I put this file. <laughs> sure, no problem. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, we've been working really hard on the channel. Um, we're really trying to make it a resource of musky information. 
And we had a lot of really good feedback last year from our Muskie Monday seminar series. And one of the favorite segments constantly that we were hearing was the uh, Ask the Biologist with Dr. Sean Landsman. Uh, that information that he shares, university level lectures on um, musky biology, like you just can't get that information anywhere. So uh, unless you go to university, of course. So we're very, very thankful uh, to have had him on the show. And so what we've done, we've actually split those clips out from the Musky Monday seminar series so that they're easily accessible. I'm going to show you here. Uh, this is our uh, YouTube channel here. And right at the very top, you're going to see we've started to add all the Ask the Biologist segments with Dr. Sean Landsman, all broken down by topic. So right now there's five, but hopefully by the end of the weekend, they'll all be there. Of course, there's all the Musky Monday seminar series, all accessible. And what we've all got... I can cancel my uh, cable now. I don't need it. Anymore. <laughs> yeah, there's a few hours there for you, Danny, for sure, for sure. And of course, last year's Musky Symposium, all the contents there. And of course, this week we'll upload uh, today's seminar as well so that everybody can go back and look over all that valuable information for sure we would appreciate uh if you, if you have uh, a youtube account to hit that subscribe button for us it really helps us out uh to grow the channel that's a that's a favor you can do to me there's lots of people who said hey how can i help um that's something i would be grateful for i i want to support lisa specifically the ottawa musky factory as much as possible in the entire community and what she's asking for is uh it it's nothing like it's 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 really easy for us to do so if we can uh pull that off uh if people could go do that i'd like to see their thing get over a thousand dollars i personally would be grateful if we can make that happen thank you guys okay um lisa i think i am ready when you are okay right, so we're going to i need to share my screen right that's the idea yep i'll pull it in for you Sure. So many cool people here watching. Hey, uh, Brian, Chandra, Ryan. Hey, guys. <laughs> Good crowd of people. Okay. All right. I'm seeing your screen. Perfect. We're all set here, Danny. Fantastic. So this is random.org. Um, I'll give you a two-second description of it so you know how it works. Um, it uses uh, an electronic uh, independent variable to randomize lists. Um, when you... Uh, are crazy and anal about things like random and you study it, it turns out that the uh, environmental factor they use allows for um, something that's not completely random. So when you randomize a list once, apparently it is not 100% random. The key to making it random is to randomize that list more than one time and have it not be the same number of times each time. And then you cre um, create true randomization. So this program, random.org, it's a paid account so that we can always go back and look and see what uh, what is happening. And this is what we use on um, other Facebook pages. And we'll be using it today uh, throughout the, um, the symposium. Okay. So first here is the 2022 Muskie Symposium Door Prize. Based on my um, uh, best humanly possible attempt to maintain a list, um, here it, there were 257 people in the group. I don't know what the number says on the group right now, and I can't. Uh, there are people who've like come in and gone out a couple times. I'm not sure how that happened, but it did. Um, but I, I tried everything I could uh, to keep a, a proper list, and this is the list we have. So I, I'm hoping everybody is on it. And if you're not, um, call me and yell at me, and I will listen patiently while you do so. Um, so 257 entries. The top three names when we're finished uh, randomizing will win um, prizes and they will pick the prize in order. So the three prizes, we have two spools of braid, 90 pound braid from uh, Barbarian Braid uh, donated by Rex St. Pierre. Um, I put a post up detailing uh, his line, why it's better, why you uh, should consider it. And uh, one of the things that stood out for me that I saw days after that post went up is uh, the 54 bus crew, including some of the guys on Georgian Bay, spent a good chunk of last year using it, and uh, they swear by it now. And if if you're fishing for uh, uh, double nickel fish in Georgian Bay with rocks and 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 some of the scariest water we have, I I I, I do not have a love affair with Georgian Bay. I won't lie, uh, we don't get along. Um, but if you're fishing there and your braid uh, is testing in a positive manner, then you know there is a good product there. So, uh, Rex St. Pierre, thank you for your donation. 
and uh, one of the door prizes will be two spools of braid shipped to your house. Uh, I already mentioned Landry Smith from Rover Baits. He's donating not one, not two, but three uh, baits of your choice. And he's got some pretty awesome stuff that will guarantee you fish. Uh, I happen to be uh, the proud net man to a 54-inch fish caught on a rover bait. Um, it, it, they just work. And I'm, not, I'm sure there's lots of net people around here um, with rovers in, um, in the fish of a mouth. And then last, uh, I mentioned Mark Petra. He donated uh, a whole set uh, meant to sharpen every hook size you've got. And uh, that also includes shipping. So those will be your three door prizes. Uh, we're going to roll here. And we're going to randomize this list nine times. So even if you see your name come up, it doesn't count to the ninth one. When we get to that ninth one, that will be the three prize winners. Congratulations, Dan Kornblum, Joe Slippy, and Jarrett Carter. All right. Uh, I'm not going to copy the whole thing. I won't be able to. So I'm going to copy this. And um, you know what I'm going to do? I need to just write this down and I can go back and deal with it after. Dan Cornblum, Joe Slippy, and Jarrett Carter. All right, before we do our 9.30 presentation, I know a lot of people have a lot invested and a very substantial interest in one particular fishing lure. And I think it would be fantastic if we could go right ahead and, uh, and give that away. So we're going to do that. Um, let's knock off um, the ASG. Perfect. Let us knock off. The Dave Permanos um, DK13 and probably the nicest, absolutely nicest um, um, paint job I've seen from, from Dave. Like, the, if you're fishing the French or anywhere for that matter, and you want to go and send a bait down and let it pound and let it touch rocks and still uh, have no fear and, and see a bait that contrasts and shines uh, even in deeper water, um, this, this is it. This thing is... This is a, an amazing word. I do not have one yet. I will get one, but I will get it the old-fashioned way. Um, so let's go back to here and make a new giveaway. I'm going to call this one 2022 DK13. I don't know what the pattern is called. Let's call it uh, Shimmering Chad. How about that? Look at that. In Shimmering Chad. And let me get your list. We had 176 spots total. I don't think there was anybody upset at me yet, but we'll find out soon. Okay. Here we go. Lisa, we're still good here, right? I'm assuming you would tell me if we're not, because this one's important. People are going to want to pay attention to this. So 2022 DK13 and Shimmering Shad. Uh, I'm not going to switch screens because you guys won't see it if I do, but you know what that bait looks like. And obviously there's one winner and shipping is included. And Dave Cormanios, you're a stud. Uh, not only uh, a great artist, um, great bait builder, but a great human. And let's get this done. Ooh, we're going to do it lots of times. So lots of people see their name and cry a little. It's always fun. Um, we've got 14 rounds. Only the 14th round counts. If you want to save yourself some tears, don't look till we get to round 14. Let me say it out loud. Steve Wynn, Jason, right, Ragin, Jason Ragin in second time, Brad Lauer, Sean Ryan, Greg Jones, Joe Walker, Trex Hilty, Colin McPhee, Russell Hendricks, Colin McPhee again. I'm sorry, dude. Robin DeFour, your runner up is Michael Hatch. I'm sorry. And Key River Muskie, uh, Brian Gladstone. Congratulations, uh, Key River Muskie. Um, that's one heck of a fishing lure. I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, I'd, have, I'd have definitely had some spots in there. I will show you guys the list just in case it interests you where you finished. And, of course, I will document for your viewing pleasure. 
the code so that if you need to go back and watch that happen all over again for whatever reason you can do so this is a hard job sometimes because i know probably 70 percent of you at least somewhat know you facebook know you i guess we'll call it there is your timestamp and there is your code and uh, again congratulations to key river muskie and so I feel bad for all the people I know that I see their name and they didn't get it. Um, but uh, Brian's a good person. So I'm glad that Subaru was going to a good home. Uh, Dave and I wanted to be, we were worried that it could end up in the wrong hands. But uh, I, I believe these are the right hands. So congratulations to Mr. Key River Muskie himself. And uh, with that, um, I think we will let Jordana's um, presentation take, uh, take root here. Uh, try to pick up as much information as you can. It's a fairly short presentation, which is going to work out terrific because as soon as we get back, we're going to start drawing um, for um, the, the draw to buys. Okay. Again, thank you very much, Dave. And uh, thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jordana Bergman. I'm a PhD candidate at Carleton University. And part of my thesis research is to investigate the movement patterns and connectivity of these beautiful muskie in Canada's historic Rideau Canal. Um, I'm excited to share with you the results and findings of an overwintering study that we conducted uh, last year looking at muskie movement ecology during the winter drawdowns. I want to first acknowledge that this kind of work is not possible without a village. Um, I've had a massive amount of help, especially from Muskies Canada anglers. I certainly would not have the sample size now if I didn't have your angling expertise um, and general knowledge about these fish to rely on. Um, we've also partnered with researchers from the University of Ottawa, their support from Parks Canada, and NSERC. Um, so I'm going to dive right into it, and I think I'm going to stick this guy up here hopefully that stays out of the way um so winter in north america can be a really beautiful time as most of us know but it's also quite a difficult time for aquatic organisms it's in general an equally challenging ecologically challenging season and it's characterized by low and freezing temperatures by lower river flows and by different kinds of ice phenomena like um, ice dams that can form across entire rivers fragmenting connectivity it also can re uh, result in reduced suitable winter habitat for different animals uh, and it can decrease river connectivity um, and if things become really harsh during winter it can even result in these winter kill events um, and there's some research that's shown that winter can be more challenging for larger fish like our beautiful isosids this muskie here um, taken by dr sean landsman which I, I think most of you might be familiar with and um, now, typically, when we think about wildlife or biodiversity conservation, protecting critical habitat is a really key part of that. Um, and critical uh, habitats, as defined by Canada Species at Risk Act, are things like spawning grounds, nursery areas, rearing areas, um, if animals need to migrate, those would all be considered critical habitat. Winter is not explicitly stated in Canada Species at Risk Act, but uh, winter habitats are inherently critical because if these fish can't survive winter, uh, their populations are going to certainly decline um, and eventually uh, go extinct. Um, and we know worldwide that freshwater biodiversity is an absolute peril. So you'll notice that this line for freshwater fishes is decreasing much faster compared to marine and terrestrial vertebrates. Um, and the World Wildlife Fund for Nature estimates that there's been almost an 84% decline in freshwater species populations, uh, which is pretty drastic. So a group of freshwater experts around the entire world came together and they said, here's how we can not only stop all of these species from going extinct, but we can bring them back by bending this curve. Um, and they list these six key ways that we can do that. One of them being to protect and restore critical habitats. I would argue that we first have to identify those critical habitats because in a lot of cases we simply don't know where they are yet. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, um, I kind of want to reframe the perspective um, from a proactive approach. 
it is really important to protect habitats of species that have these interactive and persistent threats, uh, like drawdowns, like pollution, like invasive species, before they become endangered. And um, we should be proactively protecting these animals. Uh, so I am studying fish in the Rideau Canal waterway. And it's, I don't know exactly where all of you are listening in from, but um, this is located in Eastern Ontario. It's a 202 kilometer navigable system that's composed of these really big, beautiful lake areas, but also lots of river, river-like and constructed channel areas. And there are 24 active operating lock stations that interconnect the system. Um, the middle, the highest point, so the, the Rideau Canal is kind of, uh, has a highest point and then flows downstream um, from that point. The highest point here is where the Red Star is. So my, where I'm studying uh, muskie is up here in the north. This is really where muskie are found in the Rideau Canal. Uh, so just keep in mind that whenever you look at figures, the water is flowing north. That's the downstream direction. Uh, so muskie are ecologically important as top predators. They're recreationally important as iconic sport fish, uh, but there are so many threats that are currently listed to them. And this is based on the IUCN red list. The first big issue are natural system modifications like dams and water management. Uh, invasive species are threatening muskie populations and so is pollution. And all of these are incredibly highly relevant to the Rideau Canal. Um, I would have loved to study muskie throughout its entire area in the stretch of the Rideau, but unfortunately I'm just one student. So we decided to focus on a stretch between the Black Rapids and Long Island Lock Stations. That's what's circled in red here. And we also chose this area because it experiences a pretty considerable drawdown each winter. Um, now the Rideau is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and that means that it's really highly regulated for navigation and also to protect any infrastructure. Um, which usually means that water levels are really carefully controlled, but that's only during the navigation season uh, and to minimize things like flood risk in the spring. But in the winter, there are these massive drawdowns. Uh, so this red dashed line is where the water level would normally be, and this is indicating just how much the water drops down. And this area uh, is just over two meters, so um, you know it's quite a decent amount in a shallower river like this. Uh, this is a picture of the Mosquito Creek, which is a musky spawning tributary. This black dash line indicates where the river is normally at. And so during drawdown season, fish can't really access um, this creek, which may be really important for certain life history uh, stages like spawning. So we focused on the Echo Lands Reach. Um, it does have invasive species like common carp, and any day now, I would be shocked if round goby weren't discovered. Um, it also is quite polluted. There's a lot of urbanization and runoff agriculture in the area. Um, and it is fragmented by these two locks on either end of the reach, but we don't know how fragmented the river is during winter. So that's another question and, and issue that could be going on. Um, and this drawdown will exacerbate all of those threats. So it's reducing habitat. There's less available waters for fish to navigate. So our overall objective here was to evaluate muskie spatial ecology during a drawdown season in the Echo Lands Reach. Um, but we wanted to know things like which areas are most important in supporting muskie? Uh, are there environmental characteristics that are influencing residency patterns? Um, and we wanted to know if connectivity is an issue during drawdown season. Can that, that can also make many of these issues much worse. Um, as you can see here, we had a blast. Uh, it was so much fun going out and catching muskie. Um, so we had a really wonderful time. For this project, we tagged muskie with these two different size tags you see here. This larger one can actually last up to nine years. Uh, the smaller one lasts three years. Uh, for the winter project, we acoustically tagged 15 muskie um, and we had a pretty nice size range. Uh, 13 of those were detected. Um, and when I say detected, uh, we detect them with acoustic receivers, and I actually grabbed one for you to show you today. Uh, this is what an acoustic receiver looks like. It's kind of like a long water bottle, uh, a wine bottle. And then this tip here is glass, and it is called a hydrophone. It sits underwater and is basically sitting, waiting, listening for a tagged fish to swim by. Um, so I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but it's because I have to go grab all of those because before Parks Canada refills the system next week. Uh, so where were these important overwintering areas. So we worked really closely with hydraulic engineers from the Ottawa uh, University 
uh, with Dr. Colin Rennie and Kate Nigel. And I just wanted to include this photo to show you some of the really beautiful fine scale mapping they did. Um, so this is a picture of them mapping out bottom substrate, uh, looking at bottom habitat depth. Um, and we basically joined forces to make a stronger, more comprehensive data by overlaying fish movement data with uh, hydraulic modeling data. Let's go over here. Um, and this is what it looks like, you know, when you join forces. So I'll go through each part of this map. So this is the Echo Lands Reach. What I plotted out here is something called a residency index. So it's the amount of time fish spent at each receiver, and each circle is one receiver. Um, these three red receivers in, mean that no fish were detected there for winter. The black circles indicate that a fish was detected there, and then the bigger the circle, the more time more fish spent there. So um, depth is the second part of this map. Uh, these kind of shallower blue areas um are differentiated by these darker deep orange and red areas um, and you'll also notice there are these x's that i've included on the map these include these indicate areas that we think acted as a barrier to movement during winter and i'll talk about that in a bit um because of that uh because of these x's it, we, we will discuss the movement patterns we saw based on the segments of the river so uh segment one is most downstream and north. Um, segment two is this middle area, and segment three is more upstream, uh, kind of near Long Island's uh, Long Island Lock Station. This is the Jock River over here. Um, so yeah, just a reminder: downstream and upstream. Uh, so it should be pretty clear from looking at this that Muskie sent, spent significantly more time in this middle portion of the Echo Lands Reach during winter, and this is a pretty big stretch, and they were consistently detected across. Uh, you know about three kilometers of the river um we were surprised at how much they moved during winter and um, but because of that it kind of reinforces the idea of looking at the echo lands reach during winter by the perspective of segments and not individual receiver sites because fish appear to be moving quite often between receivers so we wanted to know all right fish chose the middle of the echo lands reach why and so we evaluated several different environmental characteristics, one of them being the degree of drawdown, uh, how much did drawdown, how severe was the drawdown at different parts of the Echo Lands Reach? Um, what was the benthic structure like, you know, was it boulders or sand? And then we also wanted to look at the average depth in each segment. So to start with drawdown, uh, river segment one, two, and three are here on your X axis. So this is most north and downstream. Uh, and then this is the drawdown depth. So the most downstream area near Black Rapids had a pretty considerably high drawdown. What was really interesting is that each segment of the river had a distinct drawdown. So, uh, you know, the area segment two where Muskie spent most of their time also had a pretty high drawdown. It was around 2.08 meters. Um, now, if you go upstream of the Vimy Bridge, um, the drawdown was much less. It was about 1.7 meters on average. And what we think is happening here just circling this to show you this is the segment fish spent the most time um so we originally thought oh well fish are going to avoid areas that have the highest drawdowns because that's got to minimize habitat the most this was not true <laughs> turns out fish did not care about the level of drawdown it had to be do something else with whatever uh, environmental characteristics were there what we think is that there's a backwater effect going on that's being caused by the back the black rapids dam <laughs> So then uh, the hydraulic engineers looked at benthic structure for us. Um, and I know there's a lot going on, so I'm gonna go through this figure with you. So on the Y axis, that's the residency index. So the higher the bar, it just means the more time fish spent there. Um, on your X axis, these are each of the receivers starting most downstream and north and going all the way upstream. And then I just added in the segments so you could see based on that map. Um, so low structure areas are areas that only have silt, sand, or clay. There's no rock. Medium structure would be things like cobble or gravel. And, and then high structure are boulders. And in some areas, you know, we saw boulders as big as a small car. And um, so what you'll notice that there's some interesting collinearity going on where we only had that high boulder structure in the upstream portion of the river. And then downstream, there was really mostly just low structure. There was no rocks present. present. Um, and this is where fish spent the most time. They chose these silt, sand, clay areas. 
Um, musky did also overwinter in high structure areas. There was two or three of them. So it doesn't mean that high structure areas are not habitable, like they are still hospitable during, during winter. Um, so both high and low areas can support musky. Uh, what we think is going on is that there may be persistent structure that occurs throughout winter. So even if this area only has silt or sand, uh, we know that there could be vegetation that persists during winter. There might be big woody debris that fish can hang out near. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I did not do a standardized snorkel or scuba survey of the whole river, but um, that's what we think might be going on. This is also a lower velocity area. Uh, and segment depth. Uh, so we measured something called the Thalweg, and that's basically if you follow the deepest part of the river um, and take an average depth of that. Uh, and it should be relatively uh, obvious, I think, that uh, there's this really nice continuously deep area in segment two. So on average, segment one was only about three meters deep. Segment two, though, was almost five meters deep on average. Uh, compared to segment three, which was uh, considerably shallower at 2.24 meters. Um, and this continuous depth is what we think is also a key driver in the reason that Muskie chose to overwinter here. Um, so looking at connectivity, <clears throat> um, we when you when we plotted out movement patterns for a really good chunk of the winter, once fish were in their respective segment, they were no longer able to move upstream or downstream. Um, so what could be driving this apparent functional fragmentation? Uh, what we think is most likely is that it's these really shallow water areas, like at most two meters. Um, and when ice forms, uh, especially in this slower area, uh, that could be further restricting connectivity. Um, this area downstream of the jock also has really high velocities, especially once the river starts constricting near the Vimy Bridge. So, there could also be a velocity barrier that fish just aren't able to pass in combination with the shallow waters. Um, and if ice is forming on either end, not only can ice grow from top down, but there's also something called anchor ice that can grow from bottom up. So that will further reduce a fish's ability to move back and forth. Um, we do know that both segments two and three provide overwintering habitat. Uh, so it might not be important to you know go out of our way to push Parks Canada to create these deeper connections uh, unless we start seeing winter kill events. Uh, then it might be important to ensure that fish are able to connect to these other habitats so that you know they can survive winter and find suitable areas. Um, we did discover this fourth unintentional finding which was not the purpose of the study but maybe one of the most important things we found. Um, so musky come April display this quite increased activity levels in both the upstream and downstream movement um, and it really closely coincided with musky spawning temperatures and that was as early as april 8th last year uh, this is supposed to be 2021 sorry <laughs> um, as early as april 8th though uh, this could be quite a conservation issue because the echo lands reach is not refilled until early may uh, this year and last year it's around may 3rd to 5th um, so that's you know weeks that fish don't have access to these littoral areas or spawning tributaries. Um, so we're hoping that Must Parks Canada will consider adaptive management strategies. You know, this year um, it's much cooler than last year, but I plotted out the average water temperatures over the last 50 years in early May. And there have been other events where air temperatures reach a level that they can bring water temperatures up to muskie spawning. Um, and there's researchers that I've reached out to who have also confirmed that drawdowns are negatively impacting uh, wild fish populations because it minimizes the amount of area that those animals have to spawn. Um, and this will be especially important as we have warmer earlier springs as climate change progresses. Um, so some conclusions we did identify overwintering habitat. It was in that deeper low velocity um, middle portion of the echo lands. Um, there does appear to be sufficient overwintering habitat. So we were really worried that the drawdown was like reducing all available habitat, but muskies seem to be finding areas pretty well. Um, the river is fragmented during the drawdown season, so that's something important to consider. Uh, and if winter kill events happen, we'll definitely have to think about, you know, what's the best way then to manage these animals because um, musky are just one species, but that can represent all of the different species that are in the Rideau Canal experiencing the same thing. Um, we did find those increased movements in April, so that will be something important to consider 
um, if we do see the population continue to decline, which hint, hint, uh, it looks like it might be. Um, I want to point out, though, that this one project that I shared with you today is part of a decade long research. Um, so right now we actually have 24 acoustically tagged muskie. Um, I highlighted the 15 that were part of the study. Um, but these 24 acoustically tagged muskie are going to be part of this incredible comprehensive article that will come out in 2024 where we're overlaying three years of musky movement data with a really beautiful fine scale 2D flow model um, with detailed habitat information. Again, that's the beauty of being able to uh, work with hydraulic engineers. Uh, and I've had such wonderful help from knowledge holders uh, with Mark Muskies Canada. Um, so we will be collating data and sharing the results in 2024 for that one article, but um, I am a PhD candidate with Dr. Cook, Dr. Stephen Cook, and he is hoping to maintain this array for another, you know, eight years. Um, so it'll be uh, what he calls a living lab, um, and there should be some really cool uh, work coming out of that. I also want to highlight um, one of my peers, Jessica Reed. She's a master's student at Carleton University, and she is looking at musky movement ecology, specifically in the Jock River. Um, so, so far they have 30 receivers out. That's what each of these red dots indicates. She has a very fine scale array compared to the Echo Lens one. Um, and they have acoustically tagged 16. Um, so they're hoping to map the year round uh, movements of Muskie and the Jock River, but they also are hoping to see if these restored wetlands uh, highlighted in green here, um, if they are indeed working. There was tons and tons of effort and money um, that went into restoring these wetlands, not only you know, thinking about musky spawning, but it also acts as a habitat for many other aquatic organisms. So she's also going to be out there uh, pit tagging, uh, which is kind of like a little microchip, um, tons of different species. And then I believe this summer acoustically tagging more muskies. So this will be really cool work to see. And I am considering joining forces with her and seeing if there's even connectivity between the Jock River and the Echo Lands Reach. Um, so I have submitted a manuscript. I'm really excited to share it with everybody once it's uh, accepted. Um, I, I do really hope Parks Canada will consider um, the, our findings. I will push it. Um, and then, you know, in 10 years, uh, in 2024, there will be some reports on that study. And in 2030, there should be another one about this long, um, this long term work. Um, I really appreciate you guys um, showing up and taking the time to listen to the work that we're doing today. Uh, I hope I've been able to convey my like love and passion for uh, aquatic conservation and, and fish ecology. Um, it's been really wonderful to work with all of you. Um, I hope to see you all again sometime this summer. Uh, and if you ever have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to chat fish. So thank you again for having me and thank you to everybody. Welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you to uh, Jordana. I uh, hope to call you Dr. Jordana in the near future, but I'm partially aware of how uh, how long that process will take for you. Um, and I hope you are staying somewhat warm in your um, wet, dry suit right now doing the work that you were doing. Um, that was a recorded presentation, so obviously I can't be uh, much more formal than that. But uh, I think it's pretty awesome to see um, things like those tag readers that she's using that they're relying on for the various elements. Um, that's what we bought. Uh, like rather than, than give money uh, last year, we bought those tag readers, um, three of them and, uh, and put them out there. And that's, that's the way they get it done in the U S um, you know, Muskie's Inc is like 20 times bigger than Canada um, and are in most of our chapters. So they can do 20 times more, work and they have these these things but for us it uh, it takes more we have to be more generous we got to work harder we don't have support from the government uh, as often as we would like um so a private interest groups like uh muskies canada um and, or um our little facebook thing we're doing here um that's how that's how we keep this going that's how these projects stay alive and become uh living labs like jordana said so um i hope uh i hope you see the value in the research i hope you understand how um this can help us um you know these maps these uh these different uh tracking these uh these things we're coming to understand that they they'll help us as anglers as um you know mutual ambassadors of uh of the musky well-being and the fishery 
So thank you, Jordana. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get back to um, having fun. So the next thing on the list is let's, uh, let's find out who's, who's buying what. Um, I did a bingo roller last time. It added time. Maybe it was fun. I don't think so. By the end, I don't think it was, uh, it was worth it. So I'm not going to waste your time too much with, uh, with that. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to start with Dave and DK Lures um, because that is a big purchase for anybody. And it'll determine partially how your money gets spent at the other vendors. Um, after that, um, in uh, an act of true randomization, I wrote down all the names of the vendors uh, as part of the multiple layers of processes that have to happen before we get to today. And uh, when I was writing them down, they I, they essentially came out as they were streamed on the um, site. Um, so they are, for all intents and purposes, random. <laughs> and um, they were based on who commented on what last at that particular moment in time that I did it. So I'm probably just going to run off my list here and uh, and pray that I don't mess up or miss anybody. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. We have um i believe 10 volunteers which is awesome um working the various lists each person is responsible for between two and four lists depending on the nature of the list um and i'm sure they'll identify themselves quickly and you'll see them tagging and moving the line the lines along when you make your purchase the money is not coming to me do not send the money to me do not send it to the musky symposium it goes to the vendor the information will come to you it will be added to the post um as you begin your picks um you you pay you pay the vendor um taking screenshots of that is always helpful and good because you can then uh ensure that everything is paid up but the vendors will let us know if you haven't paid um we are going to as the people running the list try to collect your information to make it easier uh to make it um a, a smooth process for the vendors because they don't have their hands on the picking process i think it'd be fantastic if we just um we at the symposium and say here is an Excel sheet with your who purchased what, and this is their address, and uh, have they um, indicated that they paid. And the vendor can then just use that list as a packing uh, or a work order or whatever and uh, and ship to you. Okay, that's enough talk. Nobody wants to hear me anyways. Uh, I need to successfully not exit StreamYard. Okay, DK draw to buy. Um, paste. You guys won't be able to see what's happened on mine, but essentially, I have uh, I spent last night um, uh, going through and creating uh, the draw to buy list from each of the vendor posts that you saw on the Facebook page. Um, it's, uh, it's a it's a bit of a process, but it's um, somewhat foolproof. Um, so in theory, your your if you've commented in. Your name is here. It is possible if you commented and said something other than in, it is possible that you have been added as if you want to purchase. If that's the case, just kindly say no thank you and we'll uh, we'll move ourselves along. But uh, um, those draw to buy posts, the cleaner they look, the easier it is for the record. Okay, here we go. Um, to achieve two ran true randomization four, five, six, seven times. Again. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Noah Clark, you're picking first. Then Derek, Chris, Jarrett, Tommy, Dan. All right, I'm going to copy this list uh, up to probably 50, 60 names. Um, I can only put so many characters, otherwise Facebook loses its mind. I'm going to copy it and, uh, and post it to um to the page if you have a concern about the draw to buys you can come back and watch the videos or ask questions but i don't know that i'm going to you know what? just in case i'm going to do this right it's going to take a couple extra minutes and i'm going to ask your uh, your patience okay guys i don't want an issue so let's just do it this way Copy. See some cool I know you're probably staring at nothing right now. Um, let's 
the fastest way to do this. Sorry guys, I will try to uh, speed this up for the next one. This is inefficient. The problem is as people comment, these things move around, so I no longer have line of sight on what was there before. But I'll see if I can find a way around that. Here we go. Okay. Face. And... Okay, that draw to buy is done. So let's do for the next one. This is what I'm telling you about. It won't let me. It has too many characters, so it's giving me a hard time. No. Again. Now it's broken, I guarantee you. Okay. I need to do what at this point? I need to do another randomization. Um, but this is blocking me. It won't let me post it, so you guys can't see it. So there's no point at this point. Did that work? You're still seeing the same screen there. You get a different tab open. You're on the, I'm on the Facebook page. I'm trying to keep, put the list somewhere where people can see it. Okay. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I got a, I got a new plan here. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Um, I'm going to open a Word file, and I'm just going to paste all this to Word, and then afterwards I can go back and try and put it in for you guys and get you started. Sweet. Um, but I want people to be able to see the, um, the thing. See how this works. Okay, we're good. So I'm gonna do another one now. Random.org new giveaway. So next we're gonna do uh, scorpion lures. Oops, here, here. Open vendor lineup. And Scorpion Lewis. Okay. So I believe there are... Copy. There we go. So we have 40 entries in here. This one should be a little bit easier. Okay, Craig Battle, followed by Craig Ecleater, and then Jeremy Warpigs, and continuing down, you're picking an order um, on the Scorpion page. So let's go find uh, Scorpion. I will deal with the nightmare that is formatting on Facebook shortly. 
And I apologize in advance, but there appears to be all my control. I think I opened with that. I think I said at the start. Okay, it's gonna be one of those days. You guys can't see what I'm doing, can you? So I guess it doesn't help you. But I'm uh I gotta find the scorpion post. And it's not working out for me, so. You know what? We'll just put this in the word file, too. <laughs> and paste. Okay, next one. We'll do Clarky, Clarky Custom Beats. Here we go. Open a new one. Coffee. Where are we? 10 or 7? 10 30 will be our next presentation. I imagine this is boring. I'm really sorry about this, but I don't see another way around it as of yet. So, new giveaway. Face and Clarky Custom Bates. Everyone still sees the same thing, I'm assuming, right? Um, all right, here we go. Roll the dice. 12. Ryan. 98 entries, by the way. I think Noah came up with 10 or 12 baits for us. And considering he had zero three weeks ago, and he has a full-time job, Luckily for us, no one likes sawdust for breakfast. Uh, German Wolf, you'll be picking first at the Clarky table. Congratulations. And the name of efficiency, I will post this after. And we will get right on to the next one. I need to stop for a second. I am worried here that I'm not seeing the title, which defeats the purpose. So, yeah, we're going to pause. We're not going to get too far ahead of ourselves. The first one was uh, DK. And the second one. Scorpion. Third one was Clarky. All right, next we will do River Slick. Patrick Rear is uh, not just a bait builder for um, River Slick. He is also a guide on the St. Lawrence, and uh, he guides the monsters. If you're uh, if you're looking for a fish of a lifetime, no one will question that uh, the St. Lawrence is one of probably the top two, if not the top, at worst, the top three bodies of water uh, in the world for a giant muskie. And... Um, and Patrick is out there and has been out there for years and years and knows what he's doing. Uh, he doesn't like to get stagnant with his baits. He tries new things and creates new models. But before you ever see them, he is uh, he has run them and given them uh, a fair shot um, to make sure that they do what he wants them to do and they catch fish. So, purposely draw to buy. His baits are awesome. He guarantees them. If there's ever an issue, doesn't matter where, when, and why, he will fix up. Uh, just reach out to him and. Um, don't hesitate to uh, 
try and get out on the water with them if you can because you'll learn things and you'll see things trust me okay here we go 14 draws for this one i think he ended up with nine or ten baits they're all posted just the small ones unfortunately but uh they're still awesome as it all right josh shanks you'll be picking first at the uh river slick table again i'm just going to copy this and paste it and we'll keep plowing through these we actually man the symposium early this year that'd be nice um red october that's going to be kind of funny because there was only three uh, let's not kid ourselves. Red October is busy because uh, Mark and, and his gang, they have to, uh, they're at the shows. They're at pretty much all the shows. I don't, they, they didn't quite get here to Canada, but they had baits here via um, uh, the St. Lawrence uh, fishing store, I think it was, a couple other places. Um, but uh, with all the shows and stuff like that, uh, the symposium just, uh, he, he did it out of generosity, he did it to help out. Um, but he only put together three little packages and uh, truthfully, they're cool little packages. And I'm sure uh, the lucky three who buy will uh, love them. Um, but there are um, There are 71, 71 entries in this, um, and only three of you are winning. So, <laughs> October, I am sorry for that. If you want to come fishing with me, you can borrow mine. I have a, an abundance of these because they're awesome. And um, yeah, here we go. They make a ninja tube, I think they call it. It's a smaller one with a little blade. And uh, I, I can tell you that thing like floats, transcends time and space. It's uh, a very cool bait. Uh, so if you're, you're, if you're picking, these are the 10-inch monsters, which are time-proven. But um, if you get a chance, um, try to get yourself one of those smaller ones for sure. Um, I'm looking for... Sorry, what did I do? I didn't even tell you. Brady Betchold, Elliot Nutting, Devlin Connolly, Dalton Roundpoint, Joel Hamilton. And if it goes past that, it goes past that. Um, I'll get this list posted up um, there shortly. And uh, whoever's managing that line, enjoy, because that should be a pretty quick one. <laughs> I should have uh, should have delegated that one to myself. Okay, next, uh, this will be a fun one. Everybody loves Frankie. Um, let's get his, uh, his lineup figured out. That's another one that uh, is very hard to say no to. So, um, so it's good to get this one out of the way early, so you know how much money you're spending today. Frankie's one of those guys that's understated but well known, and you never recognize him. I don't even know necessarily what he looks like, but. Uh, he is uh, generous, one of the first people to step up and say, yeah, I'm going to be involved. Uh, first person, absolutely the first person to say, I have a donation. I'll make sure it's ready for you, no matter how busy I am. And uh, and you can read old books and and the folklore of musky fishing, and you're, you can't read a good book without finding Frankie Bates somewhere in there. So we got 79 entries, uh, all of you chasing, I believe, six baits. Frankie draw. Let's uh, let's get to it. 11, 14, 14 rounds. Susan, sorry, Susan's a huge help at the at things like this. Not just because she puts in her time. There's ten of us putting in her time, but she's incredibly organized. Um, she's always three steps ahead, and. Uh, I, I think she's in insurance, and I can't even imagine how much of an asset they consider her. But uh, if I wasn't a lousy bus driver and I had a, a place that I needed to employ people, she would be the first person I employ. 
Uh, Frankie Girardi by Craig Cleator. I think your name came up earlier. Daniel Cozzolino and Trex Hilty, Josh Hawk, Jonathan, Susie. You made the list. You're getting a Frankie if you want it. Dan and Craig. Um, we'll see how much longer past that it goes. Let me copy this. Come over here. Okay. And let's keep going. This is going well. Uh, BR Bates. Yeah, they're all right. Okay. Uh, these are awesome. Uh, here, here's a little known fact. Um, if I'm wrong, I hope uh, Bryn corrects me during his presentation later. But the word on the street is that every single one of Bryn's baits is water tested um, before you see it. So, yeah, they're work of arts. Yeah, they're built tough. Lots of baits are. Um, I am. What's the word for me? I'm a lazy prick. Uh, I like to, um, when I put a bait in the water, I want to be sure that the bait is running as it should. And for me, what that means is um, that it's running the way the bait builder wants it to run. So I want, I expect that when I buy a high end bait, it comes running true. And when you get uh, a BR, that's what's happening. You know, the second that thing hits the water, it's, uh, she's going to be awesome for you. So. Oh no, what did I just do? Sorry. I'm trying to talk. I'm kind of trying to like entertain you somewhat. But by the same token, I'm only really capable of doing one thing. And I didn't really sleep last night. So that's not true. I slept for one hour. Uh, when things got a little blurry, I had to close my eyes for one hour. Uh, eight. Here we go. One, Bryn, I don't even know how he managed this, uh, but he managed to get like 22 baits ready, and they're all beautifully photographed and 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 just straight up awesome. So um, I think it was 22, 22 or 24 baits. So <laughs> that's uh, given the amount of time and how awesome uh, his product is, um, it's uh, some pretty next level awesome stuff. So Bob Waz Facebook Jail again, aka Rob Waz. Um, you're picking first. Uh, Dan Kornblum, you're having a good day today. Um, there's the rest of the list. I will get this uh, posted to the site um, just as soon as the next presentation starts. You guys can take notes during the next presentation and just let me know what's going on. That'd be great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, next. Lila Lures, Greg Jones. Um, next time you're at a fishing show, okay? I insist you go talk to Greg. And the reason I do that is uh, he's knows what he's doing. He's a fantastic builder. Um, so you'll enjoy the conversation. So you can't go wrong. But when you're there, it'll put you in position to actually see one of these baits. Um, do I have one? Uh, they, like, they are so clean. They are so impeccable. Uh, it's hard to describe. It's hard for me to convince you without having it in my hand. Um, but again, we're talking high-end lures most of the times here. Um, and uh, when you're buying a high-end lure, you want the high-end lure to be high-end through and through every aspect of it. And when you buy uh, the Lila, like you're not going to have epoxy hanging off corners or um uh you know bad taping that's led to run through or glue places um you're gonna have uh, like a, a genuine uh high high end product it's 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 pretty next level so um it's a good purchase trust me so copy with that in mind, I pat the 43 of you on the list smart enough to get in line here uh, on the back and congratulate you for your uh, impeccable sense of 
taste or your impeccable taste in musky lures. Ten rounds. Here we go. Dave, Casey, Mark, Bob, Lance, Bob, Joe, Fred, Trex. Congratulations, Matt Mercer. You are first at the table. Have your choice. Make your pick. Enjoy. Uh, copy. Go to Word file. Peace. I need you guys to pray with me right now because I am not in, in good mental state for this. And so if I can do this, if I can pull this off without putting the wrong line up and claiming it's something it isn't or um, doing something like that, if I can actually not blow this whole thing up, next level awesomeness. All right, we are going to do um, Ironheart. Ironheart, new bait for this lineup. So we had his, uh, I, I would call it a mid, you know, mid column crank last year, a very unique profile. Um, I don't think there's very many of them out there. Um, where's the thing? Sorry, um, I'm just concerned right in a second. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I don't know how many of them are out there. I don't know about success stories. I know, uh, JT or, um, he is, uh, He's uh, an artist at heart and uh, takes pride in it. So um, here we go, new giveaway. Anyways, this is a new glide. Video looked awesome. Haven't run it myself yet. Uh, the couple people I know that have picked it up have had nothing but great things to say. I held one at the Odyssey. I just I was already very substantial sum of money in the hole, and uh, I couldn't uh, couldn't take a shot at it. But uh, that'll change in the near future. So there are 29 entries. I think there are seven baits in this one. And we're going to go eight times, ten times. Here we go. If I start to sound like I'm going crazy, it's because I am. But I think you guys can appreciate. Uh, Casey, you're picking first, Colin, you're second. I know you're uh, reloading there, Colin, so I hope you get a couple good spots along the way here. And I wish you the best of luck, good sir. Okay, here we go. Oh, Face. And then let's do uh let's do one more. And then we'll stop. Alright, St. Lawrence Customs. St. Lawrence Customs will be next. Terry, uh Terry's uh a man's man of sorts. Uh, he's an engineer, uh, former military, um, fishes on the best waters in the world, in my opinion. And um, life hasn't uh, life hasn't been easy for him, but he went uh, be out of his way to make sure that um, to make sure he had baits for us. And there were only a few this year. And then he not only did that, he went out and lowered the price from last year. Where everybody else's price is going up, uh, his went down. And, uh, and that's despite shipping going up and everything. Um, so credit uh, credit Terry for that. Um, if you look behind me, because I – oh, you can't see behind me because you're staring at my shared screen. But next time I'm live, um, you can see the bait. It's a, it's a very cool profile bait. It runs great. Um, and the artwork um, is is on par with how amazingly constructed it is. Saint Lawrence Custom Draw Two Five. Alright, let's do this. I think that adds up to eleven. Here we go.
Okay, Brad, you are first. Ryan Taylor, JR, Ryan Pickering, Lynn Goss, Bob Waz, Elliot Nine, Mike Hopkins, and so on. Um, we'll pick until we get uh, all the dates selected. Probably won't take long if you're smart. And uh, I will get this posted up again during the, the presentation. We are going to stop there for the draws. I think it's about time you guys see my um, magnificent glowing face. So Lisa, if you're still there. What just happened? There we go. Stream it. Oh, oh, you've been saying the me the whole time. Um, okay, we're going to stop the draws by there. Um, the time uh, is almost 10.30, which means we are ready for our next presenter. And uh, our second presenter today, um, this, is, uh, this is cool. Uh, I'm going to work through this next presentation, but in the background, I will be very, very, very much paying attention. And you should be. And if for some reason you are not paying attention, um, then you're not interested in learning today and I can uh, I can respect that some of us are better anglers than others but I can tell you that I personally need that uh, that little boost in information um, so uh, the man uh, speaking to us uh, has forgotten more about musky fishing than I will ever know most likely um, Elmer is a retired uh, fisheries biologist he went to school for um, um, uh, fish man or fishery management I believe um, or aquatic management. He uh, um, he is a uh, part of the stocking program in Ohio. Uh, he's not part of it. He runs it or has run it. He's a, a, a guide and they fish year around down there. He's uh, Bass Pro Pro Staff. He's Garmin Pro Staff. Um, I don't think I could give the man too many more accolades than that. And uh, he does uh, kind of the speaking tour, if you will in the states going to the muskies inc he's one of the kind of sought off present sought after presenters that uh people um are anxious to get to um present for him so uh he was very gracious on the phone and uh agreed to do a video recording presentation for us um would have been loved to have picked his brain in, uh, in person but he's guiding today um in ohio you can chase muskies even while they spawn and so they do but they uh, they also work very hard to protect that program um, with uh, an injection of financial resources and uh, um, stalking and things like that. So they can do that and get away with it. We we can't. So uh, without further to do, um, I have a fantastic presentation for you, um, uh, Mr. Elmer Elmer Heyu H E Y O U B. Uh, he also sorry before we start, he has videos. You go to YouTube. And he's got other clips and things that directly uh, relate to the presentation you're about to see. It's different. This presentation was made specifically for the Muskie Symposium. Uh, I imagine he'll probably use it going through the future because there was some effort put into it. But um, it is uh, very much our uh, our presentation meant for us. And uh, if you like what you see, you can go find the man and, uh, and uh, learn some more from him. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is um, Elmer Hyab. I'm a retired fisheries biologist for the High Division of Wildlife. And um, I've had a lot of experience with muskies because I started my career out, my career out raising muskies at the London Fish Hatchery for 14 years here in central Ohio. And uh, from there I moved as a fisheries biologist for District 1 in central Ohio where I helped manage one of our musky lakes and was very active in the program helping out you know, statewide on the Muskie program. And in my final years, I was the um, a, a program administrator for all the hatcheries in the state of Ohio, which two of them are our main Muskie hatcheries. It would be Kincaid down in Pike County and the London State Fish Hatchery in London, Ohio, here in central Ohio. So I am now on the Garmin Pro staff. I've been retired going on 14 years already. And um, I've given presentations all over the Midwest on structure fishing. I'm well known for my uh, musky fishing. 
and been very active in all the muskie clubs and uh, still active with the Ohio Muskie program. But I'm very fortunate right now to be a, a member of uh, Garmin's pro staff. I'm, I, you know, I'm not a, a, a full-time employee of Garmin by any means. I'm just on their pro staff and use their products. So I am going to give you a presentation on the products I have used and how they have helped me catch more muskies. So, of course, got to start out with a big grip and grin picture. This is my uh, biggest Ohio fish, and um, a 49 and 3 quarters, and yes, I couldn't stretch it the last quarter inch. Um, this is a springtime fish, exact, almost a, probably to the date, you know, here in mid-April, and I had, was mapping that channel with my Garmin uh, Quick Draw chart plotter, and this little uh, mini bait by Extreme Musky Lures was ticking the stump field that I had just, I had just gotten done mapping. And I thought I had bounced and hung on to one of the stumps, but it turned out to be this big post-spawn female muskie. So that was a really nice surprise. So I'm sure most of you have gotten somewhat into the modern electronics um, and uh, have had the advantage of using them. The, you know, the absolute best thing that ever came out was when they start, you could do your own mapping. And you could put map cartridges in your depth finders. I went all those years up in Canada and always carried three spare props. And usually I'd get through all three and rotate back to the least damaged one before the trip was over and be, you know, into my fourth, fourth prop. Because my prop was how usually the first thing it told me I had a jutting rock pile out from the reef I was mapping. You know, it's hard to stop on a dime when you're trolling jerk baits and you're doing it in four feet of water, which a lot of those... Canadian muskies like to lay in on those really fertile systems. All right, this is one of the original panoptics, original one I had, the little PS22 that I had mounted on my uh, Minn Kota trolling motor. And it was a uh, single frequency, and you had to rig it so you, know, you could feed your trolling motor out and not get in the way. And I had a spring load, I used a bicycle spring, and it all worked out great and uh, did a lot of good stuff for me. And I still have that single frequency uh, PS22 that I've mounted, that I use for ice fishing because the ice fishing pack only works with the nine inch units. And so I've got my old Echo Map uh, 93 that I use for ice fishing. So this is my, this would be my transducer that PS22 ice fishing, which is cool about that. You can, Mount it there and, and drill any, how many holes in a row you want to drill. I've only got it set out right here for about 14 feet. This is one jig and lure, that's another jig and lure, and these are saw guy, kind of like a wall I crawl across the bottom towards my lures. You know, I could look under other people's uh, uh, shanties, do all kinds of things. So they're still very useful. If, if that's all you had, it's, it's way better than having a straight down uh, traditional sonar. This is what the back of my boat looks like. I use a lot of these mounting blocks because, you know, here I'm on the pro staff of, of um, Garmin. I want to make sure I've got all these transducers on my boat perfectly. So I figured, you know, I'd be moving around, moving up and down, moving left and right. And every one of them I've ever put on from Garmin, using their template, I put it on once and never had to move it. Now, I'm fortunate my boat has a very smooth hull. It doesn't have a lot of turbulence going on. So it's very transducer friendly. This bad boy here is my newer Panoptics transducer. It's a PS30 and it's mounted on the back of my boat. And I was recommended this transducer because it covers such a wide field and it's great for mapping lakes. And here again, I'm a structure fisherman. I learn where muskies are by mapping the lake and looking at the, how the lake lays out and how the structure lays out and then pick my spots and let the muskies and the structure tell me where I need to fish. So this PS30, as you can see, is 120 by 90 degrees. And let me show you this next slide here. So here's that PS30 on the back of my boat, 20 feet of water. I'm looking 15 feet off the back of the boat on both sides. So I can see a lot of what's going on in the back of my boat. I cover a lot of ground in a hurry mapping. This happens to be a school of small map we were hooking into. And if you think about muskie fishing, you know, here's 9, 10 feet out from the boat on each side. 
you can have two guys stand on the side of your boat facing the back and vertical jigging and watch both guys lures on the screen at once. You'll see some of that in some of the videos coming up here. But uh, very user friendly. It's still only one frequency. It's not you know, uh, totally live. Um, it's not as live looking as the, uh, the live scope today. But um, you just have a little the Fisher red blob instead of seeing the perfect outline of a muskie. But anybody that muskie fishes know what a muskie looks and acts like on the screen. So you're going to know it's a muskie when it shows up. Great way to fish. Um, now I've added the uh, force trolling motor. And just be aware, this is the old price. The price has gone up a little since then. This is the original. They have the 50 and the 57, and I have the 57 inch on the front of my boat. The nice thing about this, I didn't have a real, you saw my old Minn Kota. I didn't have a very modern uh, trolling motor before that. This trolling motor integrates with all your new Garmin chart plotters, which is nice. So whenever you need to do updates, you can control your motor from your chart plotter if you need to. It's all interconnected and, and very user friendly. This is my boat on the water. And one thing you'll see here when I first mounted that force trolling motor, my boat has a very swept down nose on the front of the boat. And the theory was this boat was designed for the good old days up in Wisconsin. Everybody drift casted across these lakes, these small natural lakes. Well, if you kept that nose down like that, it kept the boat drifting in a straight line and didn't push the boat around by catching a raised up front end. Your bow wasn't catching a lot of wind. I would probably rather have that level because I do a lot of trolling on big water and that'd be that much less water coming over the front of the boat. So this is what I did for that trolling motor. I wanted to get it straightened out so it can handle you know, all the steering and the, the compass readings and all that stuff you do with your trolling motors. You want to try to have them level on the front of your boat. So I took my measurements. I went to a, a, a good friend of mine that belongs in my Muskie Ink Club. He's, a, he's a, a carpenter that does custom woodworking. He cut me a wedge out of mahogany. And there it is. I'm just fitting it in on the front of my boat. This troll motor just sat off to the side. This is it. I, I put two coats of black oil wood preservative on it, remounted the trolling motor, and got my motor way closer to level and handles a lot better. Now I'm not liking my thrust isn't pushing up against the bottom of my boat, it's pushing straight back. Here's something you'll want to think about if you go to spend all that money on these fancy uh, electronic trolling motors. Now I wish I had a picture out on the link for this, but the, I like to, this is a big topic for a lot of people, I like to have my, this is my live scope now, and this is on a perspective mount on the shaft of my trolling motor. I only have the one live scope, some people have two or three in their boat, believe it or not. But uh, for my style of fishing with muskies, I'm only going to have one, I want it on a trolling motor. I want to be able to turn it with my foot. Us muskies guys like to keep two hands on our rod and reel at all times. We can't stop and reach down and turn a handle on it. Uh, live scope and you know aim it where we want you know I, that's wasted time for me that's time off my rod and reel and if a big muskie's going to hit it's going to be that time I take my hand off the reel to do something so I keep on my trolling motor the only disadvantage is you'll find out you know, if you got it on the trolling motor your foot control adjusting left or right if you're on a line up a cast like a lot of people do it's tough to get that minute setting with uh, the foot control. You tend to go a little past the left and a little past the right, but it's still great for looking up into all your down trees and under docks and across the rock piles. And I can do all that while I'm still casting and control it with my foot. So the word got out, you know, this was a couple of years ago and uh, you know, not everybody had live scope. But, um, a friend of mine that uh, is a president of the West Virginia chapter of Muskies Inc. got a hold of me and they're doing this research project down on uh, Stonewall Jackson Lake and they wanted me to come down and help catch you know, vertical jig and catch these these muskies that they had tagged because they want them caught and re released because they were studying uh, some of more, you know, delayed mortality from catching catch and release of muskies in hot water. 
So I went down, and this is the uh, master student with the wand locating the muskies. So picture this, I'm down there and the guy's locating for the muskies for me to cast at. So a nice nice thing to have, a nice support boat when you're out there musky fishing. So the first day he did that, we were about one arm of the lake. And I can tell you, everyone he located, we didn't see a lot that first day, but everyone he located, I got to hit my lure. Found it, using a live scope, and got it to hit. But I also believe that first day everyone had hit, I never landed one of them. They would hit it, but they weren't really grabbing and getting a good hold on it. So, the neat thing about that, we, excuse me, the second day, he went to another cove, had a lot more fish in it, and this cove was loaded with sunken trees, standing upright, big oak trees. And so this is my uh, PS30 in the back again. This is showing a, in 30 feet of water, that's tree on the bottom and sticking out at the top. This is our traditional sonar. I'm sorry about the clarity on the screen. And this is live view down. So you get to see all three looks at that tree, you know, well, three different looks of sonar there at once. So these muskies were in this and they were suspended in these treetops. I also found out that live scope was very handy. I used mine in the forward mode just to get through this cove. I mean, it's a huge cove, went for miles, but there were big trees sticking up everywhere just under the surface. So I was using it to whittle my way through the, the cove itself too. And uh, I might as well tell the story now. Twice while I was doing that, looking ahead of the boat about 25 feet, I saw muskies suspended at 12 feet. The thermocline was at 14, fairly shallow thermocline. And I was counting down the fish. I mean, it's 25, 20, 15, and then boom, they hit my jig and lure. I did that twice in a row. And that cove was we were going down through there. Count them down and they hit. So I don't think I've ever done that since. But that cove was really cool. It was also the first place using my my um, side view. I was able to see a musking suspend on the left side and the right side of my boat at the same time. So it's a great place to play with your electronics. This is the master student. His job is also to try and catch the muskies. And I like to joke about, it. I think I'll go back to college if I can get a master's degree and chase the muskies with antennas and catching them. Uh, great, great way to go to school. So I got a couple that day. I don't think I have any pictures of them, but um, he got this one vertical jigging and checked it and turned them loose. And this was another thing I found out or behind a lay down. I'm not sure what it was, but it uh, looks to be a Norwell with a couple of mermaids on it. I saw that in my own eyes. It need my electronics. This is another cool thing if you've never done it. Just a, a, a kind of a gee whiz thing. If you do the record button on your sonar, what it does is record traditional sonar. And with the Garmin units, you can go back in the Garmin Express and it'll show you everywhere you went that day. It's recorded, or as long as you had the recording going. And you can look up the time. And I knew approximately what time I saw a big musky come off this corner that had a stump on it. So I went back to it, and this is. This indicates your boat. This is the travel. It shows the arrows, the direction you were going. So I looked up this time. I got to right there. And sure enough, there was the stump. This is me vertical jigging. And this is the musket coming out under my jig. The one I looked back in that, and during that recording. This is going to be our first little um, video. My little old Garmin bird camera, and you have to look real quick. It's not blown up. There's going to be a musky come up from behind a stump here. As soon as this goes away, I'll show you where the stump is. There's a stump. There's going to be a musky hit that bait right there. Boom. There he hit it. He's on right there. <laughs> There again, this is the old PS30 in the back. This isn't live scope. They were watching each other lures going back, and I, you know, up and down. I saw that fish hit. I said, wasn't that your, wasn't that your lure? Because he didn't react right away. I saw the fish hit. I don't move this camera, so we won't see this fish land. We'll move on to another one here real quick.
That was a real nice 42 incher there. And here we got another quick video. Now we've got live scope, and this is a muskie coming up off the bottom. That's my lure, that's a swivel on my lure. And you gotta realize this is on my, I'm moving forward about a half an hour. In a strong wind, my trolling motor turned left and right, and that stabilization the Garmin has on our units is fantastic. How well you see My motor swing a little left and right, but you got a great view of that fish. Unfortunately, he, he came up to look and he went back down. I've learned a lot since this was a couple years ago. This is why a lot of people use, you'll see all the bass guys with two depth finders on the front of the boat, because they want to use that full screen for a live scope, like this, but they want to see their map too while they're doing it. So, I might as well explain this real quick. This is an echo map ultra unit, and I am just recording the screen itself from a camera. Now, that's why you get all that glare. The camera is hitting is seeing the front of that screen. And if your eyes you're looking past that glare, you're looking at the stuff back here and don't even notice you don't even notice this. So if if you go to the Garmin GPS map units, they have a feature called the helm control. And these units all have Wi-Fi, but the map units, if you go to a helm control, it'll record your iPhone or your Android phone, anything you're seeing on the screen. You can avoid all that glare. You'll get pristine footage if you go to the GPS map series. So you'll see a lot of guys have just that one, the cheapest GPS map unit they can buy. I think it's around $1,600 for a 10 inch screen that you can you know, record right to your phone, everything you're seeing on your screen. And then you can, so I may try and do that this year and this will wind up being my map unit. Just watch my map. So, they're again, using your modern electronics, Garmin's great. They've got the quick draw. They're one of the first, uh, probably were the first ones to have the mapping you can do right for, on your units. You didn't have to take a card out, didn't have to get your laptop, do any of that. It makes maps on the fly if you've got it turned on while you're fishing. This stuff is good as gold, mapping your own areas while you're fishing. And when you get up into the all the units from Garmin all the way down there, except the very last one, I think it's under a $200 unit and with a two inch screen, they all will do the quick draw mapping for you. It's really cool. Now you get up into the higher end units, you can add the color contours to the quick draw map instead of just having it black and white. And I'll show you what I do with mine because it really shortens the learning curve on new, body, new bodies of water. The other thing I like about switching to Garmin's was all the uh, um, icons you had to use that were actually fishing related. You didn't have to make things up. So as you went along and made your maps when you saw the stump, you can actually put a symbol of a stump on the thing. This is actually a day when I was going out and doing some uh, research on delayed mortality also. It's 7.30 in the morning, the water's 80 degrees. That's a no fish day for us here in Central Ohio because when it's 80 at the surface in the morning, that means it's 80 all the way to thermocline down here. Okay, this is all along that same area, and now you see the effects of adding color to your maps. And I'll show you how that works out for you, but what this really does is starts making features pop out at you that, you know, all of a sudden you're catching muskies right here, or you're catching muskies right here, or you're catching muskies right here. It becomes real obvious really quick what those muskies are holding on and uh, what depth that's at. So. It really helps put those pieces of puzzle together and, and shorten your learning curve. It's all about how much knowledge you're picking up while you're doing this and how fast you're going to catch that next muskie. This is another area at same lake. And what you see this goofy looking thing here, this is where I haven't mapped yet. That's why you got this oddball looking deal going on. I've mapped all this. These are colors I have picked out. These are actually humps that the Corps of Engineers put in the lake that they thought the walleyes would spawn on. 
so you can, it, this map is so accurate in one foot high definition contours, I control now in between these humps at 12, 14 feet, even though the top of these humps are two to four feet deep. And, uh, or you can drift through them or cast through them and make super accurate. And where the uh, channels swing up close as the barter goes out the farthest, you find out again why those muskies were always holding there in the old days when you're trolling, because it sticks out like a sore thumb once you've mapped it all. All these maps, you know, even the good maps that come on the GARM units, you can always make them a lot better yourself because commercially making maps, they do pretty wide transects crossing the lake so they can get the maps done. You can take your time on your own and really get the fine detail when you map, map it on your own. This is another part of the lake and you see how this road bed sticks out and it goes across the cove. This is, you know, a sunken farm ground. And uh, there's the old bridge right there going across. You know, this area here, where that road swings all the way down, you can just troll the length of that and then hit the end of the tips of these bars that stick out. Here again, you see these oddball shapes. Those are areas I haven't driven over and got mapping done yet. But you can see how quick and how much detail you get. Now, I may point out all these old icons on here you're seeing. These are stuff... I did, you know, 30 years ago on some of the old ranch units. You can transfer all those icons to your new depth finders, no problem. This is down at the beach. And here again, doesn't look like much. But so the core went down here and leveled all this out to make a beach. But when you get far enough out, then you get back to original contours. And what you find out, you know, like especially this one bar that sticks way out here. A musky magnet that stick out on the end of that. But I also find just these little secondary points, not much to them. Those are the ones that will hold muskies, you know, if I'm doing a deep jigging run. It's surprising how often those will hold them too. These inside turns may be real good too, especially in the evening because it takes them right in that shallow water where they can turn left and right on that beach and control the beach at night. This is another lake. And I look at this now like almost like my deer hunting, where I I will take a day if I know the weather's going to be stable. I'll take that first day and do a lot of mapping, and you can do it up to seven miles an hour, seven eight, get really good quality. If you want to slow down to four mile an hour, you can put your crankbaits out and do a lot of trolling while you're mapping. And I mapped all this and cool stuff you find like this island here. I found the old dam swung out and went across to this island, and that was at 19 feet. And mapped this big bar that goes almost halfway across the lake, and extended extension out here at 19 feet. And what I soon found out was all the active muskies I was coming in contact with were at 19 feet. So I went down the lake mapping all these bars, and the next day all I had to do was concentrate on the ones that had a lot of yellow especially the ones that swung out and went close to the old channel. This is another lake entirely. I brought this one up because a cool thing you can do with this once you've got the color coding. This is a great big popular bay in the lake that people do a lot of fishing. Well, I know that the uh, channel, the old creek channel is like 25 to 34 foot deep. I just pulled that out on my contour layers and gave that that real dark purple color so I made that whole channel pop as it went through that cove. So what that does for you, you can see real quick where that channel is swinging up the bars or how it relates to areas along the shore and those short distances those muskies can, you, can use to go back and forth. So, uh, and you can change this to every lake you go to or even farther up the lake you get to a shallower area, you can change that color in the channel and make that channel pop farther up the, up the lake. Here again, it really helps me find places in a hurry that might be holding the muskies. This one should have been after that two slides ago. I went up down that lake with that yellow at 19 feet. These are all the bars. And there's the old Mohican River channel. Yellow, yellow, yellow. The yellow, blue. Yellow, blue. Yellow, blue. And every one of those was holding muskies. I was there two and a half days. And, and uh, you could either troll them really deep with cranks or just go over it. Vertical jig in either one. Another little short video here.
This one's going to be a muskie. I'll show you how fast we want it. You can barely see him move to get it. He'll hit this on the next jig. He, he barely saw that fish leave the bottom. I've heard people say, yeah, they don't, they don't even cast for them anymore until they see them. Well, I can tell you, they can hide pretty good along the bottom. They're just out of, and they will move far enough from a distance that you won't see them and still hit your lure. So I'm on good areas. I'm going to fish whether I see them or not. Had some more fun this past summer. This is my my team Garmin here. This is my daughter, my uh, my trainer, trying to keep my body still in shape up the jig. And uh, this is our mascot, my wife's Karen Terrier. She absolutely loves the fish. And this is us with the PS30. I didn't do any fishing at all. I was letting them do it all. We had the Karen Terrier keep an eye on everything. Here's the PS30 in the screen they're watching. And they can see each other's lures going up and down. The cool thing about this is I do charity charters also. You can take people on the boat that have zero experience musky fishing, zero experience fishing, but you can put that rod in their hand and show them that lure going up and down, show them how to do it, whether you're smallmouth, walleye, musky, whatever. And they can do it on one of these, you know, with one of these chart flowers with that PS30 on it and have a ball doing it. They'll watch each other's fish, you know, fish coming in and watch the strikes. And it's very intuitive. You, they see what's going on so they know what to do. This was after the, the young lady got off the boat. So I finally got a hold of one of the rods. Ten minutes later, I got a hold of one. And there's there's uh, the Karen Terrier critiquing my landing. This was a nice 40-incher. Uh, this is a homemade uh, jigging lure I use. Uh, used, I can't get a hold of lures. I was on the BWOG Pro Staff, and they don't make these anymore. It was called a Divinator X. And so, really good jigging lure. I really like it a lot. Another quick little video here. This was a fish that I had uh, missed while I was jigging. I knew it was there, and I went back. This class I love when a plan works out. I went back later and cast it to her, a little bit different method than the jigging. And she was sitting right there, and she hit the figure eight. But this was a fish I'd used, you know, the, the electronics to find and miss and come back to. This is where you always lose them, dragging them in the net while you're by yourself. But she cooperated real nice and slid right in there for me. This is a research lake also, so I will scan her with a, a, a pit tag reader. And I got a reading on her immediately. Turns out this is the third time she'd been caught. The hooks. And she didn't like that. <laughs> I always wet my measuring board. It's actually mounted on a hinge on the side of my boat so I can bring it up and down. Here I am with the pit tag reader. And as soon as I get. Boom, I got a reading already. It beat, you wouldn't hear it, but. I think the next one, if I have two people in the boat, we don't have to bring them in and measure them. Yeah, that's probably going to be this next one here, real quick. 
Yep, man, that's just muskies chomping on jigging lures. Got, got lots of pictures. It's really interesting how they like to hit them head first, even even when you're bringing them up off the bottom, not necessarily dropping them. And this is not a walleye, it's a saw guy. And that is a six ounce, seven inch long jigging lure. And they will fly in and hit that bait as fast as a muskie will. This one's just lassoed. Okay, this is probably measuring one. Okay, now we got two guys in the boat. Off the hooks. We're gonna measure her on the outside. Let's get a tag reading here. This one we couldn't get a reading on. Got a hold of her boater grip just to hold her, and he'll hold her snoot on a zero. You got to have your measuring tape right at the water line for it to work. And you got to know where that water line is when there's two grown men leaning over the side of your boat. If you got a loom in the boat, that could be a pretty big difference. I'll show another picture of a 48 here from another boat's perspective, showing how we just did that. I sing it. Okay, here's a 48 inch fish. Snoot at the zero, pinch the tail, and, and read the length of your fish. That's a Detroit River, a 48 incher. Nice thing is, you don't have to bring the fish in the boat and still get a nice, accurate length. Another chomped on vertical jig and lure. Oops, flew by. Let's jump. This poor fish here, here's one of those things that happens now and then. That back hook went right in her eyeball. Don't know why I showed that picture, just but it happens. You can see how chewed up this bait is now. That can happen on a brand new one in a day's time. This is this spring. I just wanted to show you a nice fish. Uh, this is our local lake. Uh, 51 and a half incher. They just fired up the boat to test the, uh, the settings at the end of the ramp, and she rolled up immediately. So, a real nice fish. Turn her loose and Put, probably put a tag in her. She's got a pit tag in her now, so hopefully I'll get a chance to catch her and scan her this summer. It'd be awesome. I gotta tell you, this dude is a huge, huge gentleman. This was a week later, about a week ago now to the day. This is a 53-incher over at Salt Fork Lake, Ohio. Still full of eggs, massive fish, but he is so big, he makes a 53-incher look kind of small. But I guarantee they also, believe it or not, that same night took a 57 incher electrofishing and tagger. So, same lake, same night, 53 and a 57. I think they sampled 40 muskies that night. So, they we're getting to the end here. I don't have anybody audience. This is you know, obviously great musky fishing weather. Probably got a funnel cloud starting to form there. Get that good low pressure going. I'm hiding under the, under the, uh, Cheshire Causeway right there on Allen Creek Lake waiting for that thing to go by. Figuring the muskies, I'd catch two or three just sitting under the causeway waiting. So that's the end of my talk. I've only got one guest here in the audience. I don't know if he's got any blaring <laughs> questions and obvious things that I've missed. I hope you learned something from this. You know, they've got the new uh, live scope coming out. It is out, but you won't be able to probably get a hold of one for about five weeks or more. You know, high demand. You know, they're constantly improving that. I didn't go into a lot of detail how I use my live scope, but, uh, you know, we only, I probably already ran past my time here. So with that, I hope you enjoy this, and I hope you get a chance to be in somebody's boat that's using all this new equipment. Thank you. I don't know about anybody out there, but... Uh... I'm ready for the first Saturday in June. <laughs> uh, I actually have a uh, live scope. I'm quite fortunate. I uh, made that big decision when I bought my boat to uh, to do that. But uh, I won't lie. I haven't been able to use it that successfully yet. But I think I'm going to have to give it a little more time, a little more effort. Because it looks like uh, with the right tools and the right um, 
the right approach, it can be very, very successful. So that was very cool to watch. Uh, some big fish and uh, a lot of uh, fish picks and fish stories, but uh, embedded in there um, was uh, the value of electronics nowadays. And let's not kid ourselves, 85% of the battle is figuring out where they are, right? And then the last 15 is being there when they want to eat and, and giving them what they want. Um, but if you've got these electronics telling you um, they're on bottom, they're mid column, there's bait around, there's uh, transitions up ahead, it's um, it's it's a big deal. And I've talked to some of uh, some people I know who fish the bigger waters in Canada that are chasing the uh, the bigger fish, um, similar to the one there, bigger actually, way bigger. Um, and they're using these, uh, not, uh, not necessarily jigging with it, but they've got this live scope, uh, mounted rear facing, and they're able to see exactly where their bait is. And they know, um, like you want to talk about having your, your depth charts and stuff figured out. Not everybody has that. Not everybody's, you know, Mike Lazarus and has it all or dialed in. Um, so with, with this, you know, with the electronics, you can kind of cheat a little bit, get a head start. You'll see your bait. You know, if something's come up to follow it, maybe you can bump a line. Um, I've heard on more than one occasion of guys marking a fish clear as day with their live scope while they're trolling and then doing a 180 with the boat coming down and putting a bait right, like literally on the snout of the fish. And at that point, they're not, it doesn't matter whether they're hungry, they're there to, to you're going to get a snap reaction under the most likely. So, um, you can spend a lot of money on fishing lures um you can spend a lot of money on a lot of things but uh i don't think i can't think of too many people who spent money on electronics and thought man i should have spent it on something else um the uh it that'll help you catch fish for sure um now whether you do front mount uh, on the trolling motor um moving around your foot or you have a handheld um specialized mount uh, or you just put it on the back of the on the chance on the boat and you face rear and use it for trolling. That's up to you and how you want to do it. Um, but uh, it uh, there's no there's no denying it. it. It's an advantage. I do wish we had uh, Mr. Hey available for com for questions. I have a couple myself. Um, but uh, I guess that'll be for another year, another day. And uh, we can uh, his email is readily available if uh, anybody wants it. Reach out to me. I'll get it to you. And uh, he can try to answer your questions. Um, but yeah, so thank you to him. Thank you to uh, his Muskies Inc. chapter present for doing the filming. His daughter for figuring out how to get that file from Ohio to uh, Canada for us to use. That wasn't easy. Um, and uh, I appreciate their effort. Uh, let's get back to Draws to Buy. Uh, Start making our way through the list. Um, while that presentation was on, I unfortunately missed uh, some chunks of it. Not a big deal. Um but um, I did get those lists um, that I copied to the word file and put them on um, to the various draw devices that they belong to. Um, Facebook is not being my friend today. It will not let me search. Um, so I just got braces. You have to bear with me. Um, it won't let me search. And I can't. Uh, it's taking a long time to figure out where these uh, where the actual builders posts are. Um, but I will get it done. And um, you'll just have to be a little patient with me as that happens um some picking is already happening try to pay attention try to look for being uh anyone tagging you um or sending you a pm um because that's how we're going to get to keep this thing moving but also let's be patient uh we got weeks weeks until any of us can use any of these fishing lures so um if you have an issue going forward don't hesitate to reach out to me i'll do my best to coordinate to solve problems to fix situations um it's something uh, I, I take pride in doing and I'm happy to do. Um, but uh, the baits are coming from the builders. I have nothing here. Every bait comes from the builder direct. You are paying the builders directly as well. Um, and all of the prices, as far as I know, have shipping included or the shipping parameters are listed as clear as day. So take your time. Make sure you know what you're doing before you send that money. Save yourself some fees. And um, the uh, and that's about it. There's a couple of little things that need to be switched on a couple of the... Uh, of the draw to buys. Um, I will take care of it before I draw them. I'll do it during the next presentation, but I, I am aware that the uh, JL lures, um, the pictures uh, had a loading issue. They're all over the place and some of them have doubles and triples and, and whatever. 
I'm going to delete all the pictures and reload them. Um, I've already done it twice, but I'll do it one more time. And then uh, uh, Johnny Libera, uh, right to the end, but he's got it done. He's got me these pictures. Um, so I know there's a lot of people online for Lebowski, but before I do that draw, I'm going to get those pictures up and just confirm with uh, him that we're, we're, uh, we're good to go. So those two draws will happen probably last. Uh, give me a little bit of time to get it. In the meantime, keep uh, keep your eye on the prize. Keep picking. And we're going to keep going down this list. We are on Thirsty Lures, Mr. Frank Thurston. Um, we got one right there. That is, uh, you put that thing 15 feet back off of a uh, outboard on St. Clair. And uh, that's what you call confidence. That, that's a bait. That's going to get hit. Especially the, that black birch pattern. I put that thing on the second the sun starts to uh, get close to the horizon. And that uh, that is a go-to bait for me. Um, so that, I think that's a joint in nine. But he's made a new one, a smaller one. I don't have it yet. Um, and he's, uh, Frank heard some people talking about, uh, you know, wanting very specific colors and hesitating to put themselves in line. So when you look at his, uh, his post, there are blanks in there. You pick your pattern. Um, and he'll get it painted up and sent out to you as quick as possible. So, uh, th thank you, Lisa, for putting us back to the, um, random.org. We are at the thirsty draw to buy and we had 42 people in line for, uh, one of these baits. I think Frank, Frank practically killed himself to get these baits for us. Um, another guy who had to go right to the wire and, and he's got a lot going on in his personal life. So I wish him the best of luck, and I'm grateful to him on behalf of all of us that he uh, he managed to get us some stuff here today. All right, let's find out who gets to pick what. Uh, nine rounds. It's Ryan Pickering, James Lucas, Nathan, Ryan, Dave, Chris, Craig, Dave, and Nolan, you'll be picking first at the thirsty table, okay? Again, I will copy this to a Word file, and I will go um, put that on later. So our next, uh, our next is going to be uh, drop time. Uh, drop time is something uh, many of you haven't heard of. Northern Ontario, um, friends of Mark Taylor and MKT MKT Lures. Um, and uh, he's put together some cool packages, well photographed, and uh, they look like good bits. I don't have any myself quite yet, but uh, uh, give your make sure you give him some time. Even if, um, even if you're not in line currently, uh, take a look in because I think there's going to be extras, and um, and it doesn't hurt to send a message and say, hey, I'm interested in this, that, or the other thing. Can I can I get that or whatever the case is. A lot of uh, a lot of builders, uh, especially when they're newer to the game, are ecstatic at the possibility of uh, putting you on their build list. Okay. Uh, Here we go. Eat. Be good, boy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Lee Lincoln, followed by Ben Graham and Casey Hoffman carrying on down there. Uh, I think there were 11. I'm not 100% sure. Um, don't quote me on that. Again, I'll get this posted during our next presentation. It will be put up for, um, for you guys to begin your picking. And next after that will be musky munchies. Musky munchies. I have uh, the privilege of. A couple of privileges. I have lots of privileges. I'm very fortunate. I won't lie. Um, wrong. 
I have an awesome tech crew behind me facilitating this. And I'm going to take advantage of that. And Lisa, I'm going to ask you to make me the main screen here in a quick second. All right. Lisa, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, this one, uh, I wasn't... I'm in the middle of something where I don't. My lures are kind of all over the place. They're not where they should be, and uh, I'm not going to discuss the why. Um, so normally, like, well, normally this is the second time we've ever done this. I had a nice little setup, you know, black perch running down the one side, and then now uh, orange belly, um, or mostly orange belly perch on the other, and uh, there were more lures, and but that didn't happen. Okay. Uh, I still picked some juicy treats out uh, for you guys to stare at so you don't have to look at my ugly mug all day long. Um, there's some some things I'm proud of and, and are quite fun there. But this is not the right pattern. It does not belong on there unless it was put there intentionally. So uh, this is the food truck uh, by Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy is got his pulse on the musky world. Uh, regardless of what's being built by who and where. And uh, he will take things, um, see their imperfections, improve upon it, and make sure that what you get is a finer quality uh, bait um, that you can get. And and usually something just a little bit different. And sometimes it's that little bit of difference that will make things um, uh, special. So uh, instead of blades, he's got, I think they call it, I hate to use the name of another company among them, but I think it's called the Trilogy Style uh, Spinning Blade. Uh, cool part with this is it's an insane amount of resistance, so it gets uh, it, it can stay up in the column pretty awesome. Um, and it starts no matter what. It's not like you don't have to bump it. You don't have to worry about not getting those blades engaged in time for that fish to actually be interested. But uh, one of the cool parts that sets it apart, you can actually hear it, I'm sure, right now. That little, they have these two little knocker bars. And then once you have... Uh, pressure uh, in the water they're going to be hit by this blade and you're going to get like this extra tinging rattling sound um, as this thing goes through the water so you got uh, a body bait profile uh, fantastic first class flash great ties like little things like taking shrink tube that matches the color of the bait um, always putting uh, epoxy down in the blades to make sure that you're um, uh, here you can see there he's got glitter epoxy down inside the um, the hooks to make sure that the, the flash doesn't get into it. These are the details that make uh, Jeremy Wolf special. And uh, the other equally cool thing, I don't have him here again. I'm a little discombobulated. You can dream up whatever you want. You come up with whatever and message Jeremy and in uh, beyond uh, no time, like faster than you can probably get your money together. Um, Jeremy will make that dream come true. Like I, I, I have dumb ideas, I guess, because I don't usually catch fish on them necessarily, but, um, I come up with all kinds of things that I think are, are cool. And, uh, I message him, he builds them and, uh, I'm grateful for it. Anyways, Musky Munchies has only 19 entries in it. Um, take your time guys, go over, see what he's got. When these guys are done picking, there are some wicked baits there. They are high quality. They are great. Um, here we go. I said, oh, I think this computer is more tired than I am. If that's possible. All right. Mm -hmm. Casey. Cody. Casey. If you guys want me to go slower or make this more dramatic, um, tell Lisa and she'll uh, interject and let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to plow through. Uh, Justin Griffin, you're picking first, then Rob Angus, Andrew Bolo, and Quinn Kurtz, and so on and so forth. Again, this will be copied and pasted very shortly to the appropriate page, but in the name of not wasting time, it's going to the Word file for now. And let's get to another one. Uh, we did the Sue, uh, well, second um, blade provider. This is uh, a different one. We're going to do um, the Musky Factory. Musky Factory. Let me find one. One second. Oh, I'm going to So this is our sponsor, um, which is an important thing to note. Um, so I, just for that reason alone, I think you uh, 
we need to show our support for their product. But it's beyond that. Um, if you look at the Mon Muskie uh, Monday seminars, uh, there is one specifically devoted to bucktails. And it's like a Bible. It, it's, it, it comes across like a, an audio uh, edition of a Bible. Um, and it tells you everything that you should look for in a bait. They know what you're supposed to look for in a bait because they've spent 20, 30 years each uh, um, on the water. Um, sorry, one second. There we go. You know, they've seen good fish, bad fish, ba uh, good baits, bad baits. John Anderson specifically, he knows what you need. He knows he's been sponsored by other uh, bucktail companies. He's taken uh, faults from others, improved them, and created Essentially, it is the most well-rounded, best, uh, uh, readily available bait. Like you, if you're going to go to a store and buy a bait and you want to know that there's no issue, you go buy uh, um, a musky factory um, bucktail. I, uh, we have 22 entries in this. There are four anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Danny. I've just been messaging back and forth with uh, Mike and John. Yeah. And um, they just decided they looked at the list and uh, anybody who, who went in line is is going to get this deal. And it's an insane deal. They've, they've made it even sweeter. Uh, so basically you get uh, for $80, you get a hundred dollar credit uh, at the Husky factory. And when you make your bait purchase, there's no tax on the baits as well. So Holy it is, uh, <laughs> it's the best deal we've ever had. Do the hosts get that deal? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I think and, you and I um, have to buy baits at this point. <laughs> and so, yeah, um, if you're interested in that, I'll put some information in the on the comments on, on how you can take advantage of that. And I will just say really quickly, we're doing something a little bit different this year uh, because we really want to focus on guiding during the summertime. So we're not going to be taking any custom orders in the summer. So this is your last opportunity. If you have any modifications to any baits that you want done or special skirts or blade configurations, this is your, uh, your last opportunity and to get it at a great price too. So that's awesome. That's a, that's a heck of a deal. So I won't bother randomizing the list. Um, that saves us money technically. Um, <laughs> those 22 names that are there, I'm going to uh, copy them, paste them and, uh, and then we'll send a message to each of them. You or myself, one of us and let them know that they all won. Uh, this is uh, this is my kind of a lineup. I like that. I like it when everybody wins because that's Thanks, uh, guys. that's usually how I can make things happen. All right. Um, so just give me a quick second here. Muskie Factory, twenty-two winners. Beauty. Congratulations to those guys. All right. All right. What's next is you got me discombobulated. Okay, Wiki Baits. Uh, I believe we have fourteen Wiki Baits uh, available to us. Let us open up. Okay. And there are 33 names for this lineup. Perfect. Wiki base. I went and visited uh, um, Mr. Ryan Wickholm for a couple minutes at the Odyssey. Um, I didn't spend enough time. I didn't spend enough time with a lot of people. I am very apologetic for that, truthfully. I regretted it, but I was so tired by the time I got to the point where I could socialize that I couldn't socialize. Um, but these baits surprised me. Um, I, uh, I, they were incredibly clean, uh, a unique profile, um, uh, very nice job. Um, I'm definitely worth a look anytime. If he's going to continue to come to shows, I think he's just going to grow. And, uh, if you get a chance, uh, take, take a, take a second glance and, uh, maybe ask for a video or whatever. Cause it's a, it's a special profile. It's, uh, uh I think it's, it's kind of that perfect white size of a bait. So, um, anyways, here we go. We got 33 entries. Uh, we got six rounds. Here we go. One. Two, three, four, five, six. Casey Hoffman, you're picking first. 
I think we have time. Let's try and knock off uh, at least one, if not two more, before we get to our next presenter here. And the fun thing is uh, I've been so busy that I haven't, even the recorded presentations, I haven't seen them. So I'm sitting here, like, inspired and in awe at the same time as all of you guys. But I'm also working in the background, so we'll see what we can do. Uh, that's the new giveaway. Who's next? After the wiki beats was seven of five. One of my favorite people on the planet, Mr. Sean uh, Howard. Seven of five dot five. I think he's famous for his lights, but he's also got cranks, um, deep and twitch, and all the baits are really, really awesome. Um, that kind of classic built tough, still beautiful, uh, uh, fishable in a dynamic way. Um, bait. If you're going for his glides, these are not for the faint of heart. You, they, uh, they are heavy. They cast far, they dance in the water. Um, but, uh, you're, you're going to be working. The, the good news is you're not working for nothing. When you got that bait in the water, you know, you got a good chance. You know, if the fish is there, um, it's uh it's gonna be paying attention you'll have there, there's no there's no wondering if uh if you have the fish's attention when you're fishing with that bait for sure there we go so we've got 55 people in line and i think sean got like uh what did sean do 13 baits. So good luck. On ball. This will be the last one. 12, 14. Okay. Kyle. Fuck. I'm not meant for computers and stuff. Why do people do this all day? This hurts. Brian Weaver, you are first, and then Calm Color, Jamie Lucas, Sean Ryan, Tom Sammy, Mark Hornick, and so on and so forth. I will copy this list and I will paste it. We are two minutes to 11.30, uh, scheduled for our third presenter. We are moving along quite nicely here. Um, I think we are on pace with our draw to buys. And um, the next one, uh, our next presentation is... Um, probably one of the greatest musky science minds available. Um, so we are very, very fortunate. I think we only got his attention because we did a, a pretty big donation to uh, Syracuse and the, I think it's called the St. Lawrence um, Waterway Project. I should remember that, but I can't write the second, so I apologize to you. Um, but uh, John Farrell runs the Institute. He's uh, the leader of the pack with a whole army of students to do research. They are working actively on the St. Lawrence um, studying um, various aspects of muskies, but also dealing with things like the goby situation and things like that. Um, and so I asked him to do two things, and we'll see what we got. Uh, what I asked uh, Dr. John Farrell for is uh, information about how um, muskie anglers uh, putting money into research, how it's um, what it's leading to, what we're learning. And I wanted him to try and give us a little bit of information that would help us um, increase our catch rates. That was the request. Um, the man was crazy busy, uh, but he did manage to get something recorded for us. And um, and I'm grateful for that because again, this is the time of the year where they're out in the field all day, every day, weekends, nights, mornings. And um, and so we are, we're very fortunate. Uh, Lisa, if you're good to go, I think, uh, I think we're ready. Hi everybody, I'm John Farrell. I'm from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry here in Syracuse, New York, and I direct a field station on Governor's Island uh, near Clayton. It's called the Thousand Islands Biological Station. And it's a privilege to be able to tell you a bit about some of our work regarding muscalunge. And I really uh, wanna thank Danny Colley and 
Muskies Incorporated, Muskies Canada, for all the, the wonderful partnerships we've had. Uh, call out to Chapter 69, and we're starting to work with uh, Chapter 70. And we're, we're just excited to have this opportunity this Saturday morning. I'm recording this on uh, Thursday afternoon, but uh, I hope uh, everyone gets something out of it. And I, I want to just give a little overview. Today I hope to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the recent work that's going on. It's funded by the New York State uh, DEC and also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that have been uh, long-standing supporters of our work uh, at Governor's Island. We're at Governor's Island in the Thousand Islands Biological Station. We're dedicated towards uh, trying to inform managers about what's going on with the St. Lawrence River. We, we monitor fish populations. Uh, we, we monitor aquatic habitat, water quality. Uh, there's a whole team of researchers that get trained up there, undergraduate students all the way to postdocs. Um, we have a team of graduate students working on a whole variety of environmental issues related to the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. And the, the core of our research, really its foundation, came from uh, work with muscalunge and, and improving management of muscalunge. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about that story and this current effort to try to help revitalize uh, the St. Lawrence River muscalunge population and also a little bit about why we need to do that. So here we go. So the management of muscalunge is an international process. It really began in the 1970s when there were concerns about musky populations back then. And it's organized uh, under the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. There's a Lake Ontario uh, committee. And under that, we formed a, a muscalunge working group with members from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and also uh, the ministry at Ontario. Uh, this, this working group has been meeting and we, we have this uh, tremendous uh, support from, from these agencies in, in addressing uh, items that were highlighted in the management plan. And one of the key things is like the collection of biological data and doing uh, monitoring of the fish population and also the quality of the habitat. So uh, there's been big efforts on critical habitat identification, like locating where uh, key musky spawning and nursery sites are, and then trying to improve fisheries management. So working with anglers is a, obviously a big imp and important part of that. Uh, we've learned a great deal from, from working with anglers uh, because they spend so much time on the water and, and those observations are really valuable to us. Uh, there's three goals in the management. We, we wanna make sure that this population, one of the reasons it's so special is that it's naturally reproducing. So it's a self-sustaining population. So it can go on without the inputs of, of man and people. Um, we also recognize the importance of the ecological role of musk orange being the apex predator in the population. And, and the importance of maintaining a quality trophy fishery, a recreational fishery uh, in the river uh, for people and future generations to enjoy. Uh, if you wanna look at our unit reports that we submit to uh, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission every year, you can go to this website and get updates uh, on, on the activities that are going on with the monitoring and research program. And uh, I'm just gonna move on from there. So the, the program, as I mentioned, has been going on for a long time. And uh, we're, we're coming up on about 40 years. Uh, pretty soon we're gonna have our 40th year. And uh, over that time, there's, there's kind of a coupled uh, approach now with long-term monitoring to look at the dynamics of, of the fish population and then have targeted research that informs us about uh, important things that are going on and changes and things of concern. So 
we, we continue to do adult uh, population studies and monitoring, which you'll, you'll hear more about. So we, we have a, a spring index. So we, we monitor the spawning population and also uh, we have an angler diary program to achieve this, uh, to look at the adult stock and, and what's going on with it. There's, there's some recent uh, exciting things that, are, that possibly will occur associated with a, a new tagging study in the next few years. There's a, an acoustic array that's been put into the St. Lawrence River by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's an opportunity uh, for our teams to learn about uh, musky movements in the system. We've done uh, those studies in the past, but there's this new technology that's kind of exciting. Uh, we've, we've also done numerous studies on the spawning habitat in the river. Uh, We've, we've studied uh, natural spawning and egg distribution within sites and the, the survival of, of natural reproduction. So those are really difficult things to, to measure and, and we've done like considerable work here uh, making some of those measurements which now serve as an important baseline uh, to compare uh, what the past was like after Numerous changes have occurred in the river. Uh, you're going to hear more about this, but we've seen invasive species come into the system that potentially could impact muscalunge. Uh, we, we know that the river is warming, so we're seeing changes in the climate. And we're also seeing uh, changes in the habitat. Uh, there's invasive plants, uh, water level management, and all these externalities that can have influence on, on the success of muscalunge reproduction and the sustainability of the population. Uh, we, we work on what we call YOY, which is young of the year, habitat, uh, distribution of young muscalunge and their survival. So again, we, we've done studies on, on these factors and, and how they influence uh, muscalunge reproductive success. And um, they, they serve as a baseline. So we, we kind of know from these earlier studies, many of which occurred prior to even zebra mussels and, and now round gobies. So we have a baseline of how uh, these, these functions occurred prior to these uh, changes in the river. And now we can repeat them and see if muscalunge are able to achieve similar rates to what we saw historically. Um, we've done uh, some studies on sub-adult muscalunge. Um, historically with radio telemetry, uh, and also more recently in partnership with Carleton University, uh, we had a graduate student uh, that has revisited uh, sub-adult movements and age one movements that are really important to fill uh, this information gap. Uh, we studied the forage base uh, in the entire fish community. So while we are studying muscalunge, we can't really look at it in a vacuum. We look at it along with the other members of the fish community. So there's, you know, probably 40, 50, 60 species of fish that occur commonly with muscalunge. Muscalunge uh, really uh, are, are the apex predator, as I mentioned, and they're dependent uh, as a piscivore. So they eat fish. Uh, they have certain preferences, uh, especially as young uh, muscalunge have preferences for specific prey. And we, we need to monitor that forage base um, and also to maintain a healthy, diverse native fish community uh, for the river. Uh, we've worked a lot on population genetics um, and looked at the influence of stocking. Uh, we, we've worked with uh, uh, several labs uh, up in Laval with uh, Louis Bernacci. We've worked with uh, Chris Wilson out of uh, um, Trent University, and uh, also with Lauren Miller. Um, and we're uh, looking at uh, population genetics and the influence of stocking uh, on, on musk and lunge. And there's some good news here because there's, there's been quite a bit of uh, moving of gametes and, and stocking, uh, especially in the lower river. Oh, we had a little glitch here, guys. I'll get that presentation queued back up for you in just a second. Danny, can I throw you up for a minute? So why don't I go back to uh, Gerardo Bice? Um, 
um, until you're ready to rock and roll. Perfect. Man. Okay, guys. Uh, don't mind my glasses here. Uh, we finished off, I believe, with 705. Um, I, if you're staring at me, then you're not seeing the money giveaway. Uh, I feel like you probably don't care that much. Uh, oh, no, hold on. Can I do Let's see if I can do this. Maybe I don't need Lisa. The odds of me not needing Lisa are somewhere between your initial share. Share screen. Uh-huh. Sure. There you go. Now you're speaking. Lisa's great, but I, I can hack this totally. Don't ask me how to get back out of here, by the way. Okay, uh, new giveaway. And we're going to do MKT Lures. Um, Mark Taylor went all out and put a whole lot of lures in here. So you guys got great selection. His top water seems to be the talk of the town. And he's got some primed and ready to go. So you think you get to pick your color. Um, that's, uh, but let's not discount any of his other cranks or glides and other baits. Um, the, uh, the internet seems to be littered with pictures of fish caught on his baits recently. And they're very fairly priced. And, uh, and quality made, so you can't go wrong. And uh, in some cases, you can even get them in stores. I saw some at uh, uh, Pro Tackle in Belleville, actually, last time I was there. But uh, 58 baits available um, for MKT. And Susan's going to help manage this line. You guys may be able to pick two baits each. I'm not really sure um, how to best handle that one. If Mark Taylor himself wants to play a role in that decision, um, I'm cool with that. MKT lineup. Copy. Here we go. Well, actually, you can each just have one bait. Just 45 of me in line. Works out nicely. Um, That's 12 rounds. There we go. From Jalen, you're picking first. Um, I will copy and paste this list. A few minutes. Okay, and next after MKT is uh, we're gonna do uh, JL lures uh, in a little bit. I'm just confirming something. I think uh, I think Susan may have taken care of the situation. But uh, I'm one who's got the pictures, so I just want to confirm before we do that. So let's do uh, Matthew Chase. Matt Chase. Uh, Matthew's in the background today helping out. Um, he and his, uh, his lady friend. And they managed, despite having such great sales at Odyssey, to still put together 17 little packages for us here. Um, and most importantly, uh, they've got the Mad Tour 2022 in combination with uh, – I think Water Wolf Lures is involved, 54 or Bust is involved, um, uh, a few other uh, people as well. And uh, it's a great concept, a great opportunity to promote local bait builders and the musky uh, economy, um, showing off different uh, guides and waters and, and uh, builders and all of that. Uh, it's, it's ambitious, uh, unique, and cool. They've got uh, their own Facebook group. Um, um, the Mad Tour 2022, I think it is, and um, um, keep your eye on that. He uh, he he can't help but go up, and uh, he's pushing hard, so good for him. Uh, let me get his list here.
and throw the dice. Bear with me, my friends. Bear with me. I'm getting to the stage where everything is moving in different directions. I'm a little bit tired, Neil Weniger. But I will stay awake. I will make it. I just need a little bit of a pick-me-up here in an hour. All right, Cody Smith, you're up first at the Mad Chase Lures table. Happy pickings. There's some cool stuff there. Um, I will get this list posted shortly. Lisa, at any point. All right, Danny, here I am. <laughs> here I was trying to, trying to multitask, and I failed miserably, but I think I got it figured out now. So I'm going to pull the video back up. We just kind of have to um, – because I was doing something else. Hopefully, you know approximately where we were in that video, and you can give me some guidance. All right, uh, sounds good. Uh, he he just finished telling us. Um, like, I think he was about to like transition out of the whole introduction into more the content um, sure. of it. I think we here to get playing. I'll get a sense of where it is in a second. Can we talk while it's presenting, or I don't know how this works? Yep, I got all. Uh specific populations to increase sustainability of the muskie population uh, with our partners. So here, here's some of our long, longer term information. We have been uh, doing a spring. I, I don't actually, spring. I think we were further Same back. Way. We're in this area. He was just starting to talk about young in the year. Uh, changes in but the, I was also working on things in the background. Also, so. uh, we have an anger diary program. Yeah, that's it. This, right there. Uh, to look at program. An adult right. stock Sorry, everybody. What's going on? Lisa's there's, awesome. There's Don't you dare judge her. Uh, <laughs> exciting things that are that possibly will occur associated with a, a new tagging study in the next few years. There's a uh, an acoustic array that's been put into the St. Lawrence River by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's an opportunity uh, for our teams to learn about uh, musky movements in the system. We've done. Uh, those studies in the past, but there's this new technology that's kind of exciting. Uh, we've, we've also done numerous studies on spawning habitat in the river. Uh, we've, we've studied uh, natural spawning and egg distribution within sites and the, the survival of, of natural reproduction. So those are really difficult things to, to measure, and, and we've done like considerable work here uh, making some of those measurements, which now serve as an important baseline uh, to compare uh, what the past was like after numerous changes have occurred in the river. Uh, you're going to hear more about this, but we've seen invasive species come into the system that potentially could impact muscalunge. Uh, we, we know that the river is warming, so we're seeing changes in the climate. And we're also seeing uh, changes in the habitat. Uh, there's invasive plants. Uh, water level management, and all these externalities that can have influence on, on the success of muscalunge reproduction and the sustainability of the population. Uh, we, we work on what we call YOY, which is young of the year habitat, uh, distribution of young muscalunge and their survival. So again, we, we've done studies on, on these factors and, and how they influence uh, muscalunge reproductive success. And um, they, they serve as a baseline. So we, we kind of know from these earlier studies, many of which occurred prior to even zebra mussels and, and now round gobies. So we have a baseline of how uh, these, these functions occurred prior to these uh, changes in the river. And now we can repeat them and see if muscalons are able to achieve similar rates to what we saw historically. Um, we've done uh, some studies on Subadult muscalunge, um, historically with radio telemetry, uh, and also more recently in partnership with Carleton University, uh, we had a graduate student uh, that has revisited uh, subadult movements and age one movements that are really important to fill uh, this information gap. Uh, we studied the forage base uh, in the entire fish community. So while we are studying muscalunge. We can't really look at it in a vacuum. We look at it along with the other members of the fish community. So there's, you know, probably 40, 50, 60 species of fish that occur 
commonly with muscalunge. Muscalunge uh, really uh, are, are the apex predator, as I mentioned, and they're dependent uh, as a piscivore. So they eat fish. Uh, they have certain preferences, uh, especially as young uh, muscalunge have preferences for specific prey. And we, we need to monitor that forage base um, and also to maintain a healthy, diverse native fish community uh, for the river. Uh, we've worked a lot on population genetics um, and looked at the influence of stocking. Uh, we, we've worked with uh, uh, several labs uh, up in Laval with uh, Louis Bernacci. We've worked with uh, Chris Wilson out of uh, um, Trent University and uh, also with Lauren Miller. Um, and we're uh, looking at uh, population genetics and the influence of stocking uh, on, on muscalunge. And there's some good news here because there's, there's been quite a bit of uh, moving of gametes and, and stocking, uh, especially in the lower river. And we're seeing that the core of the, the main stem of the St. Lawrence really has maintained uh, a significant uh, integrity of its genetics of this Great Lakes strain, uh, which produces uh, these amazing fish. So uh, in our, our restoration efforts, it's good to have this baseline so we, we aren't mixing uh, different strains of muscalunge and changing uh, the, the Great Lakes strain of muscalunge that we have. So, um, very important to understand the, the population genetics. And, and we're moving further in working with genetics um, to, to kind of understand uh, not just population structure, but also to be able to identify individuals that are released in the system. So it, when, we, when we do the stocking to actually restore uh, spawning and nursery sites, which you're gonna hear about in a moment, um, we, we do one-to-one -one uh, matings of males to females, and we have the genetic uh, markers for those those fish that we're using in the restoration. For one, uh, we don't want to reuse fish, so we actually um, can look in our database to see if if a muscalunge has been used in the uh, stocking effort, and then we won't use it again uh, to make sure we get uh, significant genetic diversity. But also, we can use it as a marker. Um, to look at the success of these, these fish that are being released in the system. So uh, um, pretty, pretty uh, important work on population genetics. Uh, we also have a partnership with uh, Cornell University, uh, Dr. Rod Getchell at the uh, uh, SUNY uh, Veterinary College uh, at Cornell, and uh, we're able to study disease dynamics. I currently have a graduate student, uh, Anna Conklin, who is working on her PhD. And uh, we're looking at VHSV in this ecosystem. We're looking at the reservoirs for VHSV within the fish community, uh, specifically round goby and, and other uh, important fish species that are present in the muskie spawning and nursery sites. And the virus is still there. It's mutating, it's changing, um, and we're, uh, interested and concerned about the future of the HSV. It could, this is a rhabdovirus that can mutate and change and it might cause uh, mortality in the future. So we're trying to stay on top of that and really understand how uh, the food web uh, interacts with the virus, how the environment interacts with the virus and what the risks uh, are that are posed to muscalunge. Um, we're also, like I mentioned, looking at population viability and restoration. So you're gonna see in our data that um, we've lost uh, some significant components of spawning and nursery uh, sites where, where musky populations have been uh, depleted, um, in some cases almost extirpated from specific sites. And it's a combination of factors we believe between like changes in the habitat, but also the legacy of, of the VHSV disease so we're trying to rebuild these specific uh, site-specific populations to increase sustainability of the muskie population uh, with our partners. So here, here's some of our long, longer-term information. We have been uh, doing a spring trap netting index of muskellunge uh, for a long time. It, it actually goes back uh, before this to, uh, to 1983 
at specific sites. And then there was a set of sites that we've been monitoring annually since 1990. This is data from 1997 to 2000. And uh, we use this uh, to, to monitor the population. Tagging is done. Uh, we, we have learned that muskies home to specific uh, spawning and nursery sites. Uh, and, we, and we almost see that without uh, deviation. So muskies uh, go and will return to the same sites. There's, there's fish in this database that I tagged when I was much younger. And then when, there's actually one individual I recaptured almost 20 years later um, that was still using the same spawning and nursery site. So there, there's a set of uh, sites that we monitor uh, consistently every year. It's a, it's a lot of work. It goes on for about a month. Um, the nets are checked daily. And uh, we see this uh, um, concerning decline uh, since VHSV came into the system. I've got a marker here for about 2005 uh, when we, we first started detecting um, mortalities, uh, widespread mortalities in the system. And you can see these asterisks here. So there was a decision made uh, by the uh, Musculins Working Group to uh, reduce the amount of effort. Uh, we were going to sample Musculins. Things were going so well in 2003, we had a record catch. Uh, we were going to sample every uh, third year. And uh, we um, have since re uh, continued to sample annually after uh, the VHSV came into the system. We needed more. Uh, closer tabs on what was going on with the spawning population. So you can see data here. It's a catch per net night. Um, that's every day that we, every night that we uh, um, reset the trap and it fishes overnight. So that's why it's catch, called a net night. And um, we've seen a decline um, in the, the musky spawning stock, especially when you look at this. You know, there's uh, um, probably 16 sites that are sampled in this database annually. So uh, it's a combination of a lot of uh, spawning information. So if we break that down um, by these uh, segments of years, so we've got these five-year periods, it, it kind of shows the story. So the, the dotted line is actually the effort. So that's the number of net nights that we've um, put into our spring spawning index. And you'll see that we've increased uh, that effort. We have exploratory sites and we've increased that effort. We've seen a decline in catch. So um, these, the, the fact that these two lines are diverging uh, since VHSV came into the system is a concern to us uh, is in this population index. And there's certain sites that we're no longer really able to catch reliable catches of uh, spawning adult muscleworms. So this, this is one thing that we're very concerned about. Um, we also, I mentioned that we track the fishery thanks to uh, dedicated anglers like yourselves. Um, if people are interested in participating in this program, uh, in this program, uh, we, we have a, uh, an online uh, form now. I wanna thank uh, Chad Lapa from uh, Chapter 69, Mike Muskies Incorporated. Chad is a gifted, uh, computer programmer and he created a, 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 a version of our uh, diary uh, program uh, data collection method and put it into uh, a portal that's available on the Ch chapter 69 website. So that's a way you can participate and put your data uh, into the system. Um, but we've been, we've been using this and it's also used uh, to kind of have a target for management. So that right now the target for management is to have uh, a catch of one muscalange per, per uh, 10 hours fish. So that's kind of a management target. And um, we, we again uh, see that we, we started reaching that um, target um, early in the database. Uh, 2000, 2001, people were really doing well. And then we've, we've kind of seen a uh, decline below that. Um, and, you know, we, we believe that some of this is due to this population change associated with uh, the loss of fish due to VHSV and this die off. Um, we've worked closely with Dr. John Castleman over the years in the management of the, of the muscalunge. And, and John and I have, have uh, worked up a lot of 
data on uh, the influence of VHSV and the die-off event. And you can see that in the uh, Muskie Symposium book that was published. We, we have seen a, a considerable rebound this past year, so the muskie fishery bounced back. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar that there was really good angling this past season. So, you know, you can't necessarily equate uh, angling success with population trends, but you do need the fish to be there uh, to be available uh, for the opportunity to be caught and be part of the fishery. So this is one of the tools that we use in management. Um, and uh, this is uh, another summary of that data um, in these, uh, these uh, time period kind of analysis. And we can see that effort's been, you know, relatively stable. I think it's gone down a little bit. And you can see that there's been a general uh, decline in catch um, in the more recent uh, decades uh, since VHSV. So, you know, it's, it's consistent with what we're seeing um, in the trap netting uh, spring trap netting database that there there has been a decline in the population. It's reflected in the fishery, um, and uh, you know one of the the bright spots is that the size of these fish is quite remarkable. So the the size of the fish in the fishery has has maintained uh, um, its its stature, and and we do see that um, we we capture fish anywhere from about 34, 35 inches all the way through to the, the really big uh, trophy individuals. So we have uh, fish in our database that are up to, I think, 60 inches. Um, and uh, we do see that uh, there is a, a complete distribution of sizes represented in the population, um, which, is, which is a good thing. So uh, we, we know that the musk lunge uh, reach about 28 to maybe on the outside edge, 30, 32 years at the most. And, and we've got to make sure that all these age classes are represented in the population. So that's a, a resilient factor in the population. So if you start missing age classes and things like that, it becomes of concern. And we haven't seen anything quite like that yet. Um, but this is what we're really concerned about is muscle and reproductive success. So. We, we do an annual uh, seining sample. Uh, you can see in this picture on the upper left, this is our uh, July fine mesh seining. We shift to a larger uh, sain in August um, that covers twice the area. And you can see uh, these are uh, done. Each one of these data points represents 90 sain halls in like a dozen different uh, spawning and nursery locations. So. It's a, it's a large amount of effort. The, the crews also sample uh, vegetation and uh, aquatic habitat and water quality data associated with this seining. And, and this is what we're looking for on the far right. That's a, a juvenile muscalonge. It's really important that that natural reproduction occurs. And you can see this is a catch per unit effort. So catch per seine haul. And uh, for those two surveys. And you can see these big spikes like in 1999 and again in 2002. And th these are uh, years where muscalongs were really abundant on the nursery grounds. And, and those fish potentially, um, you know, are just, uh, what, 22 years old now in our population. So some of these fish may still exist in the population, they probably do. They're probably quite large now, but that's that's kind of how you look at what's called a year class. So uh, when, when you get a, an abundant, successful year class, that can really carry into the fishery for many, many years. Um, and what we're concerned about is we've seen a precipitous decline in the number of young muscalonge coming off the nursery grounds. And you can see uh, since VHSV, which was 2005 to 2008, uh, we've seen a real decline um, in muscalonge. And I want to ch show you this, um, this little hump here that you see in 2014 and 2015. Uh, we, we actually stocked fry in several of the nursery sites. We did a, a preliminary pilot study to look at fry reproduction, um, and that helped bring that curve up those years. So some of those fish were from fry stocking, um, and you're going to learn a little bit more about that. But uh, we, then we, we've seen since then uh, a really flattening of the curve and very, very few musclunge. I, I want to mention there's other groups seining uh, on the St. Lawrence River on the Canadian side. 
Uh, DEC does some saning. Uh, we have this standardized index, which has become so valuable. Uh, but Matt Windle at the St. Lawrence uh, Institute in Cornwall has the FINS program. He's been monitoring uh, fish populations and, and looking at habitat on the Canadian side. Um, so has uh, groups at the St. Lawrence Islands National Park. Um, some of the Muskies uh, Canada groups, um, uh, uh, Rob McRae out at uh, Muskies, uh, the Gananoque chapter, they, they've been doing seining and identifying spawning in nursery locations. And the, the rarity of the catches um, uh, on, on all these groups that have been working these nursery habitats is remarkable. So we see very, very few um, young muscalunge coming off the nursery grounds. And that's, that's what's of concern to us, uh, the decline in the spawners and, and the decline of young of the year. So we, we've started a, a study to look at um, uh, whether or not we can help the musky population by enhancing it and rebuilding uh, spawn, lost spawning uh, sites and rebuilding reproduction. So uh, I didn't mention, but during my doctoral work back in the 90s, back before all these problems, uh, I did a study where I released fry and fingerling muscalunge into the river and studied their survival for a period of five years. I published this work and it provides a really useful baseline. So we know uh, what we should get for survival, at least through uh, the first summer for fry and fingerlings. And they, they grow significantly uh, during that period. You can see this fish in the middle. This is a fingerling. Uh, muscalunge, but the fry can attain that size and much larger um, that I found in that study when you have really high quality habitat. So we know uh, these baseline uh, survival rates and we're repeating these studies now um, trying to see if we can enhance the population. So what we do is we, we have uh, broodstock locations, we take eggs, we do one-to-one -one matings, um, there's a genetic protocol that we follow and we raise these fish uh, in our wet laboratory at Governor's Island, and when, then we release them. It sounds so simple, it takes so much work. Um, you can see our raceways uh, full of fingerlings and, and the fry, and, and we're, we're doing a, uh, uh, a targeted research and monitoring to see if we can help rebuild lost spawning and nursery stock in the river. Um, oops, I jumped one ahead. Can I go back? Uh, sorry, I have a technical problem. Well, if I go back here. No, it's not allowing me to do it. But anyhow, um, that's not important. What, what we're doing here is uh, post-stocking evaluation. So after we stock uh, the fry and fingerlings, we have two marking tools that we use. So the fry are batch marked. In, in, a, in a chemical called uh, oxytetracycline. It's actually a, 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 an, an antibiotic that is used to help fish, so it's not harmful to the fish, but um, they're, except when we look at their otoliths. So this is a ear bone of a fish magnified. So when we, we, when we batch mark these fry, we might batch mark 30, 40,000 fry and then release them into the environment. And then we'll take a small sample of them during seining and look for this presence of this mark. So if we, if we sacrifice that fish, we collect a lot of data on it, we let a lot of them go, we just take a sample and we, we pull this otolith and we transmit um, ultraviolet light through this bony structure. These things have daily uh, growth increments in them and it, it actually fluoresces from the day that we marked it in our, in our tanks. So it tells us that it came from the lab and it's not a wild fish. So that's the tool, this batch marking tool, it's commonly used in fisheries, we're using it in this case. And then the larger fingerlings, we're using these mini pit tags that are injected in the muscalunge uh, prior to their release. So we're releasing uh, the fry around July 1st, which allows them to grow throughout the summer. And then we're releasing the fingerlings in early fall. So it's kind of two different methods that we're that we're checking out um, in, in this uh, study. So uh, this next slide shows, uh, this is fry data. So uh, in, let's see, the slides that I jumped over. <laughs> so we stocked um, roughly about 5,000 fingerlings into the river uh, 
we did it in two years. It was 2017 and 2019. And um, we're evaluating those fish. Uh, and we also did the fry stocking last year in 2021. So our 2017 fish are gonna be five years old this uh, coming season. So they're, they're gonna start entering the fishery, we hope, and we hope that we'll be able to detect that. You're gonna hear more about a citizen science program uh, where we're gonna need help from anglers uh, to help accomplish this project. So um, this is data here that's really exciting. So we, we released the fry uh, in 2021. We, we released over 38,000 fry at 46 locations from Eastern Lake Ontario all the way to Waddington. And uh, we uh, put those fry out at a rate of about 750 per hectare of musky spawning habitat or nursery habitat. And then we've been evaluating their success over the summer and their growth. So these fish here uh, that you see are the result of the fry stocking. Some of them survived, some of them grew. It's really exciting. And here's the data. So. You can see this uh, gold star. That's the date we released these fry. We released them at one inch, little tiny muscalungs. They were fed on artemia for several weeks. Um, we released them into high quality habitat and then we went seining and lo and behold, we, we found them, we tracked their growth. Um, very exciting. And, and some of these fish were reaching uh, you know, eight to 10 inches in fall. So, you know, this is a method that uh, these fish are very wild-like. Um, they, they grow rapidly and um, it's really difficult to distinguish them from wild fish. And then, uh, so we're comparing these two methods and we know what's exciting is, is that the fact that the habitat can um, still support these really early life stages, these tiny little one inch muscalunge that are just switching from feeding on zooplankton to fishing, uh, feeding on fish fry, um, it tells us that the environment can still support the life stages uh, of, of muscalunge in the, in the habitat. But we're gonna continue to do this and be comparing it to those baseline estimates that I did during my doctoral work. So, but this is encouraging that, that we've seen this success. We caught uh, over 160, no, I think it was, yeah, it's something like 200 muscalunge in our survey, which is something we haven't done in years. And you can see that here. So I've superimposed the effects of fry stocking onto our seining assessment. And you can see this big jump in 2021. And that's the result of the fry stocked individuals. We didn't stock any fingerlings in 2021. Um, we, we hope to uh, repeat this work uh, in 2022, so in, in about a month, we're gonna have our nets in, actually about three weeks. So, we're, so everybody's working really hard to get the spring sampling going and do egg take to repeat uh, these studies this coming summer in 2022. Um, so yeah, you can see this big blip and we haven't seen uh, catch rates like that um, in a long time. So pretty exciting. Uh, there, there were some sites though that they didn't seem to survive that we were concerned about. Um, so there's a lot of research that's going on looking at the factors that influence the survival of these fish. Uh, so this is where you guys come in, musky anglers, we need your help. So the, the new musky uh, citizen science programs being launched. So we, we received funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We received funding from Muskies Incorporated. Uh, we received funding from Muskies Canada. Um, I just wanna shout out to the amazing community response in support of the program. Uh, you guys are bringing your talent, you're bringing your, your finances and, and uh, we're having uh, um, you know, a lot of success because of all the various groups that work together to uh, make sure that we have a good outcome. People are working hard. Uh, so the idea here is that, you know, we put those pit tags in fish. We're putting pit tags in all those young that we get from the seining. We're putting pit tags in the fish that are caught during the trap netting survey. So there's pit tags in muscalunge out in the river that we're only able to detect during our spring uh, spawning uh, process. So, and we do detect them, but at a, at a fairly um, low rate and it only represents uh, the spawning population. We wanna see what's going on 
with the fishery to see if any of this is having an impact on the fishery. So I mentioned we have five-year-old muscalunge. They're, they're going to be joining the population. Hopefully, we'll be seeing more and more of these over time. Um, we'll probably be doing the stocking program for another five years or so. So the idea is to put some strong year classes out in the river and then track them, and we need anglers to do that. So there's these wands. So that green thing with a circle in it is a pit tag uh, detector. So uh, the, the idea is, is that the anglers would be trained um, and take kits out in their boats. And when you catch a muscalunge, you could uh, collect data for us that would be uh, instrumental in evaluating the program. So we uh, have the wands to detect tags. We want to train people how to put tags in the muscalunge so we could learn more about how big the population is. Um, we want you to take a, a small fin clip and put it in ethanol in a genetic sample so we can do that genetic analysis and take a measurement on the fish. Uh, so our target is to have 10 anglers on each side of the U.S. and Canadian River. We're looking for uh, Canadian St. Lawrence River. So we're looking for dedicated anglers um, to participate. And we're going to have a training uh, at the Antique Boat Museum in Clayton uh, come July and August. So we'll probably have a couple of trainings. We're going to make a video uh, to teach people how to, to safely do this data collection without harming muscalunge and getting them back in the water. Um, we, we definitely don't want to lose more fish. I mean, all of you have helped promote the uh, catch and release uh, philosophy, the voluntary catch and release that we know is working. Um, I could give a whole nother talk about evaluation of that. And, you know, we've, we've seen a, a big change and a benefit uh, in the musky population from, from people treating them well. Um, and we want to continue to do that. Uh, so the citizen science program, uh, anglers that are out frequently uh, would have access to um, these kits. They would be trained and they would evaluate and collect information on their on their catch that would help us evaluate the program. So if you're interested in participating, uh, contact me. Um, this is what's in the, the kit again. There's a pit tag wand, pit tags and an injector, a measuring tape, genetic tissue samples. You take a tiny fin clip, uh, that, that part of the fin will regenerate on the fish. Some scale cards. Um, we've got funding for 10 kits for US and 10 for Canadian. Uh, anglers, and those are the organizations that have really helped make it happen. And then we're going to have these training workshops coming up um, in a video production. So lots of work to do. We're, we're trying to prepare for the fall fishery. We understand there's a summer fishery. Uh, we might not quite be ready for the summer fishery, but we're going to be ready for the fall fishery, and then this thing's going to run for a while. So uh, plenty of time to get involved. Uh, how can you help? So I also wanted to mention uh, the TIBS Friends program. So we, we've developed a new program. We have a newsletter. It's, it's really uh, focused on the environmental quality of the St. Lawrence River. Um, the Muskie program is a big uh, part of it as well. And uh, you can join the Friends program and help support our efforts at the Thousand Islands Biological Station. Uh, you'll get a newsletter. And uh, we got a growing group of people. There, there's something really exciting that happened is we got a major gift from a, a gentleman from uh, Chippewa Bay who, who donated $125,000 to support a student uh, in these efforts. And we also had a, a big gift um, and, uh, from uh, Muskies Incorporated and, and individual anglers. So we're really excited about the growth of the Friends Program. And we're going to continue to do that. Uh, you can also participate in the St. Lawrence River Angler Diary Program. I mentioned uh, Chad Lapa and the, the link. So there's a link here uh, that you can follow uh, in order to uh, participate in that. Um, you could also think about participating in the Muskies Citizen Science Program or supporting it in some way. Um, and then, you know, also obviously supporting your your local organization, so Muskies Canada, Muskies Inc., um, all the chapters, and other environmental organizations. Uh, I think people forget that anglers are 
environmentalist and they care about the habitat that that they they depend on to uh, fish and, and, and enjoy. So uh, all the environmental organizations that support uh, fisheries and fishing and, and a healthy environment. So with that, I, uh, I thank all of you for listening and I hope you enjoyed this presentation and uh, uh, good fishing to all of you uh, and thanks for what you do. Bye bye. I don't know if I've been more excited uh, about a presentation in a very long time. I am now, I uh, can, can you use us now? Uh, I'm going to tell everyone I know that I have become a citizen scientist. Well, first I better apply for the program and get involved with that. But I feel like that's a great excuse. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot take care of the children this weekend. I am officially a citizen scientist. I have responsibilities to the scientific community. I must go out angling. It's all staging very nicely right now. I'm very excited by this. Um, I'm going to uh, send an email. Again, I didn't see that presentation until now. We saw it together, and uh, it was pretty awesome. Um, uh, awesome to see what can be done. Can you imagine if we on our side of the border were doing the exact same? If we were putting in, uh, what was it, 38,000 fry into the water uh, yearly or even in a decade? Uh, we could do some awesome stuff. Um, uh, huge props to anybody on the American side, part of Muskie's Inc. Um, not taking away from Muskie's Canada, but we're just not as big. These guys are doing amazing things. We've got one individual to, to donate one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Not to mention all the other donations that are made. Like we we put on uh, last year's show, worked quite hard, um, and did an awesome job as a community. And we raised enough money and bought three of those tag readers. They're handing them out. It's amazing. So um, I'm glad to hear that there's going to be 10 of them on the Canadian side. Uh, I, I'm actually joking. I probably won't apply for it because I would want to see it go into the hands of somebody who goes fishing more than I do. Uh, reality is I get out maybe four times, five times a year. Um, that's an aside. Um, but if you are out there guiding um uh, if you're a weekend warrior that's uh, down in those bo and uh, you know, Gananoque, Larry, Lake of Mountains, maybe I think it's still part of the same system. Um, you have to find out which borders they're 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 defining. That is something worth looking into. That is a great way to uh, to give back to the community. So very very cool presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Farrell, for taking the time and doing such a great job. And uh, I will try to get that information a little more details potentially in writing, and I will post it to the symposium page, and I'll post it to Muskie Trader Canada. Um, let's try and knock off, I, I think uh, uh, Brennan and Noah are ready, and they're supposed to come on in like seven minutes. So why don't we go right to their presentation, and then we'll finish the symposium with 19 draws. Um, if they're ready, um, then we can do it that way. Uh, get uh, get everybody while we've got everybody's attention. If for some reason they're not, I'm set up and ready to go. We can do uh, more draws. Uh, Lisa, are they there? All right, here we go. Are we on? I think so. We're in the show. Look at that. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Bryn Roach from BR Baits. I'm Noah Clark from Custom Clarky Baits. And uh, we were asked earlier to do a presentation uh, just describing our crankbaits, um, how we make them, the uses that we have for them through the seasons, and experiences we've had both personally as well as through fishermen that fish our baits. Yeah. So, uh, and I think Danny wanted to focus on things like when to use, like we make so many different kinds and, uh, um, and kind of seasonally perhaps, or weather condition wise or, or, or just structure conditions, when to use what type of bait. So, and we're going to get into, um, things like tuning, tuning and tweaking, we'll call it. So uh, <laughs> I'm a bit of a tweaker. So, uh, and, uh, <laughs> 
he'll talk about the tuning and I'll talk about tweaking. So anyway, all right. But, uh, so that sounds good. So basically, Clarky uh, brought in a, a selection of baits, uh, some that he's made, others that we use and have historically used. I have some selection of baits here as well. We'll go through our different baits, but not extensively. We're really just talking about strategies that are going to help you catch fish um, as we use these crankbaits as tools. We have lots of baits in our boat. In fact, it's a running joke because when Clarky comes over to get me when we're going fishing, he's like, one bucket and that's impossible <laughs> for me i can't ever bring one bucket because i have so many so i have to load one and then have a tray and then have some on the side so we always bring more baits than we ever can use but uh we're going to try and minimize that so you don't you know bring your entire tackle box into the boat and so we're going to talk about strategies for that and actually this this year um i typically fish out of my boat a lot and and just in this bait world uh, you know, sort of over time, I've made some connections with people, and it's been nice that they extend an invite here and there to go fish different bodies of water. And and, um, and I would always just try to kind of do what Brent says. I say, if I got to say he gets one bucket, when I go fish with someone, I just bring a bucket. And uh, it, I find that you actually get better at fishing if you have less to use. You know what I mean? I don't know if that makes any sense. It's kind of like, I also play drums too. If you have like a giant drum set, you know, you got all these drums, you're kind of overwhelming what to do. But if you just strip it down to the basics, you get really good at those tools. You know what I mean? And I found this past season, I did that quite a bit. Even when my trip to the French River at Lunge Lodge, I just bought a bucket, brought a bucket of baits. And, and uh, I don't know, I just found that you, you get a little more better at fishing if you just have less to use and you get really good at those tools. You know what I mean? Using those tools. That's what I found from last year anyway. Yeah, we well, it basically, one strategy is when you have less, you change less, and so you're fishing more. Um, so as, if you have three bucktails in the boat um, or and four crankbaits and some rubber, and that's your basic toolbox, well, you're just going to be fishing more because there's not too many options, and so you're not going to be looking down at your boat. And that's happened to me as well as Corky. <laughs> I've seen it firsthand when it's happened to each one of us where you're reeling it in, and you look down because you're looking at your options for the next cast. And as you're not paying attention, something hits your bait at the side of the boat and you're not in a position to set the hook. So, um, <laughs> or you step on all the lures you got laying around that you've been switching <laughs> off for the last 10 minutes. So that's yeah, always yeah. a good thing. Um, Lisa, if you're in the background, if you can hear us, uh, um, I know you have. So, oh, there's a nice picture. <laughs> that was supposed to be my intro shot. <laughs> And Bryn, Bryn's that nice picture of Oh, that's Bryn. great. Don't do that one. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, yeah, that's just me at the Odyssey. That was uh, – um, and there's Bryn looking good. Thank you. Uh, looking for his beat. You're the best, Lisa. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, there's some other pictures. That was that was Bryn. That was a couple years that ago. That was the day he met me. And then look what's <laughs> happened to him. Just spending all the time. <laughs> that's just from a couple years ago. But anyway um, – yeah. Okay. I got a story about this fish here. <laughs> this okay. is Noah's head on any given day. Yeah. <laughs> no, this, this was actually, um, speaking earlier about getting invites to fish with people. Um, Chris Crete, who is an absolute, like phenomenal fisherman. Um, Hands down. He, we, we would just, we, we've known Chris for a bit kind of um, in passing, like we fish the Ottawa river a lot up there and, and, John actually put us on to Chris to rent his house. Him and Jose had a nice place on the river. They, they've since sold it, but um, we've kind of met him through over the years. And uh, um, and anyway, we just just from renting his house. And then uh, his guide success is just ridiculous. He's such a great guide and just a good – He absolutely. I don't think there's really anyone I fished with that has this – like he catches so many muskies, but it seems like everyone he catches is like it's his first one still. You know, and he still has that like youthful kind of excitement that's like – so great to be around and anyway we had a uh an opportunity to fish with him and uh, um he invited us up and we fished a couple of days and i think we got seven fish in the boat over the course of the trip and and when we cast it and trolled had a great time and uh um and he was he was very nice he was kind of treated like a guided trip and said you know like uh just put the rods in and then when we're trolling there's this we had a prop wash rod that uh, was set up just in the prop wash and we were kind of like just taking turns when the rods would would go right and and um Bryn got a hey, little excited the clicker went and i went for it and, <laughs> and it, was, it, was, it was my turn 
it was my turn. And uh, Bryn kind of cut me off. And uh, he got to the back prop wash rod, which was really Chris's rod. And he didn't even think to give it to Chris. Like, but uh, he, I did offer. I looked around. I don't think he did offer really that much. He kind of, <laughs> I knew that it was a big fish. I could just tell by the, the way it hit. And then he had it. And he, I, he did look at me over his shoulder once and say, Clarky, do you want it? That's right. And I'm like, what, what am I going to do? I'm like, nice, that's what a nice guy I'm, does. A, a nice guy says, no, go ahead and reel it in. And then, anyway, so that's why. To, to make it proper, that really was my, uh, I think that fish was 52 inches. And uh, uh, so to make it proper, we, we just, you can't even tell, but they just airbrushed my head on there to make it look like, because that's really my fish that Bryn took. So that's why that picture exists. That's so, right. <laughs> um, oh, there's some more. Um, actually, yeah, th those, those are all, <laughs> those are pictures with Bryn with fish too. I'm sure there is. Well, that was Bryn. There's a couple. My, anyway. Uh, that fish there was actually in the same body water uh, getting back to like bait. You, I don't have one with me, but I, I make a, a six inch bait called a buck swope. And um, that particular day was another day um, uh, fishing up on the, it's on the St. Lawrence river fishing with a friend of mine. And uh, um, we'd caught a lot on blades and then the blades kind of went quiet and the sky, you can see that it's kind of a bright day, right? Uh, at that point. And I switched to like a bright perch color and it got really, it's hard to tell, but it was really windy that day. And we were kind of getting to the point where we were going to head off for lunch and I had to drive home and it was going to be kind of coming to the end of the day. And we, he likes to, it's a Terry, he likes to make baits too. And he makes, he's in the symposium. He's got his baits for sale too. And uh, we were just talking about construction, like two bait makers sitting in the boat and, and we were trolling the edge of a weed line and there was some weeds about halfway up in 12 feet of water. And um, I just, I just threw a, a buck swope in in the prop wash, like five feet behind the boat or maybe, maybe like 10 feet back or something like that. And I just put it in the holder, not thinking much was going to happen because we're kind of off the, the key spot where we were fishing. We're kind of trolling back to the ramp, so to speak. And uh, I just didn't want, I wanted a bait that would just stay out of the weeds. And um, that was early, early season. I think that was opening weekend, actually, if I remember. And we're just talking away and doesn't the rod go off and we pop that fish um, uh, to end the early afternoon, because I believe. So um, an application, again, a lot of people like to use small baits at the beginning of the season. Um, I think they were kind of throughout the season. Um, and uh, um, that that particular fish was just a short line. Um, well, let's talk over weeds. Let's talk bait sizes because Noah makes everything from six inch baits all the way up to 16 inch baits. And so do I. So when do you use these baits? That's that's the question that a lot of people have for us all the time. You know, what's the best time to use these? What's the best time of day? What's the best time of year, season, temperature of water, um, color of water? Uh, and then we also make baits with rattles. So sometimes we have a knocker in our baits and people want that because they think that that's going to be an advantage when they're fishing. So um, I'm just going to let Noah talk sizes and then I'll talk about a couple different things. But um, we have he has and, and because we fish together, we have a similar strategy when we approach body of water based on size. But, you know, we get a lot of intel from people that are customers as well as fishermen that we join in boats or we meet at ramps, um, depending upon where we go. And from Lake St. Clair to the St. Lawrence River up to Nipissing, and, and we talk to lots of, pe lots of people in Northwestern Ontario and Minnesota. Um, so, you know, they give us feedback and I'll let Clarky take over with, uh, with bait sizes. Yeah, well, typically for me, and, and <laughs> like a lot of musky knowledge, there's so much musky knowledge out there and there's so much opinion out there and uh, articles. If you read enough musky hunter magazines over the years, you'll find, you know, this. Yeah, I remember even reading an article once about bait size. When you're trying to find something out for sure, the answer is nothing's for sure. Because like the one article I noticed is like, uh, you know, bring all your big baits for your fall fishing trip, but don't forget your small stuff. So it's like, it doesn't, everything seems to kind of contradict itself, but I think it just goes, goes down to what you really prefer. I know, uh, Mike Lazarus obviously is like a legend. And, uh, uh, to my understanding, I don't think he uses anything bigger than a 10 inch headlock, uh, at certain times of the years and mainly like perch baits that are like eight inches long, um, which make a lot of sense to me, like in that, you know, they're going to go into the fish's mouth a lot. And, uh, personally, um, I don't use a lot of big, big baits. Um, because in my mind, I think it's easier for the musty to get its mouth around a smaller bait. And, and, and sometimes with a larger bait, it kind of gets pinned to the outside of the head and, it, and they're harder to, uh, uh, to get in at that point. However, I know guys that just like personally, there's a fella, 
Uh, I know some of those pictures that you have in there of um, this fellow, Harry, he gave me permission to show these pictures. He's kind of a secretive guy about his catches, but uh, he's, um, uh, which I respect a lot uh, in this day and age. But uh, So he, Lisa, you may want to throw one up there if you see. Uh, uh, the guy with the black beard and he's got yeah. some, um, yeah, that fish there, that's on a 16 inch um, bait that I make, a deep, deep running bait. And, and he's, and he's like, sends me a lot of pictures and I haven't made a lot of these 16 inches and I'm just, to me, it just seems too big, but obviously up there, and that's, this is a Northwestern Ontario fish and he's targeting like schools of Tulabi. And, uh, um, and also in talking with um, some people at the Odyssey about their use of like sucker, suckers and things like that, they, they, the muskies that we all know that they do eat really, really big prey. Um, so they're not going to shy away from it. It just comes down to, are you rigged up to pull a bait that size? <laughs> this one's good here, Lisa, this set of three. Um, because the one on the picture on the right side, uh, just feeding on what Clarky was saying, the picture on the right side is a 14 inch minnow. That's an Eagle Lake fish. Um, there's a story behind that bait and I want to talk about it in a different context, but basically that 14 inch bait is one of my most popular fall fishing baits. It's a shallow running bait. Um, and for anybody who thinks that this 14 inch bait is too big for musky, um, I have now five years of catches on these said baits and, you know, they just have demonstrated to me that it's the perfect size for various muskies. And I've got, I've got, um, no fish smaller than 42 inches on a 14 inch bait, but I know that 35 to 34 inch fish have eaten those as well as pike, but we know pike are aggressive, but um, they don't see it as a big bait. They just see it as prey and snap at it, whether it's a reaction or so. I think they might um, be trying to have sex with it or something. Too. <laughs> they could be <laughs> trying to <laughs> pair up. They're really good it. looking baits. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest looking bait yeah. I've ever. <laughs> but like, what time of year though, Bryn? Like, uh, where you would you find like, are you using these 14s in the spring at all, or is it more later in the year? Well, there's two times. Um, I would say that they're used um, primarily by the people that I talk to. So the fall, for sure, when, when the temperatures cool down, um, people tend to run those bigger baits um, and they get hit. Um, but also early, early in the season, they're very popular. And I think sometimes, and you know, just coming back to when to troll crankbaits, um, sometimes we troll crankbaits when we can. And because they have all these loose hooks hanging off them, and as soon as the weed foliage comes up and, and the weeds creep up to a certain height, or, you know, in, in our case, we are on the Lake Erie shores and we fish the Niagara River. Well, you just can't fish the Niagara River because the floating weeds are so badly, they just get all tangled up in the hooks. So the crankbaits are very difficult to run at that time. But coming back full circle to size, um, I know guys have run them in the summer, but they tend to run them early season and later season. That's what I'd say primarily is the feedback I get for when to run the biggest of the big. Now, 10-inch baits, different story. 12-inch baits, different story. Um, those aren't very big. Those are average size. They may seem big to the to a muskie fisherman, uh, especially new to muskie fishing. But if you have been fishing for 15 or 20 years, um, you've seen everything. And, and you probably have fished almost everything. And... Um, Primarily those 10 inch baits, headlocks, uh, jakes, grandmas, uh, various other bait makers that would make 10 inch baits, um, they catch in the summer. So um, I think we're talking about the extreme sizes of 14, 16 or bigger uh, when we're talking about big baits. But we'll come back around and talk maybe strategies for small baits because I make uh, a mini hitchhiker, a micro hitchhiker, um, those kind of baits. Clark, he makes a buck swole, which is a six inch bait. He makes an eight inch shimmy shad. Um, those are all snack size, you know, snack size baits that you can run probably all year round. doesn't matter from start of the season to the end of the season. Now, I, top think, I think it has a lot to do with like, um, I find a lot of the, um, just in talking with some American anglers, they, they prefer like smaller uh, shad size baits, or at least those guys that order stuff from us, they, they want the smaller sizes, people that fish like Lake Chautauqua in the summer, and uh, I'm using a lot of baker baits over there that some of them are like five inch bakers, even four inch bakers and stuff And they're and they're um, because I think the forage is sort of 
like that up there. You know, I mentioned like if muskies are feeding on tulipy, it makes sense to put a 16 inch bait out there to look like a tulipy. But if they're following small shad schools, which is pr uh, very like prolific forage in some of those lakes in, in uh, uh, like Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, and in some of those Finger Lake areas, uh, that's what those guys are running, and that's what they're the muskies are feeding on. So um, it comes down, you know, not trying to sound cliche about matching the hatch, but that's really kind of what you're doing, right? And uh, um, we've broken all the rules, like we've caught big fish on small baits and small, you know, small fish on big baits. And, um, so let me just jump in. Cause sure, there's this no, no one's talking chat. right now. So <laughs> and we need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's just fitting to what we're saying. So this bait is not huge. Um, but it's a good size bait. It's a nine inch body. Um, probably 10 inches when the hooks are dangling from it and running with that lip. And so it's a 10 inch bait. And it's a November, this is a November fish. Um, very appetizing size for that muskie at that time and, and that area. This is a St. Clair fish. A lot of guys run big baits. And this was the first time, I, this was a prototype muskie bait that I had made. And I wanted to run it. And it's always, there's no better place to run and test your baits than on St. Clair because usually you get bit on St. Clair. And as we know, a lot of people who live on St. Clair they live on a, an amazing fishery full of muskies. Um, but also the advantage of fishing St. Clair is you can run multiple lines. So, you know, it's two rods per guy. And if you have four people in the boat, now you're running eight rods. So it's unbelievable the feedback you're going to get when you're running bait. So I was lucky enough to be on my buddy Joe Rennie's boat on, on this particular day. And... Uh, We'd had a good night before, so it was a rough day fishing, but the weather was <laughs> the weather was beautiful. It was calm, but it was a and rough day. And we went day. out, and I said, hey, Joe, do you mind if I run this bait on the outside line? He's like, yeah, no problem. Put her in there. And that bait, um, that was my personal best at the time. And uh, now I've, I've since eclipsed that a few times, which is great news for us as a, as a crew, boat fisherman crew, and, uh, and for me too, right? Because uh, – <laughs> It's great that I'm able to catch bigger fish, but it, it goes with all this feedback that we've gotten from guys fishing, building baits, and also learning ourselves. So that 10-inch bait uh, was the ticket that day, but I know Joe likes to run some big stuff too. So he's he's not afraid of the 14-inch minnow. Mm -hmm. And so, as far as applications, like a lot of um, – we've kind of got the whole water column covered with a lot of our baits. Like he's got um, – you know, his super tanker dives like very, very quickly and can get down deep on a short – line which is very appealing to people especially out in st john's area and all over a bait is uh, like really really good for dialing in a depth for any deep fish and it's a small size bait too that that's easy to you know um for a muskie just to slurp up um and my my um jointed shimmy shad is one that does kind of play nice in the weeds um i know lisa you've used it and john up on the river and lots of guys in the ottawa river and even myself have caught actually one of those pictures that was um that you showed earlier was a picture of me holding one from the Ottawa River that was uh, uh, casting. Oh, there's that. Yeah, that's the bait there. And that was on that was on the same day of uh, that other buck swope fish. We were biting blades. Though. You could tell it's a little overcast. You, well, maybe you can't from the picture, but the sky just sort of changed. And I said, oh, it feels like a black and orange color, even though it's like really clear water where we were fishing. And we were fishing in like literally, I think it was six feet, and the weeds were at three. And I had that thing 40 feet behind the boat, and it, and it got eaten. Um, I had the rod up, like it wasn't buried or anything, but still like it's, it, that bait just stays like, like kind of at a set depth, like of maybe two feet under the surface. And, um, it, it, it's a nice little bait for casting. And there was a picture of me holding a fish that I got casting that Bryn was nice enough to. It's got a really me. nice tight wobble too. So it's going to get attention for anything that's underneath it. Yeah. And a, a, a guy that buys a lot of stuff from me got a, a 51 casting with it this year. So the casting cranks is something that we were going to touch on as well um uh like like most guys troll our stuff i think but um casting crankbaits can be effective too i remember fishing with bill barber uh, a while ago and he loved casting his 06 dk and you know smashing it into rocks and uh he said he's caught lots of fish doing that and uh um that's just something that typically when we cast, we, I don't know, we tend to, well, there's another little, that's that secret weapon thing that <laughs> I'll get to that one in a second. But uh, uh, we had a story, we were fishing on Nipissing um, this summer and um, 
which is a great place to fish. And we don't, I don't get up there as much as, as I'd like to. I think we're going to try to get that into the rotation more this year. That's right. But, um, you know, fishing open water and fishing like mid lake structure and stuff like that is always fun. You, there's always potential for a big, big fish. Um, anyway, we were fishing these rocks and I was throwing, uh, I think it was one of, um, Oh, it was a Mr. Mr. Muskie, uh, yeah. one of Bill Craig's uh, jerk baits, the, that cutty kind of style that he has. I forget the name of the style, but anyway, um, and I was using it for a while and I and uh, hadn't seen much, hadn't seen much. We're coming up on a spot and I wanted to make a change and I made the probably that stupidest mistake you could ever do is not finish. I let the side of the boat, like Lisa told you at the Odyssey, um, I was just being careless and I wanted to switch baits and I pulled my bait out of the water too fast and then there was a, a sort of a lazy follow that came up behind it. And I'm like, oh, shit, there was a fish. So anyway, I, I punched the waypoint. We drifted off. I set up another drift, and we came at it. And then I said to Bryn, I said, we're very close to this fish now. And he switched to a well, – Yeah, I switched uh, – well, I didn't want to run blades because we were running blades. There's three of us in the boat. We'd done rubber, we'd done blades, and we'd done jerk baits on the way over. So I said, I'm going to switch to a crank. Um, and so I had a DK, uh, Sue band in my boat, uh, seven, seven inch size perch just seemed like the right full, uh, color for the, yeah. for the lake because you know, you're yeah. magnificent. Yeah. So it seemed like the perfect color and I knew it was a great twitch bait. So I was basically ripping it and letting it rise and ripping it and letting it rise. And that muskie was for sure the same fish. Yeah. Just definitely. smashed it. Right. And so. When we talk, so casting. he stole my fish again. Again, that's two stories <laughs> of him taking my fish. Like I do all this work, and I don't I just get want you guys to know there's no stealing. It's just taking. It's called it's a, taking advantage of the opportunity the boat, the boat that he left up. on the table. <laughs> when somebody doesn't eat their meal, you capitalize on my mistakes. Yeah, I like that. It's good. It's great. Um, yeah, uh, you brought up there was a picture of one of these things out there um, a minute ago. That's a. Um, uh, yeah, this is that. I, I did a little video. I don't know if people will follow my page or anything, but I did a little video on like putting a, a glide bait. This is one of my glides that I make uh, in front of a collar. This particular collar is a, um, a Mad Chase one. And uh, uh, this is just something that we kind of stumbled on. I, I had a trip. Um, I knew I ha didn't have any hog collars, uh, which is like the Lebowski version. And I heard that they were biting these things, and I, I didn't have time to get some for a trip. So I kind of made my own Clarky collar version. That's the one in the picture there. And uh, I put a swim bait on it, and I caught, like, a really big fish. Uh, it was like almost 54 inches. And, and we're like, wow. So instantly I fall in love with these collars. And uh, I start tinkering with them and say, well, what else can we put behind them? And uh, um, I found that if you take a, uh, a swivel, and like you put a swivel here. I don't know if you can see this or not, but. Um, you can put anything on there and like, including these crankbaits here, this is just a Terminator crankbait, but, um, because, because if there's a swivel on there, it'll find, like, if you don't clip it on, it might clip sideways or whatever, depending on the pull position of the bait and whatever. But if you add a swivel in there, it's, you can put anything you want on there. And, uh, um, that's just another little tinkering thing I've done. Um, and anyway, I decided to throw a glide bait on there and that was my buddy Terry holding that, um, bait there. And he just caught a, uh, mid 40 inch fish with it yeah that fish right there a little chunky chunky fish and uh we were i was just i uh, just tickled it's kind of fun like we've probably all done that you put something weird in the water and it gets bit like right away and and you know you, you try to pass it off as a fluke but i've used it many times uh Everywhere. after that and, and uh multiple yeah, bodies of water got, got uh fish to hit them so um it's kind of a cool thing i want to try casting that uh, a bit more so you know grab a Lebowski collar or a Matt Chase collar or, or make one or whatever you got to do to, but I, I think those spinnerbait arms are really a, a neat um, addition to your arsenal to kind of um, make, it's almost making like a hybrid out of a bait. Like you make your bait some, into something else. Like spinnerbaits are awesome. <laughs> so if you can turn a Clarky bait into a spinnerbait, it's just that much better. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's great <laughs> or anything, but anything on there. So um, I don't know. I thought that was kind of cool that, um, that that worked. And work consistently and um well if you can add noise and vibration to whatever it is you're fishing with you're going to get more attention and uh sp speaking of attention a lot of people ask us all the time what colors um so if we have someone new to musky fishing or, or or is unsure because when you look at the colors that we've painted now for the number of years that we've been painting and we post i tend to post new new colors because i don't want to post all the ones that i've I've painted before, 
So, you know, you have your standard colors, um, brown perch, black perch, night shiner, uh, regular perch, white belly, orange belly. And you've, you've painted those for years because that's a very common request. So I don't post those ones anymore, but I, I paint new ones and post them. And so by the time you look back over the years, I think, you know, between Clark and I, we probably have two, 300 different styles of which we've painted. Mostly, you know, we're, we're asked to be creative. My point is, uh, when when choosing colors, there's basically three three mindsets. There's dark. Do you want a dark color? Do you want a white color? Like so, uh, like Superman. And I'll go go to go through some examples. But Superman, Shad, Cisco, Tulubi, that kind of thing. Uh, or do you want a a really bright color? And then you know you can you can branch off with those colors and talk about contrasting bright colors or contrasting dark colors, etc. But you know, when do you fish a dark color? What is your what does your water dictate, um, or what is your confidence? And and I think when we were talking about putting baits in the boat and going fishing for just fishing, um, if all you really need is probably twenty baits on any given day. If you go downstairs except in the shop, on Lake Sinclair. <laughs> except I'm like, right. <laughs> but if you, if you go down to my shop, I probably have a thousand. So how do I pick from all of those baits that are downstairs and only pick 20? Well, I think for just for the sake that I have so many, I feel like I need to bring a hundred with me on any given trip, but you really need 20. So why am I saying that dark baits? If you're using a crank bait, and you want a dark one because you're going to fish in low light conditions. I find that that works for me. That's a good philosophy when I go fishing. I want low light conditions. I'm going to fish typically a darker bait. Um, so that could be at nighttime. That could be overcast sky. That could be murky water. Um, and that is a, a color I'm going to put out there. So what is a dark bait? Night shiner, black perch. But then there's so many different variations that you can get of that. And it could be a dark belly. It could be a white belly, orange belly. That's kind of a preference of the person who's fishing. I like a dark belly when it's brighter out, personally. Because when the muskies look up, they want to see a silhouette of something. They don't want to see a white belly that they're not going to see very well. I want to see a dark belly. That's just my personal preference. But what about white colors? We know people who are up north in northwestern Ontario really like white colors. They like shads. They like um, silver mother baits, pearl. mother of pearl, yeah. supermans. Um, that's just a northwestern Ontario desired color. But then in terms of a smaller snack, shy, snack size bait, um, a lot of the guys who fish in the, the states like Ohio, uh, Fish St. Clair, they might prefer a, a shad bait right so basically a pearl white bait with a dot on it or with a slight variation that's gonna those are you know but you can get a number of different variations of white baits and then what are the bright colors well bright colors i typically like to fish when it's bright outside i don't know if clark is of the same mindset but that's kind of we've gone fishing with a few guides and it's been a recommendation that you know a bright day bright colors and you know like a few years ago, we experienced that and, you know, it's just kind of stuck with us. Obviously, we tinker, we throw different things, but, you know, what's a bright color? Fire tiger, right? This is not quite fire tiger, but basically super bright chartreuse, orange belly. Um, and then you could branch off into really crazy uh, contrasting. They don't look like anything like jailbird, right? Super bright yellow, bright orange, coach dog. Um, different colors like that with contrasting bars, contrasting dots to break up that really bright body. Yeah, the whole color thing in muskies is just a, a huge, huge topic. Like, and, and it's different in different places too. Like, there, there's a lot of guides and fish with a lot of people that'll just say, you know, you just need perch and sucker um, and maybe a black one. I remember the stories about with Frank from Frankie Bates saying he used to, he used to carry black spray bombs in his boat and just – um, you know, if one guy got one on a dark bait, he would take his perch depth raider and just spray it black and put it in the river. And then he'd, he'd start catching fish with that too. So, um, and then, and then there's the other side of the extreme of like, uh, when I'm not like, it's almost overwhelming all the colors that, that they use in St. Clair. 
Um, because St. Clair is so unique in that the water, like, you know, typically the water or whatever system you're fishing in is the water. It's like clear or it's stained. And, and then there's not a lot of change. Whereas St. Clair's water, wherever you are, depending on the wind, depending on um, rainfalls and things like that, yeah. you, different get, river you get this speed whole sort into the of lake. spectrum of different colors of water. And these guys are so good at, at, at knowing what baits show up the best in these different sort of gradients of green water, brown water, clear water, and so on. That uh, And they have arsenals. And, and the way they operate out there is like communicating with radios and stuff and saying, oh, we're getting them on olive frog now, so in the green water or whatever. And um, But a lot of the, the things I take away from I haven't, I haven't fished St. Clair as much as a lot of people have, but uh, um, a lot of stuff about like the, if the water's this color, you match that color to the lure kind of. If, if the water looks kind of brown, you use a brownish kind of bait kind of thing. It's, but anyway, the, 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 who knows? That, uh, I don't even know what the muskies see at that point, really. But um, but it seems to work for them, and that's uh, that's great. And then, you know, as a result, like when guys from St. Clair order from us, they order in pairs. They order two baits at a time or because if it's firing, they need another one, right? Because they have an option of so many lines out there. But, um, yeah, colors are a big thing on Claire, And it could be so subtle. Uh, you might go from a white belly to a cream belly, and that's the difference in the bite. Yeah. And, and the fact that these fishermen – um, are so good at being out there and recognizing watercolor and making that subtle change and it having an, an immediate effect um, is pretty remarkable. So we're happy to be on a few boats, to have been on a few boats where we've experienced that kind of bite and, and seen that difference. But we're also um, aware that colors in some bodies of water don't make a big difference, right? Um, stick to the standard ones. It might be the movement. It might be where that bait is running. That's going to be the reason the bite happened. If the right, you know, right place, at the right time. Yeah. It doesn't fishing, whatever it is you're fishing, you still have to be able to read the water and know how to identify good fish spots. Yeah. That's everything. Really the bait is secondary to that for sure. Um, I thought we'd maybe thought you want to talk about tuning some of these crankbaits and then I'll talk yeah. about some tinkering or whatever. Let's talk about that. So this guy, that's Joe Rennie right there. And, uh, that was last year in November. That was our tournament win. Um, and we got that fish on a, on a big minnow. So, you know, that's just goes to tell you that 14 inch minnow is, is not a big, not too big for any fish, especially out there on St. Clair. They're eating those gizzard shads like crazy. And this particular one just made a fatal mistake. <laughs> it wasn't fatal mistake. We, it lived and <laughs> swam off. But. He almost made a fatal mistake out here on the net job. <laughs> oh, it was a bad that net was job. A I but think, I, uh, but I, I think made Joe it. had a heart attack or something. But anyway, Joe, Joe's thumb's a little raw. I from, wasn't. I wasn't there. So from uh, thumbing, I would have really bugged him about school. That. <laughs> I think my feet were in the air as I was dangling from the back of the boat. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if you can see that. Here's a crankbait. So there's the lip and there's the pull eye. So basically every crankbait's going to come through the water head first going towards you know your retrieval line or the tip of your rod. Um if it's not centered, if it comes in and it's not centered, you basically take your pliers, you grab the toe eye in the front and you bend it in the direction you want it to go. So if it's coming in it, it, Rights and lefts are irrelevant right now because it's kind of hard to understand. So you just got to think about the center line. If that bait is coming in and it's off to the one side and you want it to come to the center line, you got to bend it the opposite way or the, the way you want it to go. So if it's coming in right, you want to bend it left. And basically, if you bend it too much, now it's tracking the other side of center. Then you just have to subtly bend it back and find center. And... You're going to do that by bending this toe eye. Now, there's all sorts of different. So there's a height on this that's important. Now, as a builder, I make sure that that's consistent because that makes a difference in terms of how the bait moves. Now, nose pulls are a little different. Not in the sense of what you're going to change to tune it, right? So here's my nose pull right there. And I'm not. I'm still going to bend it the way I want it so it goes to center. However, where this location is, is can affect the movement too. Some guys 
move this up or move this down if they want to change the action of the bait. So if they wanted to hunt a bit more, so they wanted to scatter, scatter one side and then come back to center and scatter this side, that's called hunting, right? And if that bait can hunt, um, a lot of guys really want that in, in their, the action of their crankbaits. So nose poles are, are very good at, at doing that, but it depends on where that pull eye is, toe eye is, and how it will affect the hunting amount. Um, these big minnows, tough to get them to hunt just because of, like it's 16 inches long. So this one here, I want it to come in generally tracking centered. Um, I don't want it to be a hunter where it comes out of the water sometimes because that's what's going to happen. There's going to be a huge swing on a big bait like that. Um, but if you pull it up more, then you can create more of a hunt. If you tuck it down further, you can create less of a hunt. Now you have to be careful that you don't break the integrity of this nose, right? If you pull it up too much and you crack the nose, then you may then lose all your ability to tune and the lure might be become garbage. So if a manufacturer like me or Clark, you design a bait like this, send it to you like this, it's meant to run like this. Unless you want to change it, then you should ask said bait milk bait maker mm -hmm. um if that's a good idea don't just start pulling it out and yeah. and changing it that way but there are some baits that are specifically designed to do that i was talking to dave phoenix um of dp baits he's he's new to the scene but i was chatting him up at the odyssey a couple weeks ago and he said that his bait is designed to do that it's a little one it's only about a six inch bait um and i got a couple just to try it out and uh and the nose pole comes out really high but he said, if you raise it up a little bit, it'll be more scattered. And I thought I'd explore that action myself. So um, just great to collaborate with different bait builders out there um, and talk designs. And, mm -hmm. and he just gave me that little tidbit and I thought I'd pass it along. Yeah, I think not uh, not understanding how to um, tune your bait is kind of like, it's like buying a, a, a Lamborghini and not knowing how to drive stick. Like, I think it's really important that you know how to get the most out of, out of the, the baits and also understand that if it's tracking one way, it doesn't mean the bait is ruined or something like that. It's just, just needs some tuning and, and learning to do that. There's tons of videos on it on YouTube and stuff that, um, to get the most out of your baits. So other thing that I'll mention now is, a um, actually I'm going to bring up this bait here. This, this, this bait I like a lot. Um, I used to use these a lot. Um, this is called terminators. They're, they're not, you can't get these anymore. The guy doesn't make them anymore, but there's this thing. What was interesting about this guy when I was, uh, reading on, on the design. If you look carefully, the hook hangers are not all the way in. They, they're they actually deliberately, uh, this, this the joint one too is not, the, the eye is not all the way flush to the wood. Same with the belly hook hanger here and, uh, uh, and this one up front as well, right here. I don't know if you can see that. There's like a gap here. And, and that actually, that screw eye that goes in, if you put the screw eye into the wood all the way, which is what everyone does typically, right? Um, it actually changes the action of the bait. And you get more, these are made like a, a hardwood, these things, and then they, they have a fantastic action. And, but if you, I remember getting one and turning turning this hook all the way, the screw eye all the way in, and the action changed. And he called it, was called dampening the action if you put the screw eye in all the way. So there are other ways you could even, you know, they don't recommend backing out screw eyes and stuff, but if you've got them epoxied in, you know, and um, you can still change the action of the lure. And uh, I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Um, also, I wanted to mention about um, some some baits that I make now. I don't think Bryn has any like this, but I, Jeremy Schneider puts, um, and like headlocks are like this, and the Lila lures are like this. And the ones that I make that are thicker, this is like, I have some of my baits are a little thicker wood. And um, I, I put the hook hangers laterally, I, I, they go this way. And I just wanted to mention, because I've seen some guys send me pictures of their, their fish, picks and stuff and I can see the lure and I see that they put their hooks on backwards. Um, so I just wanted to mention that if you have lateral hook hangers like this, where the hook hangers go the opposite direction, um, it actually is, it's a lot better for your, um, your hooks to line up. Cause you can see this particular hook here, the split ring is, is on like, so, and then you can raise the hook up and it, it perfectly um, lays against the bait properly. And then you could tee that hook after if you like or whatever. Um, but if you put it on backwards, then then you'll see what happens. Then this one tine of that treble hook is going to be scratching the hell out of the belly of your of your hook. So if you have any of 
baits that have these lateral hook hangers like that and and you see oh geez, there's a hell of a lot of hook rash on this thing you might have your hooks on backwards and it's worthwhile to kind of turn those around so people just people just maybe not thinking about it or not knowing so i might preserve the you know the bait's going to get scratched to hell anyway we hope with some musky teeth but it's always it's always a little saddening when you just get a lure and you got a little too much hook rash on it you're like Gee, damn that thing looked so good a minute ago but it's okay if like the musky does that but if the hooks do it it kind of pisses people off sometimes and uh i also wanted to talk about um like some of you know that i've been playing around with topwater baits the last few years and uh um this is a uh, an earlier bean flicker that i made and i i um I didn't sell any of these last year, I don't think. Uh, maybe one or something. But th this one batch, I made a batch of them, and I used them, and I was brought them up to the Ottawa, and we were fishing away, and I just didn't like the sound of them compared to, like, a, a Fat Bastard or a... Is that what you're using? Lake X. Yeah, those, yeah. They, they're, 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 they just sound so nice. And uh, I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll go back to the drawing board, and I made some more. And I figured start. I know a lot of guys like bend the blades of these top waters to get different sounds out of them, like just literally with your hand moving it like this. But I started actually playing around with like 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 bending it like like put it in a vise or and change it like this, so you actually make a little. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Am I showing that yeah, right? You can see it. I think. Like I've bent the blade up like that, and that makes so much more noise. And I've even done it to this this uh, bait here. This is a big mama, which is another great topwater bait. And this blade was flat. I don't know if you can see that. It's hard to tell, but I've bent this thing up. And th these blades are, I think they use stainless for this. This is like really, really uh, rigid metal. Uh, but I just put it in my vise. I put it in a vise and I bend it to make that extra little L in it. And that thing makes a heck of a lot more noise now. Um, and these already did make a lot of noise, but uh, I don't know. I just, I, I think noisier the better for me. To get the muskies attention but that might be something you want to play around with with your top waters uh is uh is try to just bend a little like an l in that and it grabs that water when it's spinning in the prop and uh it makes a lot more noise and it might be something might be something that you like um and maybe the fish like it too who knows muskies have been known to eat some pretty stupid looking stuff like clarky baits and br baits you can get them to <laughs> eat one of these things too if you mess with the blades i bet uh, was there any like I, I see some people talking on the side here? Yeah, I can't. I don't know who it is. It just it just says Facebook user here. But um, um, what's this guy say? If my shoulder or not, if my shoulders are not hurting after ten. Oh, <laughs> I get on the metal bit. tail coarser. I put the hook in so when the hook moved with it with the pull, it will hit the back. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, is that is that JL talking? I don't, I don't know. Um, oh, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any little extra noise. I love tinkering with stuff. Like uh, I know people that's, that's, uh, I don't know them actually. I can, that's a lie. I read it in a musky hunter magazine years ago. They drilled holes in the, in the blade of the suic and then attached uh, little blades to it. Uh, like little hanger blades. Yeah. Yeah. So stuff like that. There's, there's tons of, uh, tons of stuff that you can, Tinker with and Wishmaster has that little blade off the back because it's a big bait, so you know, that oh, blade Wishmaster's thing. <laughs> so, you know, I've just seen, <laughs> I have zero, Wishmasters. Yeah. uh, but if anyone has any questions and stuff, uh, you can fire them out there. Someone said, uh, that we were really nice guys too. On that, did you read that? <laughs> yeah, so two of the best people in the business. Whoever said that is great, we like you. We like you too, but you don't know us very well. <laughs> we can't tell who wrote that. <laughs> I don't know who wrote that. I think that was my mom. <laughs> Is my mom watching? <laughs> Thoughts, Thoughts on leader selection and lure action. Oh, good question. Uh, hmm. I don't. I don't see a big. Uh, um, I make my own leaders personally. Um, I, I know that the. Um, I might be in the minority on this, but I don't like leaders that have that metal spring around the end. I just, I don't like that extra weight up the front. That's probably just in my head. And I do find that they, it fouls up a bit. So I make one with a, there's a fellow, his name was Charlie Runyon. And he used to make his own leaders. I used to buy them from him years ago until I could look at it and said, oh, I, I know how to tie this. I can do it myself. I just, a lot of guys just kind of do it themselves and that's fine. And I, and I use a, a yeah. cable knot and I crimp my own leaders and I literally have never had a single leader fail on me. Um, and I don't have, and then that doesn't knock on wood. Yeah. And that doesn't, and I don't have that extra hunk of metal up. I know a lot of leaders that do have that guys, 
provides it provides strength to the fluorocarbon. But if you use a cable knot, the, the fluorocarbon goes around twice, and there's no way that that's ever going to break. I have seen leaders snap at the snap with just a, a U of fluorocarbon going through, and it breaks, which is no good. Um, but I don't notice a um, a difference necessarily in the action. Just sometimes with like casting, I like fouling with different leaders and stuff like that. But um, I've never really noticed an action change. If it's if it's a thicker leader, you may lose a little bit of depth if you're trolling it or something like that. Um, uh, we, and wire, we, I don't use wire anymore. I've never really. I've always just used. I used to use wire, but actually, I I almost killed a fish once, so I just stopped using it because it it was a pike, so it wasn't a muskie. But so maybe it's not as sad. But uh, the the pike hit and rolled up in this wire leader, and it just the wire dug into it so much that I was like, oh my gosh! So I just I just stopped using the wire. We typically use 80 pound braid for our main line and then 130 pound fluoro for our casting leaders for sure. Um, I think we try and make them 12 inches, but I like the 10 inch one. I like it a little shorter, kind of gives you, you better um, control of your figure eight. Yeah. Right. When you bring your rod tip right up, you can reel it up and, and you just have way more. I think precision. that might be a mistake for people starting musky fishing is that they use casting leaders that are too long. Like, uh, don't do that because you will not be able to control your figure eights very well. Yeah. Um, they just will stall out on the turn every time and or, or the, you don't reel it up enough and they start their figure eight. Um, no, shorter leaders are and the muskie's not going to care. Like if that no. thing's coming up to the boat, he's a gigantic boat. But I, guess, I think like people will overthink, myself included, we overthink what the muskie sees. But when a muskie wants to eat something, I don't think anything's going to stop it. You know, they're like, oh, we need to have like, we, that this is there's too many clips on this leader or whatever. But yeah. they don't don't see these three eight-aught treble hooks hanging off the bait. Those they, really they good. ignore those, but the you know what I mean. Like the people who know how to figure eight, they they rip that figure eight so aggressively, you would never see anything you know part of your leader. So. I don't think that's your, your intent with your question, but you know we run a 12-inch leader for casting, 10-inch leader, so shorter the better. Obviously, you don't want to get too short, um, but that's that's ideal for me. And then for trolling, uh, I would say minimum four-footer. Um, what I like about my trolling leader is I put a double swivel at the very front of, of it. So we would get line twist if we ever trolled bucktails. Um, and so basically I build my trolling leaders like very intensely to prevent that. So I put like three swivels on my trolling leader and it's like at least four feet long. But what's nice about that at the very front is I have a triple split ring usually between those, those swivels. And I hang, uh, I used to hang like a cut up hook for as a weed catcher or um and since we put a weight, with, on, a weight on it too to put a weight it. on it right to bring that a little down down a little further uh yeah you, and you could put like two four six eight ounce weights at the front there and pull your your bucktail or whatever it is you're you're trolling um even further so you know like if you only have a four foot leader then it kind of cuts down on your maybe even a five foot leader if you're just exclusively trolling you know <laughs> five five feet is okay too as long as as long as you can net the fish, this is the problem. And, <laughs> and what, what Noah's talking about, because when you're, say you're trolling on St. Clair with a four, four or five foot leader, um, you got to fight it, it, some, in some cases, right? You're trolling with big boards and those boats can't slow down. So they're going to slow down when you're going to net the fish to like one and a half miles an hour to as long as the baits don't drop and bury themselves and hook up so they they got to keep the boat moving so the point is you got to fight your net has to be long enough you're fighting the the movement and momentum of the boat and the resistance of the water and this giant fish that gets straight when it wants to go in the net and this is what happened to me on st Clair when i went to net this fish i had it in the bag i go to lift it yeah, and it just straight <laughs> totally had it <laughs> It just straightens right out and starts to slide back because I wasn't anticipating that. But, you know, if your leader is five feet long or longer, now it's the fish is even further from the back of the boat. But, you know, when we typically fish and troll, we stop the boat, clear the lines yeah. and handle the fish. So, you know, a five foot leader is no big deal because we're all on top of and working as a team to net it. So I don't think I let mine aren't that long. I only like four feet. I think mine are three to four feet long. Cause I think it's fine. What, for, 
what I use. Yeah, but you know, sometimes but you can't, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we use usually I mean, do 100 remember, pound do you fluoro the for that as opposed to 130, but 130 <laughs> is better. We were fishing on the Ottawa River once and we decided we don't troll much on the Ottawa River, but for some reason we were trolling this time. And I'm pretty sure you were with me that night, or maybe it was Rainsy. And, and we were just changing the, the lines and I reeled in and this, I was trolling. I reeled in my bucktail. I was trolling a blade and, and then I get this. There's this musky yes, right up to the I back. And I'm like, this. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, I got to figure it. <laughs> and I try to I'm like, oh. and then of course I try to turn. The leader's so long that it just sinks. So I try to like run around the boat, <laughs> or try, and then I'm tripping on stuff. Could probably Bryn's bucket. And uh, yeah, no so uh, <laughs> that'd I'm be sure great. I was figurating properly see, right some... next to him. And if I would have caught <laughs> it, you'd be hearing it on this if, story. If someone could do a seminar on how to figure eight. When you have a, a follow and you're pulling in a trolling line, that'd be that'd be a great thing. I'd love to see. How do you actually make that work? Maybe yeah. you just drive the boat in a circle really quick or something to, to get that fish to hit. But that's happened lots of times. I'm sure everyone here is, you know, you're you're changing a line, you reel something in when you're trolling, and all of a sudden there's a fish there. You're like, oh crap, I can't figure it with this long trolling leader. Anyway. And I touched on something earlier, which was a weed whisker or a weed catcher. And um the, the, the Northern Lakes, you don't have to worry about it too much. In fact, I chatted with a few guys from Manitoba, um, you know, who had, they just had some weed whiskers and they're like, hey, do you want these, Brent? Because we're never going to use them up there. I said, oh, don't you ever have any floating or surface weeds or weeds you have to deal with? And they're like, never. So, <laughs> you know, but down here in the south, you know, St. Clair, Lake Erie, Niagara River, Chautauqua Lake, St. Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence, you know, all over the yeah. southern area where weed growth you know, the temperature of the water is higher, the weeds are higher, and maybe there's more um, boat traffic nit- cutting up weeds too. Like, yeah. yeah, and there's probably more nitrogen in the in the water from, you know, fertilizing the areas that are around here because everyone's got lawns and so on and so forth. So you get this algae blooms and this growth. But the point is there's weeds and you have to deal with that. And if you're trolling crankbaits uh, in areas that are weeded up, now your crankbaits weeded up. And, you know, you're either going to, you're going to do that for a little bit and then just give up on a crankbait. But what we found is having a weed catcher or putting a weight on the front of that leader or some sort of thing, as the the weeds trail down the line, they get stopped there and the action of your bait is still good, um, you're gonna increase the chances of of catching fish. There's a question here, it says, uh, how do you decide what type of lip material, Lexan versus aluminum, and how does that affect tuning? Well, I don't think it affects tuning at all, really. it affects action like the action of the bait changes with lexan and and uh, aluminum aluminum you get a little more of an aggressive uh action um and uh as far as which one's which um uh i use uh i use aluminum on uh, all my shimmy shads um i like it because it offers that um ballast to, to write the bait and the, it's less need for adding lead to the body um, and, and also I just got a whole bunch of them machined, so I'm just using them cause I have them, you know, and, uh, uh, the Lexan other, the, almost, I think once in a blue moon, someone will, will request an aluminum lips and I have done them in the past, but now that I've got, um, like I have my lips all cut pre-cut by a, a machine shop and, uh, uh, all my baits are typically Lex. Bryn has a lot more like his, he's got this, like his crank baits with aluminum, uh, I don't. It doesn't affect the tuning. Uh, you still tune the. Doesn't same way. affect the tuning. I think it's, it's a little thing. tighter. The action's a little tighter, yeah. um, because depending on the thickness of the Lexan, uh, you can get a little flex. Mm-hmm. Like I actually liked running the thinner Lexan mm-hmm. um, in a lot of my baits, yeah, because definitely. there is a little bit of a flex there, and and it kind of jumps, which is great. Like the action That's to me um, it true, is yeah. is pretty cool in that sense. Uh, because it's a little bit more exaggerated than a tight aluminum. Not to mention the, the, the weight of the bait, right, the, is, is more in the front here. So you have to um, be considerate of that when you're building the bait. And so you shift if you have any weight in your baits. And I have a little bit in every bait that I make because, like Clark, you said, you have to ballast it or keel it um, to make sure that it sits the way you intend. Because our sit. baits are flat-sided, right? Right. So you need to kind of give it a little bit of a ballast, but, but the but thicker, sorry, they're both but aluminum is very durable, right? There's no doubt about it. It's probably the most durable product, but you know, with thicker Lexan, that durability is not compromised. Like we run, when we know that a bait needs that extra durability or someone requests it, they have usually the aluminum option 
Mm -hmm. or um, we're going to put a thicker Lexan lip in that option. So the Manitoba fine. guys, Northwestern Ontario, yeah. who are running the shield, they want it to be durable. But there's also things to consider when you build a bait that increases that durability. And, and Clark and I both make, make sure thicker Lexan. A thick Lexan is just is going to ha handle aluminum like. It's, it's not going to break. Like, like, I, I have, we have had both of us have had cases where Lexan has, has has broken, and the guy even told the guy like my um, the guy that makes the Lexan uh, Plastruct Poly uh, Carbonates, uh, he makes all plastic products. Anyway, um, he was shocked that it happened, and I kind of trying to figure out why this would happen. And the only way that, in my opinion, that like because Lexan, if you take Lexan and smash it with a hammer, it doesn't shatter at all. It just it mushrooms. It kind of compact so that's banging into rocks it's not going to break the only thing that i think that causes it to break the only thing i was able to do is put the lexan in my vice and slowly start to vibrate it so if there's some weird vibration going on kind of like wire if you take wire and start to bend it over and over and over and over and it gets weak and it snaps and i think that's must have been what was going on maybe with the way that the lip was or there's some kind of a pulse in the water that was causing some weird vibration to happen that caused and it was a really big lipped bait um and it, and it was a three, I think I used three sixteenths on it. So when I replaced, obviously I replaced the bait if the lip failed, of course, and I put in a quarter inch one and I use quarter inch for those big giant baits now. Um, I think it was a 16, 16 inch mega moon. I think it was, or ultra moon or whatever the hell it I was a big it. one. Yeah. And, I remember. And, and, and you had a couple of the minis break too. And I think it must've just been like the vibe. Was it a mini? Or I feel it, like, just honestly, vibration? I feel like the material was compromised. Um, any instance that we've had, because I haven't had a lip do have any sort of malfunction in years. Yeah. Um, no, and like so one, one time, it, it was like it happened for him at the same time. It happened for me. And, you know, we get our materials from the same place and we're, we're close. So we often share materials. So we could have had the same material. And since when that happened, we just got rid of whatever we had and then got brand new. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard of um, any issue with, with Lexan lip. Um, so I wouldn't say that Lexan is better. It's a lot of its preference. Um, like, like our orders are always for the most part, custom orders, except if we build for shows and, um, public opportunity to get, you know, a large, I have an option of buying some of our baits, but most of them are cups custom. And we always make sure that we build for the customer spec. So if somebody wants aluminum, we do that. If someone wants laxan, we do that. Unfortunately, we're not a big, you know, business. So yeah. <laughs> if you, if you want a custom bait and you ask us, uh, you just have to wait. Sometimes we just say, it. if someone asks for aluminum, I just say, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have all these yeah. perfectly good Lexan lips and, uh, but that are available. But right? if you want aluminum and a shimmy shad lip, yeah, cause that's what I got. And we will use those and uh, like the way that the baits run with those. So we also found uh, too that you know we we build them a certain way because they run very well that way and we've got years of experience now with getting feedback so like i only build my minnow baits with an aluminum lip like that's it i've built maybe three out of i don't even know how many with a lexan option just for a few customers that requested uh, that i knew really well but I know those minnows work and they've been proven over and over again. So why change something that's not broken? But you have a great, great question about aluminum versus Lexan because we do get that a lot. Seems like there's another. Uh, whenever I break a lip, I understand it's my fault for grinding too hard. Uh, yeah, maybe like everything will break. Like you can break anything if you're deaf, if you're really determined to break something. Yeah, but um, I think it would be it would be pretty hard to. You might crack. I don't know. No, speaking don't... of speaking of having a bait malfunction, and Clark and I, we've had a couple over the over the years, and you know, like we're I don't know how many we've built over time. I we're probably well over a thousand to be honest. But I built a minnow bait like this, and and there was a, a picture of a bait. So I built a fourteen inch minnow for a guy in Manitoba, Nick Schmoutz, and um, he won the bait. And, and because he was a great customer and sent in some pictures. And so I, at the end of the year, did a, a thing where he won it. So I built it for him and sent it on his way. And he fished it hard. He goes, I'm going to run this so hard. I said, great. He's on the shield and he was going to pound it. And Lisa, I'm not sure if you're still there and paying attention. But um, it was that minnow. <laughs> She's asleep. <laughs> it was that minnow bait. I don't even think we're on anymore. <laughs> Just you and I. We're just gonna be... She's gone. So anyway, um, 
it's a 50 inch fish from last year and it was a great story and it, it happened in october i got the picture oh, that, oh you're the best lisa thank you so much um this fish has a great story so that's nick um holding a 50 or a 51 i'm not sure exactly how how far it was but he had a bait a minnow bait he ran it so hard that he he cracked it because what happens is this lip acted like a can opener and it started to split the wood right here down the middle so ever since that happened i now and and he's had that bait for the, the original one for maybe three years ever since that happened i now put like six galvanized finishing nails through the body of my bait in a crisscross pattern to make sure that that wood um never comes apart again so anybody who's got a minnow bait those are some of the improvements that, that Clark and I make to make sure that these things are so durable. And so when you're buying a crankbait from someone who has been doing it for a long time and get lots of feedback and has positive um, uh, clientele and, and guides that support uh, us, um, we do it for the right reasons. We're fishermen first. Uh, we want to go out there and we want to catch big muskies. Uh, and we also want to make sure anybody who's buying a, a bait from us and trusts us for their fishing trip experience to be positive, there, there's never a failure. And if there is, we're going to make it right. So um, I think that that's important part about being in this, this business as a business. But I know Clark and I wanted to talk really quickly about um, having fun. Going out there and, and fishing mm -hmm. is is about the experience and about having a blast and being with good people. And it's probably the best time you're going to have. And well done, Lisa. Yeah, and this is, this is a hot, hot day for us in, uh, you can see I'm exhausted. I'm asleep already. <laughs> that's from dragging these two guys around the lake. That's all right. And that's what it's all about though. Right. You know, just, just concluding, um, with, with some positive vibes and looking forward to this season and looking forward to hanging out with all the people that we fished with in the past and the customers that we met at the Odyssey and, and thanks for the support with the symposium and those people that are buying our baits today. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a uh, the fate, like there's like the musky world and then we're kind of immersed in the Facebook world of musky and, uh, um, inevitably there are always some, some, there's drama that pops up and stuff like that. I just like, just leave it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, worth the, the energy and the, all the, that negative stuff is just, so that's why we always try. And you, if you see any of the stuff that we post about ourselves, we're all, we don't take ourselves very seriously. And I think that's a good way to be, especially when you're our age and uh, been through everything that you've been through. It's just, it's just, we're bringing hit it on the head. Go and have a good time and, and have a laugh and, and uh, yeah, catch a fish and, and, and it's, it's all great. And you don't have to, you don't have to catch the biggest one. You don't have to catch the most. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the worst. Just go out and have a great time and be good to everybody out there. And yeah. And maybe we'll start waving at boats this year, even, <laughs> even other musky boats rather than just sort of driving away from them. <laughs> so Clark, you won't do that. I'll probably, I'm very friendly on this shore, but if, if I'm you, you guys all have been there, you know, you got your spot, you're driving like 15 miles to get to a spot. It's a mid lake reef or something. And then as you're getting like two miles out, you see a little black dot out there and you go, oh my gosh, someone's there. And yeah, I get a little grumpy sometimes when that happens. But but Bryn, I just look into Bryn's face and that eye, those eyes <laughs> and that smile and all that anger just melts away. And then he looks at my bucket, trips on I trip it. in his bucket. <laughs> no, it's all good. Man. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, just have a good time out there. And, uh, and again, we really appreciate, oh, look at that. Collie's there, closing it out. Well, I had to find a new host. <laughs> this is our, is our official mascot now. Oh. <laughs> nice. You guys are amazing. Well done, buddy. Thanks I can tell you're having day. fun even just sitting there thinking about fishing. I noticed in that last picture, the one that describes your fun scenario, one person <laughs> looks well-rested and the other person <laughs> looks extremely exhausted. And it's almost, I'm not saying somebody took a nap, but it's yeah. almost like somebody <laughs> took a nap. I'm, I'm always doing the work. Yeah, I, just, Clark, you, I gotta net all the fish. I gotta drive the boat. <laughs> I gotta wake also him up. A ginger in like heat waves. Oh yeah, so that doesn't work out at all. No, it's not so good for him. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but he still puts my sunscreen on for me. <laughs> That's romantic. I like Which that. Which is nice. It's very sweet. Um, I heard a rumor. Um, that uh. 
Bryn wears Noah Clark pajamas to bed at night. Is that true? <laughs> no, that's very wrong. And Noah Clark doesn't wear anything but the clothes he wore fishing. He, wrote, he wears a and Noah he falls Clark asleep on the bed. Body in suit. Same clothes. It's actually a body suit with my anatomy on it. And he puts it on. When Noah Clark goes fishing, I just want you to know he packs nothing. Ever. He just wears the same thing for the entire week. That's correct. And often forgets like <laughs> things like a toothbrush. We um, all have that friend, Brim. We all have that friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I have to pack know. twice as much so that we're so okay yeah, and we get they, through the week. And he can help we me get all have that morning. friend. That's good to know that he's that guy. Yeah. Guys, that was a ton of really awesome information. I, uh, I, I try to go out with a guide maybe once a year. And uh, you spend whatever it costs now, like five, six, seven hundred dollars. And if you can go away from it after spending your five or six, seven hundred dollars with like one or two little timbits of information that makes you a better angler, I call that day a great, great success. Um, I recommend I people, calling uh, Chris and of course Lisa. Uh, but if you, I think Chris I'm going. I, both those names are are high on my list. Chris uh, Green, John Anderson, Lisa. Uh, I went out with John last uh, last summer. It was awesome. Um, oh, and, great! Uh, yeah. I, I try to pick one a day, but my point is, is I spend all that money um, trying to just improve myself on one facet, you know, take one little tidbit, one little piece of information and you guys just drop like half a dozen in there or maybe even more um, that all like all things that I genuinely didn't know that would uh, help me. A, I got to stop being a lazy prick and start tuning my baits. That was the biggest one. Um, but beyond yeah, that, um, I told you I, that last year, didn't I? Uh, maybe I wasn't listening. <laughs> you said it, but I, I, in my head, I just heard la la la. la. Um, anyways, uh, guys, thank you so much for doing this. Um, no I, I hope people are watching. If not, they should watch it. Soon <laughs> Was anyone even listening? We I have no idea because I can't see. I'm with you guys. I have no like. At least you can see comments. I see nothing here. I, I'm yes, with you. Steve. Maybe, maybe Lisa hey, you're gone. welcome, Steve. Steve said this was really helpful. Love learning from your experience. Both fishing and building. So much great info. Oh, well. All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. Steve was listening. Steve, listen. You get a gold Good star, start, Steve. Steve. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. Thank you guys for uh, being part of the symposium. I know you guys had to work double time and bust your ass just to get baits ready for us. But yeah, hey, I got uh, first pick the on the DKs today. It was wicked. I got myself a my first DK musky bait. Didn't didn't Dave put some real gems in there though? Like it, yes. it started off with uh Hey, I don't know what I'm gonna be able to get ready for the show. I don't like all the baits are pretty much sold. To okay, here's eight baits. Okay, here's twelve baits. Here's fifteen. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, come those elevens, and I'm like, man, people are gonna be ecstatic. So oh, I know I saw the elevens. I was like, oh man. But I'm yeah. like, like I said, I don't. I'm not a huge. I don't, it's a little, well, eleven inches isn't that big, but I like that. I think I got a a nine inch uh, shallow fifty finder. I think. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. Got something this. good came out of it. Color was yeah. wicked. Watch so, yeah. that boat partner of yours. He's he may he's got a bit of a shine in his eye right now, thinking about your bait. I got a, <laughs> I got a few. He's thinking downstairs. about something else. <laughs> he's, oh, okay. he's thinking okay. about those hot. I'm going summers, to get a beer right now. Hot Danny. summer days on the boat. Saturday. Well it's weird talk. I don't know where this whole like naked, naked torso stuffs come from, but uh, your emoji, oh, dude. You have this emoji that has no clothes it's on. It's because of my emoji. My daughter made that emoji for a joke, and I don't know how to do it. So she's, that's not true at all. He edits <laughs> that emoji. He sometimes takes those pants right off. It's scary. I'm not, I'm not going to BS you. I actually had to have a meeting, like a full-on, full-scale meeting before this event because I'm like, man, I told Noah I'm showing up naked, and I'm going to do it. And then I'm well, like, oh, not, so I had to have a meeting. <laughs> And of all the people to, to poo-poo the idea was my wife. What does that tell you? My wife insists that I stay clothed. Really? Yeah. I know. Oh, well, well. She That's knows, probably she knows best. best. She's probably seen you in your worst, so. <laughs> so if it's my okay. worst can be naked, then yes. That's yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Boys, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna get uh, get to the rest of it, and uh, I owe you. I owe you huge. You're awesome. I think thank somebody you. tagged me, so I'm, I'm in in line to win something. I gotta go. Happy hunting yeah. this year, everyone. Cheers. Yeah, boy. Be careful with the win something. You still have to pay for it. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. That's, a, that's a win. win. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Take care. Okay, guys. Uh, what time are we? We're one thirty-five. Let's uh, we have a lot of draws left to do, but we're going to power through them as quick as we possibly can. Um, I hope uh, somewhere in months, those four presentations, you found value. You found uh, education. 
and purpose. Um, we uh, we're, we raised a bunch of money and we saw what that money can do. Um, we uh, had opportunities to uh, hear from and learn from different uh, people through outdoor community, people from the South, guys who fish locally and uh, are well versed. Um, there was, uh, I think we covered all our bases here, fishing lures, education, research. So as far as I'm concerned, the show is a success. Um, I will, I will need you to stay at, uh, paying attention. There are a couple of things about to happen in the coming days, including a surprise that I promised, but I'll make that surprise happen right after we finish the draw. So let's, uh, get back to the randomizer. Um, thank you, Lisa. I've got us uh, queued up here for JL. Um, the reason I've got JL queued up now, um, there are extra pictures and stuff. Facebook is being difficult. Um, one of the pictures is uh, missing. The great news is Susan is in charge of this lineup, and she's a genius and amazing. And so she'll help uh, help get you through it to make sure everybody uh, uh, knows what's available and what they can pick. Uh, Jonathan LaMontagne uh, was a big supporter. Uh, from the day I announced the show, he was uh, telling me he could help me in every way imaginable. And despite all that, he just put himself through school, bought himself a house, and is about to have a baby. Uh, he could be doing it right now, for all I know. She was due this week, I believe, um, potentially today. And uh, But they said it'll probably be another week. But congratulations to Jonathan. Um, big changes in life. And uh, as someone who's been through some of those already, I know just how uh, amazing and intense they can be. So thank you for still uh, participating in the show. And making it happen for us so we've got 20 entries here we're gonna roll the dice three times and that's 15. we got to do this quick because i just consumed a whole bunch of caffeine to keep me going but uh inevitably i am going to uh, fall asleep soon so anybody who has a genuine interest in uh each of these rounds it is recorded this is a paid uh service that i am using All right, Todd, you're going to be first at the JL table, all right? And Susan, uh, well, you're managing the line, so I'm assuming you'll be able to pick there. Uh, I make, uh, I don't make, can't say I make anything. I uh, convinced Susan to participate just so I can keep her uh, in the game, and she ends up buying, like, 15 fishing lures every time. Um, Peace. This one was... So it's way better. So next we're going to jail is done. Pussy, sorry. Uh, we did it. We're gonna go to BL, Bailey Lambert. Here we go. BL I'm probably not actually going any quicker, but I'm trying to go quicker. I don't know if that counts for anything. So this is Bailey Lambert, um, another guy who's uh, building lures specifically for the shield and uh, trying to be unique and doing a great job at it. Um, these are one of those baits you got to see in person. I think I said that the last time, but it's true. Um, different profile. Um, which I assume produces a very cool action. Um, 14 rounds, here we go. But I was genuinely shocked when I held the first two. Um, of the baits, I think they were Vapers. I'm not sure which bait it was. All right, Rob, you're picking first. Guess we don't have to figure out which pattern that is going to be. Okay, after BO Lumix. Talk about a cool, unique bait. 
I don't know how many guys still hand paint beats. Um, but these ones not only are hand painted. Um, Brendan, Brendan's like makes it look like they're done with an airbrush. They're they're pretty awesome. Um, they're uh, definitely a hot uh, a hot commodity as more and more people are using them. They're starting to see that that uh, their action in the waters is unique and it's very 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 high function bait, uh, easy to fish. <sighs> Only five of them. But at that, uh, we should be lucky because, uh, again, such a, a strong demand for these. He's doing his very best to keep up. These baits were put aside. Uh, the Hoff is going first. These baits were put aside long ago because he was important to Brandon that he support this project. And um, yeah. So we're grateful for the five that we got. Mr. Greg Bellinger, uh, a true artist, a tattoo artist. Um, as well as a uh, fantastic bait artist um, doing a fantastic job of exploring his own path with baits and coming up with some really uh, awesome baits. There's one up here, actually. It's, uh, Oh, you guys can't see. What am I doing? I'm throwing a beat and you guys are not even watching. TV bass. Anyways. Um, very cool bait. And a good human. And he also did the logo uh, design for this. And has helped out in a whole bunch of uh, different ways. So, um, Why do you keep doing that to me? Lineups, key beats, copy. Greg's one of those people that I was really looking forward to. I'd put on my kind of list of things to do that I wanted to meet in person, hang out with at the Odyssey, and then I failed to do so. I said hi, but that doesn't count for much. So anyways, Greg, if you're watching, sorry, dude. Next time, I'll make sure we get to uh, actually meet each other because you're a good man. Brian Sturch, you were first at the Greg Balancer table. GB Bates. Next, we will do the sticky hook file. So Brian Kismanic uh, um, takes something like a hook file and turns it into a genuine um, piece of art. And some of the stuff he's doing, I didn't even know it was possible. And they're absolutely amazing. It's almost worth like following just to see the cool stuff he's doing, mostly for other builders and companies and stuff. Um, but he's got some baits, uh, or not baits, I should say, some uh, some handles primed and ready to roll. And you can kind of get a paint into your favorite bait pattern or whatever. Um, and I believe he said he had 10 ready for kind of specifically put aside for the symposium. So that's uh, very cool of them. Get yourself a flat file or uh, a rounded file. 
the splat ones are no fun. So 20 entries, uh, the first 10 have their option. Um, and you don't have to buy them, so you can pass if necessary, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. All right, Bowen, you're up first. You get to make your big choice. Okay, let's do Lebowski. Uh, during the course of the presentations earlier, Johnny finished up, uh, sent me the pictures, everything's added, and we are ready to make our picks. There are 16 uh, vigilantes, and with each vigilante, you will also get a hog collar. I'm assuming uh, that'll match the thing. I'm not sure exactly how um, Mr. the Bear intends to um, distribute those, and you get a decal as well. Um, for a very reasonable price when you factor in shipping. And uh, shipping is included in the price. I believe it was $80. I have to double check the post. But uh, look carefully at the pictures. It was uh, hard to get uh, get them numbered given the circumstances. Um, but uh, I did my best there to uh, facilitate that. This is a long lineup, and it should be that way for a reason. <laughs> I think Johnny is finished either first or second in the last first like three times and second i think once in the last four years of the uh, uh opening weekend kawartha challenge and uh it uh it's not luck at that point <laughs> you can't just say oh he's lucky it's, it's not possible it's the man's got a system and uh and it's working so He's doing it with his base, by the way. As far as I know. Last I checked. I wish him and his uh, wife good health and hope uh, they're getting better. I know they were dealing with some stuff. So, you didn't even have to run to get to the front of this lineup. It just happened. Okay. Next, Ravenous. Murray. Already uh, another guy who's a, a genuine artist, uh, also a tattoo artist. Um, takes a ton of pride. One of these baits he spent uh, an entire week working on. He said he couldn't even count how many hours is in it. So he was concerned that his price point might be too high, but he was trying to, he had to, you know, put it at a price to um, to justify how much hours he put in it. And I had to reassure him that it was a very, very, very fair and reasonable price. Um, again, he was only able to get four ready because this is not his, uh, his primary thing, but, uh, you'll, you can see with his baits, they're built with pride and they're very fairly priced. So Raven Boyd, followed by Bradley, Jim, and Jeremy. And we'll see if it goes much further than that. Again, just reminding everybody, I'm pasting these into um, a Word format, a Word file. 
and then I'm going to be going back and uh, um, I'm going to go back and uh, post them to the Facebook page where they belong. But Facebook is giving me a ridiculously hard time um, for no reason. So. All right. So this is the Beaver Bates lineup next. We'll be quiet. Tony Gazoo. He will not find a better deal here at the symposium. Uh, Tony does. Uh oh. Mm. Let me just make sure I posted this. I did, right? Yep, okay, cool. Uh, and then why did you not? Gazoo okay. has been around longer than I have been on this planet. And uh, he does this out of love, for no other reason. Um, He's not trying to get rich. He just wants people to have a quality bait that catches fish. And that's what uh, that's what this is all about for him. He is the salt of the earth and a good good person too. Um, even if you're not buying, swing by and talk to him. Guy's got stories for days. Um, anybody who buys a bait, despite how awesome the prices are, uh, is still entered to win one free bait at the end. Um, so when we get there, someone I'm assuming will remind me, and uh, we'll get that free bait uh, given away to the people who purchased at the show. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Must Mr. Must this is Bill Craig. Famous, Bill Craig. Famous for the right reason. Famous because he's got a certificate that says he caught a world record muskie. I don't have that. I don't think anybody else here has that. And you heard, uh, copy. You heard Noah saying he was using one of Bill's strikers. Uh, these baits are made of maple. Um... So it's a hardwood, and and they are intentionally not epoxied so that they can absorb some water. They run even better once they get wet, and the more damaged they are, the better they run, and they're pretty much indestructible. So, um, not your flashiest lure, but still a quality one. And Bill Bill dreams of a sixty pounder or seventy pounder. And so this bait is meant to get on that if it ever shows up. Yeah. Dan Cosolino, you're picking first, then Richard Bray, and then Robert King. Next is Brunswick Bates. Our East Coast Bait Builder. Mr. R.L. Jeremy. Congratulations on becoming a new dad. And uh, he asked us to be aware that these baits will be fewer and far between because he's got uh, daddy daycare. And that is something that I empathize with. Something that I am wholeheartedly aware of. Guys made the way all the way from the East Coast uh, to come to the Odyssey. It was awesome to see them. 
and I love how hard they work to protect their fishery there because it's obviously not uh, not respected yet. So fingers crossed that uh, they find a measure of success, either just in their bait building business, but with their fishery in general. I know it's an uphill battle for them. So there we have it. Casey Hoffman followed by Mr. Rob Waz, Bob Waz. The Bell family, BS Lures. Tanner and Brad, if I'm correct. Brian. Don't quote me on that. I'm fairly certain it's Tanner and Brian. Another one of the builders that uh, focuses hard on producing an affordable, um, reliable, hard bait, like hardcore bait, a bait that's built for some abuse. We're getting there, guys. We're getting there. All the relatively new bait companies, definitely new to the symposium. Um, the most fun trying to do a write-up for or promote is definitely got to be the hooker um, hooker baits now. Um, there's only Colin and Casey um lined up at this one currently um i think uh i think rob is uh is relatively new and selling is uh his stuff it's gaining traction but day by day but as of the time that i put this up there was only two so if you're interested um head over throw a comment say hey i missed this um I miss this. You want to be in? What's what do these two boys not pick? And then get yourself uh, get yourself in there. We're just gonna um, post this here, and we're gonna do this three times. All right, one. Two, three. Casey Hoffman, you'll pick first. Okay, after hooker is going to be VM Bates. VM Bates. And baits another classic bait, a staple of the, the French River area. And we all know big fish come from the French River, so the baits have to be ready for it. Um,
Okay, we got 20 entries. Four, five, six, seven, eight. We're getting there, guys. We're getting there, right? Sorry, you have to listen to me. I know I'm not as fun as Brennan and Noah. No one might as well dress. I got some sweet sweaters. Let me get myself in on that. All right, Colin, you're going to be first at this table. Shield and Graham. This is another one of those products that become has become like a hot tamale. Everybody's got to get it, and it's small batch building, so you're not getting a lot of them. But uh, he put in a solid effort for us to support the cause, and I think we ended up with six of them, if I'm not correct. Five of them. Oh, I'm sorry to yawn. It was a long night. No, I'm going to do that, please. Thank you. Perfect. Go here. Is anybody wondering what the surprise is yet? Man, I would be if I were you. I know one guy who's going to like it. His name's Peter Hoffman. Peter Hoffman. All right. First in line, Jamie. Boomstick. Very cool paint job this year, Tristan. I gotta hand it to you, uh, especially the one that's like one sided, like uh, almost like a pike. And uh, that's been attacked, so it's kind of bleeding on the one side. As a uh, very cool bait. There will likely be a couple left over, so if you're uh, interested in a boomstick, go. Take a peek and see what's new. Check out the art. If nothing else. Uh oh. My caffeine is running off. We better get them. I'm so glad I don't actually have to add the dice up myself. Get to a point where it's not quite even possible. All right, there you go. I can do this. Dragon bait words. New. Again, I love it that the uh, symposium can be a launch pad for stuff. I think it's awesome. Shows faith in the program, faith in the system. So Dragon Bait Works is Brian Martin from Martin Custom Lures. If you don't know who or what Martin Custom Lures are, I'm not sure we can be friends. Um, I won't lie, I slept with a harlot last night. Like a fishing lure, no hooks. Um, and you can't judge me because it's, eh, who I am. But uh, so Martin, and I forget the name of his associate, they um, decided that they could take the Bucktail world by storm with uh, new high level, high fashion ties. And then they went and won the Battle of the Bay with them. And there is no better way to say, hey, I've got a better product than to go out there with all those anglers, all those quality guys, all those baits that you can, more than you can count. Um, 
and win the tournament with uh, with what you're you're saying you got. So, uh, Dragon Bay works. Uh, I think there are nine baits, if I remember correct, or nine packages. Oh, of course, 17 months. Here we go. Brad, your first. I hope you enjoy. Okay, next. Oh, we're almost done. Here we go. Handlebars. Mike, uh, a real nice message up early this morning. Uh, you know, I got to hand it to Mike. Uh, I sent him a message about a question uh, in his package here. And um, as I was working, and at like 2 o'clock in the morning, he messaged me back. And I'm not sure if he was going to bed or getting up, but I'm assuming he's getting up because they've got a fishing show somewhere today. But no shortage of dedication there. So, And he, uh, he and his lady friend opted to put uh, oh no, high rollers. Obviously, you can go purchase other stuff for them, but... They specifically made a, a set of their high rollers for this show. It's pretty cool. So there's 20 of them. Uh, they'll be finished in about a week or so, so understand that this won't ship right right away. And um, I think they're all painted. They just need to be primed, if I remember our conversation correct. But I'm a liability to myself and the people around me right now. So I would take anything I say with a grain of salt. Three fives. Here we go. All right, last one. Don't run away when we're done this. There's uh, there's a surprise. Remember, we gotta have a surprise. We gotta keep people interested. But I don't think I have the picture here. I have to do like a screen share or something like that, and I know how to make that work because I can think on the fly. Uh, Georgia Bay Bucktails, <laughs> uh, Brandon Cadeau. Thanks for uh, taking the time to get these put together for us, and. Uh, I know they're well loved your your ties. Um, sorry that at the Odyssey I got you confused with somebody else, but uh, I am far from perfect. Did I? Did I, I didn't get perfect. I'm at a stage where I'm not uh, not trusting myself anymore. Okay. I'm just I'm having a moment here, and I want to just double check something. So let's open. It's no big deal, girl. All right. Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Now, uh, where are we here? So here we go, new giveaway. Uh, oh, hold on. I don't know if these are right, so we're going to get rid of that. I'm going to do this. And I was correct. 
All right, I'm glad I double checked that. See, I dodged a bullet. Here we go. I'm very excited to see how many mistakes I made during the course of this show. Four, five, six. But you'll have to tell me about them when I wake up. Because I'm going to bed. Here we go. Evelyn, you're picking first at the Georgian Bay Bucktail table. Okay. It will take me a bit of time to get these all posted up, and then we'll get uh, the pick started. I've got a great team of volunteers um, helping with this. So let's uh, let's wrap up the symposium um, two ways. I'm going to say a couple thank yous, then I'm going to get Lisa to, uh, to tell us once again about uh, the Muskie Factory um, uh, YouTube account. Uh, because I think it's really, really uh, valuable and important both to her and to us and to the community um, that we uh, we support this uh, this project of theirs. It's just such a wealth of information, and it was given away for free when others should have uh, would have charged, and they probably should have charged. And with all this work that's going into it, it's uh, the least that we can do. So uh, in a minute, I'm just going to let Lisa say something, but uh, we're going to finish up with uh, some quick thank yous. Thank you to our uh, presenters, Noah, Bryn, um elmer john farrell and jordana um together you guys uh fulfilled a niche that was necessary you educated us you inspired us um i felt uh i felt it was a, a highly productive highly successful morning and all because of the work you guys put in so thank you to to them thank you to everybody who saw this project appreciated that it had value and joined you know put your 20 dollars in came to check it out um, looked at the new different baits available and uh, um, different builders, took a chance and uh, got involved in the charity raffles and helped make this whole thing a success. I will have a final total for you soon, but I believe we raised about $11,000. Um, and uh, I'll probably have that in the next couple of days. One of, uh, and, and then of course, the last thank you goes to um, the Ottawa River Muskie Factory, uh, who is, again, like I said at the beginning, is essentially the sponsor of this because nothing here would have happened without them. Um, and thank you to uh, Lisa uh, because she's, she's the face behind the scene, but make no mistake, she's, she's doing the work. Um, she's pretended to be me. She took on a huge chunk of the workload so that I could do the other huge chunk of the workload. Uh, neither one of us has slept very much. Um, and there was a lot of stress <laughs> straight goods there was a lot of stress about uh availability formatting timing um electronics all this stuff and N Bryn and noah said it this is supposed to be fun and and I, it is fun i'm glad to do it i'm sure lisa's glad to do it but we would be lying if we told you it was it was uh, all fun and games it, it, it was work it was fun and simply work and lisa doesn't have to do it I guess technically I don't have to do it, but she does. And she did it for everybody here, and she does it time and time again. And her time, her level of commitment to muskie fishing, to her dream, to, um, you know, being a guide and, and developing um, the fishery and her experience is, it's inspiring and it's second to none. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, the entire muskie factory team. And thank you, everybody. Now, I'm going to let Lisa tell you something. And then I'm going to tell you what the surprise is. And then we're going to call it a day. All right? Lisa, it's up. you're up. Thank you, Danny, for the kind words. I appreciate it for sure. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, right back at you, Danny, like what you've accomplished here in the last couple of years of the symposium is absolutely incredible. And like I said, a lot of people don't even realize you're running on an hour's sleep right now. So uh, <laughs> right back at you, Danny. They, they probably know. I'm probably slurring <laughs> my speech by this time. <laughs> All right, I'll just share my screen real quick and then we'll uh, get to the big announcement here. So uh, as Danny mentioned, we've been working really hard to grow our um, our YouTube page and we've got something new. The Muskie Monday seminar series was super popular and specifically the Ask the Biologist segment. So what we've done is actually cut all the segments out so you can access them really quickly. I've got five up right now, but the rest of them will be up by the end of the weekend. 
course, we've got all of our Muskie Monday seminar series, like literally probably 50 hours of awesome content from amazing people. So make sure you check that out. And we'd really appreciate if you could uh, hit that subscribe button for us at the top. It would really uh, help us out. Am I back on? You're good to go. <laughs> I'm going to uh, screen share in just a second. But if I was smart and did what my uh, tech advisor and the leader of this shindig told me, I would have sent her a picture earlier, like I said I would. But then, of course, things being what they are, this planet blew up like 13 times before we got to this. I can't believe we got to the end with relatively civilized uh, – state of affairs. I don't think anything terrible happened. Okay. I'm ready here. I'm going to come back here, use my superior technological capacity and share. Uh, it says stop screen. So I guess, can I change which? Uh... Yeah, I'll remove that one for you. Okay. Oh, actually, me? no, you got to hit stop. If I, if I'm I do. I'm going to stop screen and yeah. go screen and go screen share. Um, Chrome tab, Facebook. So when I made this post, uh, talking about a little bit of housekeeping, uh, I wrote at the bottom, my exact words were, this is a completely random picture for attention. This is not the truth. It was not a random picture. This is a bad ace. And, uh, Mr. Brian Martin and Martin custom lures. This is the only Martin custom lure currently built. Um, and sometimes it can take months, year, years to get a bait uh, available from uh, from Martin. Uh, he had a couple put together for a, a special side project show that was done. Uh, they were sold instantly. I got one of them. Thank you very kindly. And um, to the best of everybody's knowledge, there were none available. And he was not going to be part of this show. But in the midst of a rather um, um, not quite romantic but persuading conversation, uh, it turns out there was one bait. This is the one bait, this um, bad ace. And so he said, I want you to use this bait and try to make some money for the symposium. And so I arranged the same kind of deal I've done with Dave and uh, a couple of the other builders. And Martin's going to take uh, a proper fare. Um, but we're going to do this one open ended as well. Again, the, uh, the only Martin available, if you want one, a Martin, this is the only one you can possibly get right now. And, uh, I'm going to post it, uh, momentarily. It'll run until, um, tomorrow night at, uh, 9 PM or so. And, um, that will be the official end. And at that point I'll be able to tally all the money and decide, uh, announce exactly what we raised and, uh, who's getting what and all of that. So you'll see, you'll see a post on the uh, group in tomorrow with uh, information about uh, um, the um, man. I almost made it without uh, falling asleep uh, with information about the projects we're supporting, the amount we raised and all of that as well. We'll determine the winner of this uh, baddies. So I hope a couple of people are still watching. I hope you're uh, whoever wins this uh, enjoys it. And um, I know a certain guy, he's kind of bald, kind of tall, got a big head, but he's a fantastic angler. Uh, Mr. Peter Hoffman, he'll be very interested to talk to whoever wins this bait. Um, cheers, all the best. And thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, believing in this and being part of it.